You all can be seated. We're, we're standing for you, members of the jury. Thank you, Sheriff. You all may be seated. Members of the jury, good morning. Uh, I want to reiterate some of the things that I said to you yesterday. Um, I know you could have said something to get off of jury service, but you didn't. And I am truly grateful for your willingness to serve today and for coming back. <laughs> I always worry about that. Um, you will recall that the very first order of business for a trial is that I swear you in as jurors. The oath that we discussed yesterday, I'm going to give to you now. So if you would please raise your right hand. Do you and each of you solemnly swear? that you will a true verdict render according to the law and the evidence in this case. If you do, please say, I do or I will. I do. Thank you very much. Y'all can put your hands down. That is how we officially kick off a trial here in Texas. The next order of business will be that the state, since they have the burden of proof, will arraign the defendant. He will enter a plea of not guilty, and then we'll hear opening statements. And it is my understanding that Ms. Mitchell will open on behalf of the state, yes, and Mr. Sanchez will open on behalf of the defense. Remember, what the lawyers say is a roadmap to their case. It's not evidence. The evidence comes from the witness stand, but it will give you an idea of where each side intends to go. And after that, we'll start with testimony. Ms. Mitchell, is the state ready? State's ready, Your Honor. And the defense? We're ready, Your Honor. Very good. If you all would please remain standing and please arraign the defendant. In the name by the authority of the state of Texas, the grand jury of Dallas County, state of Texas, duly organized at the January term A.D., 2021 of the 292nd Judicial District Court for said county upon its oath do present in and to said court at said term that Darren Lopez here and after called defendant on or about the ninth day of October 2020 in the county of Dallas state of Texas did unlawfully then and there intentionally and knowingly cause the death of James Faith an individual here and after called deceased by shooting deceased with a firearm a deadly weapon and further, did unlawfully then and there intend to cause serious bodily injury to James Faith, here and after called deceased, and did then and there commit an act clearly dangerous to human life, to wit, by shooting deceased with a firearm, a deadly weapon, and did thereby cause the death of James Faith, an individual, against the peace and dignity of the state, signed the foreman of the grand jury. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Mr. Sanchez, how does your client plead? Guilty or not guilty? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, not guilty. Thank you all very much. You may be seated. The court will recognize the Honorable Brandy Mitchell on behalf of the state. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> Counsel, co-counsel. Darren Lopez met Jennifer Faith over 30 years ago. They went to high school together in Tucson, Arizona. They dated. They fell in love. They went to prom together. They even went to Europe on a school band trip together. But as life happens, their lives moved on separately. Darren Lopez went into the Army after high school where he trained and learned and focused himself to become a member of the Special Forces. He, and he was good at it. He was a medic and he was trained to be a medic and he was trained in intelligence and intel gathering and interrogations and everything you think of in the Special Forces that is needed for successful missions. And he did do those missions. He went on several combat missions. In fact, he and his team were injured in a mission around 2005 overseas by a car, car bomb explosion. He continues in the military after that. That was around 2005. During this time, he meets and marries Rebecca Lopez, has two stepdaughters, and then he has three more children with Rebecca Lopez mm -hmm. after that. And they live in Tennessee while he's in the military, and then when he retires in the military around 2013, they continue to live in Tennessee, about an hour outside of Nashville. Meanwhile, Jennifer Faith has gone off to college, married, had a child named Amber. That marriage ended, and at some point later, Jennifer Faith, uh, not at some point later, later, Jennifer Faith meets James Faith through a man named Jeremy Gebler. This is around 2005. They marry in 2012. They are living in Phoenix, Arizona at the time. After they get married, around 2017, they move to Dallas, Texas in the Oak Cliff area of Dallas, where Jamie Faith 
has been moved with his job at American Airlines, a high-end IT managing director job. He has moved here to be at the headquarters of American Airlines. All right, so Jennifer Faith and James Faith are married, living in Dallas. Darren Lopez is living in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. Around January of 2020, Darren, who is now separated from his wife, Rebecca Lopez, starts looking for his long lost love, Jennifer Faith. He reaches out and he finally connects with her via the internet around March 17th of 2020, via LinkedIn. He sends her a message and at first she is a little startled and a little wary, but then he uses a nickname that he used for her in high school to make her feel more at ease and that it was him, Angel. She, they then swap emails and they swap phone numbers and they start communicating almost often, almost immediately. A lot of communication. Darren is pursuing Jennifer Faith. And you will see these emails and the texts that are left. He is pursuing her. He wants her to come visit him. He wants her, he wants to make passionate love to her, knowing she's married. And he wants her and him to eventually be together. These texts, emails, get increasingly sexual in nature and increasingly violent in nature and increasingly graphic in nature. They are playing out fantasies. They are playing out sexual fantasies back and forth with each, with each other. And part of the sexual fantasy and part of the fantasy, as part of it, Jennifer Faith does indeed create two fake email accounts. One of her husband, Jamie Faith, and the second one of a good friend of hers and co-worker, Rob Schmidt, who she's known for a long time. Darren, these, James Faith and Rob Schmidt have no idea that these fake emails have been created. No idea at all. The communication is between Jennifer Faith and Darren Lopez. Between them, and then going in between these fake email accounts. And these fantasies continue and the role playing continues. And you're going to see these fake emails as well as the other ones and you're going to see the abuse and the sexual nature that is alleged in these emails. But ladies and gentlemen, abuse became the fantasy. And they played it out over and over and over again. From late March, early April, all the way to October 8th, where their communication normally dramatically high, decreases and almost stops abruptly on October 8th of 2020. And that is when Darren Lopez drives from Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, to Dallas, Texas, to Oak Cliff, around an 11 hour drive, 10, 11 hour drive, all through the night. He takes his Smith & Wesson, his handgun with him. He drives through the night. He makes it to Waverly Place, the street that they live on in Oak Cliff, around 2.30 in the morning. He lays in wait outside of her house and next to the house next door. And he just waits and creeps around and waits and waits for five hours until at 7.30 in the morning, James Faith and Jennifer Faith leave to walk their dog like they normally do. They take a left, which is what they normally do. And before James Faith can get down not even a block, heck, not even one house. He is in front of their next door neighbor's house. He is ambushed by Darren Lopez, completely ambushed. He is shot seven times and left dead on that street. He makes a show then of doing some duct tape on Jennifer Faye's hands to make it look like some sort of robbery. And then he takes off back in his truck and drive straight back to Tennessee, where their communication starts up again. And the nature of their communication becomes sexual and graphic 
And it starts up again all the way up until his arrest. Ladies and gentlemen, the abuse was the fantasy. They played this out through calls, phone, text, emails. They were role playing. They were enjoying it. It was all part of the fantasy. The violent graphic nature of this was part of it. And it is that violent part that led Darren Lopez to drive from Tennessee to Texas through the night, ambush and kill Jamie Faith without any reason, without any explanation, without any basis, except to be with Jennifer Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, there's but one victim in this case, and his name is James Faith. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. The court recognizes the Honorable Juan Sanchez on behalf of the defense. You may proceed and have your name. Please, the court, counsel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Opening arguments, uh, as the judge said, are not evidence, but it's the opportunity for both sides to be able to give you some of a way of a a we, what we think is going to be, the evidence is going to show. So what I tell you is this whole um, story that it was fantasy play, at the end of this evidence, you're going to find out that it's not. You're about to hear one of the most heart-wrenching, tragic cases anybody's ever heard in this courthouse. You're going to hear about, yes, Jamie Kay on one side, you're going to hear about Darren Lopez on the other side. And in the middle, you have Jennifer Faith. Now, during jury selection, they told you that she wasn't on trial, but she will be on trial. Her actions will be on trial. And it's going to be important for you all to know what she did in order to manipulate, deceive, and lie to Darren Lopez, to lie to her family, to lie to law enforcement. You're going to hear all those things. So what do you have? You have uh, Jennifer, uh, who was his, uh, Darren Lopez's girlfriend, uh, back in high school. They went to prom together. The evidence is going to show that she was important to Darren. She, so important that she's what got him through his deployments in Iraq and other countries. She's what, she's what got him through, the memory of her, what got her through uh, the suffering that he had to go through as part of his service to the United States of America. So important that he had to create, in his mind, uh, Darren, War Darren, and Home Darren. So important that he listed her on documents uh, uh, as, as somebody who should be uh, contacted if anything ever happened to him, to, so he could keep his war life and his home life separate. So, just like the state said, they dated, they were in love, uh, Darren kissed her under the, uh, the Eiffel Tower, and that was one of the memories that got him through a lot of things. That was one of the memories that he held on to in case he was tortured in Iraq or in other war-torn countries where he was ca called to serve. That's how important she was her, that he kept those memories uh, uh, to be able to withstand interrogation and torture. You're going to hear about that. The evidence is going to show that. The credible evidence is going to show that. So. He comes back to, uh, to, Dap, to Tennessee, and he and his wife uh, uh, separate. A lot of it due to the fact that, uh, that Mr. Lopez, a decorated war hero, uh, had suffered uh, traumatic brain injury and suffered from PTSD, enough so that the, it's documented. It's documented by the military records that you're going to see in this case. And uh, he was eventually led him to be 100% discharge on disability due to his traumatic brain and his PTSD, his post-traumatic stress disorder. And the reason you're going to find that to be important, it's because those disorders, those because of that, his broken mind uh, perceives danger differently than you and I. That's going to be very important, and you're going to hear about that. The evidence is going to show you that that is true, that it's not made up. Sometimes people come down here and they say, oh, we have, you know, I might have PTSD. When in reality, they don't. But this is documented. This is not something you're going to have to wonder if it's really true or not. So he's back in Tennessee. He's been separated from his wife. 
from about 2018, he's trying to meet people. And the other thing too is that this is we have to remember is that this is March, uh, March of 2020, when uh, uh, the whole world got shut down, is when COVID started. So you have Darren at his farm, isolated from his friends for the most part because he can't go out and do the things he used to do, and he's on the internet trying to meet people, and he decides to reach out and talk, see if he can find Jennifer, and he does. He finds her through LinkedIn. After he meets, you know, completely. Connects with her, uh, and she's receptive to it. At first, you know, she wasn't sure if it was really him, but she, she's receptive to his uh, his reaching out to her, and they do start an emotional affair. The evidence will show that right from the beginning, she started asking him about his uh, his traumatic brain injury and his PTSD. The evidence will show she went as far as to ask for him to send her his medical records. And the reason that's important, you're going to find out, is because. Uh, she has a background. She works at a rehab center where she treats people. She even tells Darren that she's treated people with her, his similar uh, injuries and conditions. So right from the very beginning, she asks about this. And then she moves on uh, to, to have conversations with him, and then she creates these fake email accounts. And they're not, <coughs> the evidence is going to show that this is not any kind of role playing. You'll be able to see those emails. Uh, she creates these fake emails, and she makes one uh, for Jamie Faith, and she ends up emailing Darren or forwarding Darren an email purported to be from Jamie, where he asked her to be on this certain diet. It was a diet plan, and this was a way to get Darren uh, his email address and to make it look like it was real. Look at what he's sending me. That's not any kind of sexual nature. This is a way for her to make Darren believe that those emails were really coming from Jamie. So as they, as they go on and talk, yes, uh, uh, from the very beginning, she starts to ramp up to Darren and deceive him to believe that Jamie was abusing her sexually and physically, that he was subjecting her to gang rapes. And Darren is in Tennessee. Darren in Tennessee can't do much. Again, this is during COVID. He's in Tennessee, he lives far from Dallas, and he starts to tell Jennifer that he needs, she needs to call the police. And he even goes as far to tell her, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to call the police. But then Jennifer would always say, don't call the police because it'll go worse for me. Don't call the police because of Amber, their do her daughter. She says, I don't want her father, I don't want her to know what kind of person her father is, so I'm trying to protect her from him knowing uh, uh, have the police come in and ask questions. When she starts to think that Darren is really going to do the, do, uh, call the police, when she starts to believe that that's the case, she introduces Rob Schmidt to Darren, gives, actually gives Darren the email. This is a friend of mine. This is somebody who I've worked for 15 years. I see if he can help. So Darren starts to communicate with who he believes to be Rob Schmidt. And the person that he believes to be Rob Schmidt starts to tell Darren, you know what, I'll talk to him, I'll get him to stop, and uh, even if you, you call the police, Jennifer's going to deny it, she won't cooperate, because she's trying to protect Amber from knowing about her father the way he really is. Every time that Darren wanted to involve law enforcement, Rob Schmidt would appear in emails and you know, say that he was going to take care of it. At some point, saying he had taken care of it. And if this is some kind of role play, which is what they're going to argue, you, you'll see that uh, Rob Schmidt begins to send emails to Darren too, saying, hey, the abuse has happened again. It started again. She doesn't want you to know these things, but it's getting bad. So Darren is in Tennessee receiving all this information and already thinking that uh, she's being abused and gang raped and that she's in danger in danger from his point of view. The evidence is going to show that from his point of view, he really felt that she was in danger due to the way his mind works. So as we, as we go along in time, in August and then get to October, the evidence is going to show that in October or late September, uh, Jennifer tells Darren that, uh, that he had uh, cut her hair and that it had gotten worse and that he must have snapped. 
and yet held her underwater while he asked for oral sex. You're going to see evidence that that's what Darren was told. You're going to see evidence that uh, that he believed that after the oral sex underwater, that Jennifer had to be given CPR to bring it back. So at this point, Darren really believes that she's in danger of death and in danger of further physical abuse. The evidence will show that Darren believed that because of uh, things that were told to him and emailed to him, that October 9th was a special day for Jane. That it was going to be the anniversary of their meeting, of Jamie and Jennifer meeting, and that he had something special in store for her, that he was going to uh, have him, her give uh, oral sex to seven guys, seven of his friends that he already had told that he had done in the past that basically sold it to her, to, to them, or, or let them do whatever they wanted to her, that he was going to have seven of his friends uh, repeat the oral sex underwater on October 9th as a present to her uh, for her uh, uh, for them their anniversary of the meeting and that's very important because at that moment that's when she asked him I can't have this happen to me anymore you need to come down here and take care of him and she took advantage of his uh, his nature as a medic as a protector somebody who would sew up people in, 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 in in the battlefield, somebody who was so even enemy combatants. That was part of his nature, to take care of people. So she takes advantage of him as a protector, asks him to come down and protect me from this danger that I'm about to go through. So Darren, that's why he gets in his car, comes straight to Dallas. She tells him, we can't come into the house because Amber's here. She also had indicated to him that he would also abuse her on their dog walks. This information that the federal government received, this is information that law enforcement received. This is what you're going to hear. And that he felt at that time, in order to save her, he had to act immediately and take care of the threat, Hit the perceived threat. What he truly believed, and this was all beliefs that he held because of the lies that Jennifer Faye had fed him herself and through purported, uh, the purported Rob Schmidt and the purported Jamie Faye. And a reasonable person would have believed that at the time even if he didn't have PTSD. So at that point, he acted. And when he came out of the house, he had to take care of the apparent threat, the apparent danger, and shoot him. And he shot him in the head. He shot him in the torso. And he shot him in the groin as retaliation for the sexual abuse that he believed she had gone through. The evidence is going to show that uh, after Darren was arrested, uh, he still believed it that it was true, that she was being abused. It took, a, uh, it took a long time for him to believe that he had been played by Jennifer. He didn't believe that he had been played until he was able to see <coughs> documentation that Jennifer had finally admitted that she had made up the fake emails and that she had lied to Darren. You're going to hear that evidence. Okay? <coughs> You're going to hear evidence that, uh, that uh, once Jennifer got wind, that Darren might be cooperating with the federal government. When she got wind of that, she made one last ditch effort to try to convince him that she was telling the truth. You're going to see a letter and you're going to read, you're going to, that was sent by Jennifer to Darren in the jail where she says, don't believe what people are saying. Don't believe I didn't make up any fake emails. As people were making that up, it's not true. This was her last ditch effort to try to keep Darren from telling the truth in his cooperation with the federal government. After she, she was finally figured out that Darren was no longer going to go along with her in anything, now that he had figured out what really happened, and he was devastated, by the way, when he found out that this is, that, that Jamie was really not the person that she portrayed him to be or the monster that she portrayed him to be. But once she figured out that Darren was not going to play her game or lie for her and tell the truth as to why it really happened and how she manipulated him, she finally had to plead in federal court. 
Did she file? Objection to any actions after this on Jennifer Page, Your Honor, an opening statement. Sustained. <coughs> You're going to hear evidence that she admits to it all. Okay? You're gonna, that she finally admits to it all. And even after she admits to it all, Objection, she still Objection, Your Honor, as to what she did after the arrest of Darren Lopez. We are on trial for Darren Lopez. In opening statement. The objection is sustained at this point. Parties can approach the bench if they feel like this is going to be admissible at a later point in trial. But I'm going to instruct you not to get into it right now. Thank you, Your Honor. After if both sides rest and you've heard the real story and the credible evidence, uh, we're going to ask you to find Darren not guilty. Because at the time that he acted, he had a true belief in his mind <coughs> that he was in the apparent danger and he acted upon it. Because the real guilty person is Jennifer. Jennifer Faith. She's the real guilty person here. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Ms. Mitchell, call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Members of the gallery, please make sure that your cell phones are off. That doesn't mean vibrate. That means off. Not uh, radio silence or whatever they call that, airplane mode. It's got to be turned off. Anybody failing to comply with that will be removed from the courtroom. Thank you. State calls Jason Snyder. Jason Schneider. If you could please come to the front of the courtroom. Jason. Wrong, sorry. It's like you're on deck. You can exit the courtroom, sir. We'll call you in. We'll call you in at a later time. You'll need to exit the courtroom. Oh, sorry. We're going to call you next, apparently. <coughs> Hi. Mr. Schneider? Yes. Please come up to the front of the courtroom. Appreciate that. Watch out for the cords. And before you have a seat, could you turn and face me and raise your right hand? You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. I do. Please have a seat. You responded to questions first from Ms. Mitchell, who's in front of you. Perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Yeah. Jason Snyder. J A S O N. S N Y D E R. All right. And Jason, um, do you know a Jennifer and Jamie Faith? I do. Okay. And how did you know them? I uh, met them back in 2006 when they came to enroll Jennifer's daughter in my dance studio. All right. And this is when, uh, do you remember about what year that was? 2006. Okay. And this is when you guys were all living in Arizona? Correct. Okay. Phoenix area? Yes. All right. Um, were they married at the time, Jennifer and Jamie Faith? They were not, no. All right. Um, but uh, Jennifer Faith had a stepdaughter, or I'm sorry, had a daughter named Amber, correct? Correct. Do you remember about how old Amber was when they enrolled her in the dance school? Um, I'm guessing maybe around eight or nine. Okay. And from there, um, would you have encounters with Jamie Faith, James Faith? Yeah, I would. He, he would, uh, most of the time he would drop her off or pick her up and, you know, hang out during during uh, the time that she was in class so we would you know that's kind of how we got to know each other and uh, you know became friends okay and yes. you became friends with Jennifer Faith as well correct okay and would you guys go out to dinner together hang out yeah we we, uh, we would go we would do dinners we uh, eventually traveled together we spent holidays together um, so yeah when um, when you knew him back then um, do you know in what capacity he was working? Uh, I knew that he was in IT. I, I believe at the time he was with the airlines. I believe it was American at that time. It might have been United, but I think it was American. All right. So yeah. he's been with American Airlines or U.S. Airways before it merged for a long time, US correct? Airways, I'm sorry, yeah, correct. Okay. Um, do you know if, uh, if they eventually were married? Yes, they eventually got married. It, it was actually, I believe, 2012, um, and it was it was during a national dance competition that we were in, in Vegas for, so it was kind of unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were there. I was there. Yes. All right. And so it was sort of a spontaneous wedding. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a a joking, uh, you know, we should get married, or somebody told them that they should get married, and then it just kind of happened that same night. So. Um, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Okay. 
Mr. Snyder. I'm going to show you what's marked as state's exhibit number one. Do you recognize this photo? I do. All right. And who is it the photo of? Uh, Jamie Faith, James Faith. All right. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number two. Do you recognize this photo? I do. And do you recognize who was in this photo? It's James Faith, yeah. All right. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number three. Do you recognize this photo? I do, yes. And who was in this photo? Jennifer Faith. Right. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer <coughs> Um, into evidence states exhibits one and three and two for record purposes. <coughs> one and three for all purposes, two for record purposes. Okay. Are those exhibits are admitted and offered? Yeah. Members of the jury, when a piece of evidence is admitted for the record, that means it's for the court, it's not for you. Uh, you will have all of the evidence that was admitted for all purposes during your deliberations, but not pieces of evidence that were admitted for record purposes only. So keep that in mind. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Permission to publish Great. states exhibit number one. Go ahead. So this is a photo of James Faith, correct? Correct. Okay. <coughs> when, um, after the marriage, did they stay in Phoenix with you? Uh, yeah, they, they, I believe they lived in Phoenix till right around 2017, maybe beginning of 2018. All right, and then they moved to Dallas area? Correct. Did you stay in contact with them after they moved? I did. All right, and how would y'all stay in contact? Uh, phone calls, um, video chats, uh, and Jamie would, would travel back and forth to Phoenix because he still had um, employees that he was responsible for in Phoenix, so... <clears throat> when he would come into town, usually two or three nights, we would get together every night that he was there and have dinner, uh, drinks, and just kind of hang out, catch up. Okay. And during the time of COVID, would you guys still talk, and how would you talk? Uh, yeah, so obviously we weren't traveling during that time, but <clears throat> we, did, uh, we did video chats, we did virtual happy hours, um, and so yeah, we still kept in contact, texting, calling. Okay. Yeah. And just briefly, how would you describe James Bay? Oh, man, he, uh, just a great guy, um, funny, smart, very intelligent, um, genuine. When he was here, when he got, when he moved to Dallas, do you know if it was a promotion for him? Uh, yes, I believe it was, yes. Okay, and when he was working here up until the time of his death, do you know in what, what he was working as at American Airlines? Maybe his title, or as close as you can get. Uh, I believe he, I believe he was like, his title might have been like managing director, um, but it was in the IT space over the mobile platform. Over the mobile platform. Correct. That you and I might use when we're to book to book a flight on American Airlines. Yes. Okay. Um, did he also? You said he's a genuine nice guy. Like Halloween, liked pranks. Would yeah. you say all that? Okay. Oh, for sure. Yeah. All right. Had Hawaiian shirt Fridays. Hawaiian shirt Fridays. Yeah. Um, do you know if when they got to Texas was Jennifer Faith working? <clears throat> I believe she was for a short short period of time, and then um, I, I think she had some medical things that she, you know, um, she decided to kind of take a step back and stop working. So she probably for at least a year, year and a half, she, I don't believe she was working. And at the time of uh, Jamie Faith's death, do you know if she was working? She was not. Okay. Um, but you and she and Jamie kept in contact <coughs> all the way up until his death? Correct. All right. How were you contacted about Jamie Faith's death? Uh, Jennifer called me that morning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I basically woke up to that phone call. Okay. You in Arizona, she here in Texas? Correct. Okay. Um, what did she tell you that happened? Um, she was... Hysterical. I, I could, really couldn't make out what she was saying, um, and I thought initially she was talking about Jamie's father, who um, was going through chemo, and you know, he, he had a couple of uh, uh, different forms of cancer that he was he was battling. Um, and then it finally, you know, she finally kind of just said, "Jamie's been shot." Um, yeah, and so you know, hope hope. <clears throat> excuse me, hoping for the best, I said, well, you know, let, you know, hopefully he's okay. And she's like, no, he's dead. He's dead. Okay. Yeah. And did she give you any other details at that time? No. Uh, uh, right around that time, the, uh, 
I, I felt as though she called me before the police even got there um, because she said that, you know, the cops are coming over, they want to talk to me, and then so she, we, yeah, we had to hang up. Yeah, we, we hung up at that time. Seven thirty, Arizona time. Okay. Yeah, maybe a little earlier. So around nine thirty. No, Arizona time is when I cut. I mean, uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Okay. I don't know what time. At that time of year in October, would it be two hours or three hours? Two hours. Is it okay? Okay. I don't know. Um. Let me back up just a little bit. As far as Amber, do you know if Amber was living with him at the time of James' death? She was. She was actually at home during okay. that time. And she was at this point a graduate. She graduated college. Correct. Okay. Do you know if she was working? Uh, I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't believe so. Okay. Um, but and do you know if is it true that James Faith adopted Amber later in life? Yeah, I believe after she turned eighteen, he did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Was it is this something that, do you know who, how this came about, the adoption? Um, I don't know how it came about. I don't know who initiated the conversation, but um, <clears throat> I believe Amber wanted that to happen after she turned 18. Um, all right, so after the murder, when you're contacted in the morning mm -hmm. by Jennifer Faith, does she ask you to do anything? Um, Contact anyone. I don't believe so. Okay. No. All right. She just wanted to let you know. Correct. Yeah. Did you come out to Texas to be with her? Yeah. My yeah. We flew out the next day. Who's we? Uh, well, my ex now, but my wife at the time. Okay. Yeah. You flew out the next day to be with her. Correct. And about how long did you stay with her? Uh, I think about two or three days. Yeah. All right. Did she give you any more details about what had happened? Um. Not anything else that, that wasn't, you know, like just somebody ran up behind. Um, she didn't really get a good look. Um, face was covered. Um, and that's really it, really. Okay. Yeah, nothing Did you more. ever come to know um, someone named Darren Lopez? Uh, the first time I heard of, of Darren was when um, I was on a couple of, of different group text threads. Um, one One was... I think 13 or 17 people, and that was kind of formed by Jennifer to keep people updated on how the the investigation was going. Okay. Uh, and then the other one was just a, a handful of friends, uh, and Darren was on both of those. Darren was on both of those. Correct. Okay. And the one that, that you said 17 people or something, 15 to 17 people, that was almost exclusively Jennifer's family or friends? Yes. Yes. And then Darren? Correct. Okay. And during this text thread that you were, were talking about, at some point she names everybody on this text thread because not everybody knows everybody She kind of did, yeah, like a semi-formal introduction of this is this person and and, uh, and this is how I know them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then in this text thread she introduces Darren as someone that she knew back in high school. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I believe she, she might have even said that, you know, they were old high school boyfriend or girlfriend um, and... You know, they kind of reconnected. Okay. And this text group that she started is after uh, the murder, fairly soon after the murder. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Mr. Snyder, do you know a Jeremy Gebler? I do. He, uh, he worked with Jane, uh, Jamie. Okay. Were they very good friends? They were, they were really good friends, yes. Okay. Um, did they come from Wisconsin together? Um, Do you know? I, yeah, I, I don't know, to be honest with you. Okay. I think that there's some kind of connection from Wisconsin, but I don't know for certain. Okay. Because originally James Faith is from Wisconsin, correct? Correct. Big fan of the Green Bay Packers. Huge fan. Huge fan. Okay. And what did James Faith like to do First, in his spare time? Uh, he, he loved the game. So he was a gamer, um, loved to travel, um, hang out with family. He, he, uh, he was a bit of a foodie, you know, so he, he loved going to nice restaurants and, you know, having, having drinks. Yeah. Okay. And then um, as far as Jeremy Gebler, he's the one that, is he the one that introduced Jamie and Jennifer? 
Uh, yeah, I believe he and his wife um, are the ones that introduce him. Okay. And you came to know him in person? Jeremy? Jeremy, Correct, yes. yes. Okay. Because y'all all would hang out together? Yes. In Arizona? Yeah. Okay. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. At this time, Your Honor, I'll pass the witness. Thank you. Mr. Snyder, uh, so you knew Jennifer and Jamie well uh, before all this occurred, correct? I did, yes. Uh, and did you know that Jennifer worked, where she worked while she was in Arizona? Um, I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't know the company that she worked for, but I, I knew that she was kind of in the healthcare field. Uh, would, would, it, uh, would it be a rehab center she worked at? Would that, that sound familiar? Sounds familiar, like yes. Where she would deal with people that were rehabbing for injuries, strokes, things like that. Correct. I, I, I don't know what her role was. I, I eventually came to know that she kind of moved into more of the administrative side of things, but yes. So she was either director or high management of a rehab center. Correct. She had also, so she had a background in, in rehabbing people who were injured, right? Well, I think her background was in speech pathology. Right. Yeah. Right. But she did have a background in, in that she had to work, had to start at that rehab center at some point, and then she moved up uh, to administration. Yes. And... Uh, when you first heard about Jamie's death, how did Jennifer act? Was she distraught? Um, yeah, I mean, over the phone, she was, yeah. Was she crying? It appeared, yeah, it seemed, seemed to be, I could, I mean, from her voice and everything, it seemed as though she was. Uh, and she was acting like somebody who would, the way you normally would think someone who had a loved one killed act, right? Correct. Uh, was she... And you believe that, right? Did you believe that she was destructive? Genuine, correct. Yeah, I did. And you know, uh, how did you feel when uh, later on you found out that she'd been lying to you? Uh, yeah. Betrayed, you know. Because you knew her to be a good person? I did. You didn't know she had this other part of her, this devious side of her, correct? Not at all. And then what did you think and how did you react when you found out that that was all a lie and acting when she was talking to you? Um, I mean, by the time I found out, you know, it, it uh, she had been arrested. Um, so, I mean, I, it, I mean, if you're asking, I, I cut off all contact. I told her, her daughter actually reached out to me to ask if she can contact me or, you know, call me or write a letter, and I told her, absolutely not. When you... Uh when you found out that she'd been arrested and involved, uh, did you think back to when she called you distraught and crying and acting like she didn't really know what was going on? I mean, I think I replayed everything, yeah, in my mind. Uh, you said you felt betrayed. Yeah. Not only did she uh, betray you, she also betrayed uh, all those people on the text thread, right? Uh, yes. Um, she lied to her friends, she lied to you, and she lied to Jamie's family. Correct. And she was so good at lying that you had no idea that she was involved in this. Yeah, I, I would agree. You had no idea that she helped in the killing of Jamie. Right. I, I mean, I had no idea she was capable of any of the things that I found out. Yeah. I pass it. No further questions, Your Honor. Hey, this would just be finally excused. No objection. No objection. Very good. Sir, you may stand down. You're excused from any further service. Please watch your step on some of those cords. Call your next witness, please. State calls Emory Wilson, Your Honor. Members of the jury, if during the trial and in between witnesses you need to stand up and stretch your legs or your back like I do, please feel free and go ahead. No problem there. <laughs> Go ahead. Good morning. If you could, please, before you have a seat, could you turn and face me, please, and raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. I do. Please, have a seat. We respond to the questions first from Ms. Mitchell, and perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to the left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you please state and spell your name for the court? <coughs> 
My name is Emery Wilson. It's E M E R Y W I L S O N. Hi, Mr. Wilson. Where do you live? I live at 1018 South Waverly, Dallas, Texas. Okay. Um, and in Oak Cliff. In Oak Cliff, in the Oak Cliff area. All right. Um, you were neighbors with James and Jennifer Faith. Yes, I'm, my house is five houses south of theirs. Okay. Um, that street's in Dallas County, Texas. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, did you know James and Jennifer Faith before the incident? Yes, I had met them about uh, a little less than a year prior when I moved into the neighborhood. All right, so they were already living there, and then you moved in around, what, 2019? Yeah, uh, December uh, 2019. Okay, all right. Um, and would you guys do anything together, or did, did you just know each other as neighbors? Just as neighbors. Uh, they were the, actually the first couple to, uh, first family to introduce themselves when I moved into the neighborhood. Right. Uh, How was, did that come about? Uh, it was just a uh, Christmas uh, season, and they just very, in a very neighbor-like fashion came by and said hello and uh, dropped off a small gift. Dropped off a gift to you, mm -hmm. to your house? Yeah, like a welcome gift to the neighborhood. Was it Jennifer and James that did that together? Yes, Jennifer, James, and their daughter. And their daughter. Amber. And their daughter. I'm sorry, Amber. Uh -huh. They also had a dog, though, right? Yes, they had a dog, okay. Maggie. Maggie. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you continue to see them throughout the neighborhood from? Oh, very regularly, particularly during um, the COVID time. Uh, they they walk their dogs almost as frequently as, a, as I walk my dog. So my okay. dogs. So you see them on the dog walks? Yes. All right. And they were a friendly couple? Always, yes. All right. Um, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 4. May I approach the witness? Oh. <laughs> May I approach the witness? I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit Number Four. You and I have met uh, a couple of times, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right, and we went over this particular video. Is that correct? One of two. We went over. We went over two. Yes. Video? Yes. All right. Um, and and what, did you recognize what was in this video when we went over it? I did. Yes, we went over a video where. Um, well, before we get into okay, it, did sorry. you recognize what was in there? Yes, ma'am. Did you recognize the people that were in there? I did, yeah. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to offer into evidence State's Exhibit Number 4. No objection, Your Honor. Phase 4 is admitted. You may publish. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wilson, just to give some context before we get started, what are we going to be seeing in this ring video, the front door? Uh, the couple and their dog exiting their home. Okay, and this couple is? Jamie and Amber, excuse me, Jamie and Jennifer Faith. Okay, and this video is fairly short, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, but this is on the date of the murder, correct? Correct. October 9th of 2020. Yes. I'm going to object to the state's using the term murder. See the screen, Mr. Wilson? I can. Okay. All right. Can you s tell the jury what is who is exiting the house right now, or what appears to be exiting the house? Uh, that is Jennifer Faith and the dog uh, Maggie. <coughs> and Correct. Right. On their typical walk. <laughs> and we see on the timestamp of this, this was on 10-9 of 2020 at 734, 31 seconds. Correct? Correct. Correct. 
Mr. Wilson, at this time, around this time in the morning, do you hear gunshots? I did. Okay, and about how many did you hear? Seven. All right, were eight. you already awake or did it wake you up? I was awake sitting at my uh, uh, table at my, my house. I sit at my table and I was working during COVID, I, so it's very close, about 60 feet. Okay. So your table, though, it's in the front of your house? Correct. Well, you got the windows looking out onto the street. Right on the street. It's, uh, I'm, I'm about 20 feet from the street uh, where I sat. All right. Um, and uh, again, how many, about how many gunshots did you hear? Seven or eight. And what did you hear after the gunshots? Ex uh, very loud screaming. Okay. And that, uh, what did you do at that time? Uh, as, as soon as I heard the gunshots, I um, jumped up. Because it was on tip, it was very atyp atypical to hear that kind of noise on a, on a Friday morning during that time. So I jumped up, and as soon as I heard the screaming, I uh, opened my front door and, and I ran out of my house to see um, if anyone was uh, in danger. Okay, stop right there. May I approach the witness? Yeah. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number Five. This is the second video that you and I went over. Correct. Correct. All right. And though it does not come from your house. You and I went over it, and did you recognize the sounds that you heard on that morning in that video? I did, right. yes. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence State's Exhibit Number 5. No objection. State's 5 is admitted for all purposes and Thank you, Your Honor. permission this is not it's working on it we're not doing anything we'd like to play it from co-counsel's laptop is it an exact copy it is an exact copy <coughs> go ahead This 
is not your house. This is a house on one of your streets. Uh, uh, this is one of the houses on your street. Is that correct? Correct. It's the house, two houses uh, up from Jamie and Amber's. Yes, I did. I did immediately. Okay. And again, you're how many houses? Five houses south. Okay. Um, so what do you do when you leave the house? I, I right after I hear, hear the gunshots and the screaming, I, I, I ran out my house and um, immediately heard the screaming as I, and, and saw the dog run past my home. So I knew it was probably Jamie and Amber, excuse me, Jamie and uh, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And I, to be honest, I, I was worried it might be them because... Um, they walked at that same time every morning, <clears throat> and I walked typically a little bit afterward. And so, um, as I as I uh, come out the home, I go straight straight to the down the side to the sidewalk, and I see and look down from the direction where the screaming was, and I see a body laying in the street. Um, Do you recognize who it is? I, I couldn't tell, but I just assumed it was Jamie because it was he dressed typically the way he was. And his feet were facing towards me. And I heard screaming, but I could not see the face. And so um, my dogs had run out with me, and um, I put them in the house. And there was another neighbor that was outside watering her plants, and she was on the phone with the police. And I decided I would run down um, to go to see if she was okay or the person that was screaming was okay. Did you register that the person who was screaming was Jennifer Faith? I, I figured it was because Jamie, was, she was, although she was invisible, uh, it sounded like her. And... Um, uh, there was usually no one else out walking at that time of morning, and it was coming from a house directly next to theirs. The screaming was. And so um, <clears throat> I start to run down, and uh, I'll get about two houses down, uh, up from where I live, and um, that's when I stop because I see someone enter the sidewalk. Uh, and the person entered the sidewalk with a gun and turned and looked at me um, wearing a blue, like a, a blue surgical mask and a hoodie. Uh, and I froze, and, and I turned back to my home and ran back into my house. Okay, 
So how far away was this man who had the gun? 20 to 30 feet. Did he point the gun at you? No, it was uh, held at his right side. Okay. Did you make right contact hand. with him? Yes. Okay. So did he have his mask on covering his face? Yes. Or, I'm sorry, his mouth and nose? His mouth and nose. And all, I could only see the eyes of the individual. Uh, the hood kind of obstructed most of the forehead. Okay. Do you remember if he was what he was wearing for pants? Jeans. Jeans. Mm -hmm. Jeans and a hoodie covering part of his face and the mask. The mask. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you clearly saw a gun in his hand? Immediately, yes. Right. And what did you do when you saw the gun? I turned around and ran back into my home. Okay, to do what? To grab my gun. All right. Um, what did you do when you grabbed your gun? I loaded it, and then I ran out of my house uh, to go back to see to Jennifer. Uh, no one really, there were neighbors poking their heads out. I just wanted to make sure she and Jamie were okay. Okay. Did you encounter this man with the gun and the hoodie and the jeans when you came back out of your, out of your house with your gun? I did not. Okay. Did you see him get into a vehicle? I did not. And therefore, you did not see him drive away? No. Okay. Your contact with him was on the sidewalk about 20 feet away? Yes. Okay. And so um, you go down, you have your gun, you don't see him anymore. Do you get a chance to speak to Jennifer? I do. All right. And how is she? Hysterical. All right. Um, uh, and very shaken, sh just shaken up, uh, afraid. She kept saying that no one came, no one came. Uh, I guess that was to mean that no one came to, to see about her or to come to the rescue. Um, um, and so uh, I just said, we're here. I, I would call the police. I was praying with her, trying to console her. I checked on the body, and uh, it was clear that Jamie was was dead. Um, could you, okay. um, did you happen to ask her what happened? I did. And she said, she said someone ran up behind them and began shooting at them. Uh, and I asked her, was she shot? And she said, no. I said, are you hurt? And she said he tried to take uh, her ring, I think it was, off, I think it was her wedding ring, and uh, uh, it, it used uh, tape to bind her hands. And, um, Were her hands bound when you saw her? No. Mm -mm. So she was able to get it off? Yes, it was a, mm -hmm. okay. She recanted that to the, uh, the first cop that came. I stayed with her for quite a while. Uh, and she asked me to stay. She recanted that story to the first cop and held up a very small piece of duct tape. So it was, it was, it was. It didn't seem like enough to hold uh, anyone. That's so. I assume that's how she was able to get free because it was a very small piece okay. of duct tape. Um, and about how much later did the police arrive from the time that you're standing there talking to her? Um, I can't really tell. Maybe a minute. It was quick. Yeah. What you're saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one of the responding officers came up and tried to talk to her. Mm -hmm. Was she still in a state of yes. hysterical? Yes, very, very hysterical, speaking very fast. Um, Did you say speaking very fast? Speaking very fast, yes. And so it was hard to get information out of her, would you say? It, I would say so. Uh, it, uh, it seemed I attributed it to, to, to shock, um, and, you know, not being able to convey things and things happening so quickly. Um, uh, but... Yeah, it wasn't a lot of information, and she didn't give any details. They asked what the person looked like, and she wasn't able to give any. Um, I, I felt like I had more details about the individual. I haven't seen them for two seconds. Okay. Um, do you stay with her? How long do you stay with her? Oh, 30 to 40 minutes, 30, 30 or 45 minutes. Okay. I was barefoot and, and sat outside with her, trying to, you know, praying with her, trying to calm her nerves. Okay. And does she stay somewhere near where the body is? Mm -hmm. After about 10 minutes, um, uh, she was sitting um, kind of obstructed by a fence in the driveway of the home next door, mm -hmm. which was vacant at the time. Um, and uh, the cop. The blue house at the time. The blue house at the time. It's no longer there. But um, the cop asked us to, she asked to sit down, and we, we, the, 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 the policeman uh, escorted her back to her home, and I just sat with her there on her front porch for the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, all right. Um, and you eventually leave. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you continue to um, stay in touch with her after? Yes. Um, the, the, the next day, um, I went and delivered uh, some, just some food um, to, to Jennifer. And uh, she asked me, because I, I walk my dogs two, three times a day, and, and it was COVID. And Jamie uh, always accompanied her on their dog walks. And so she asked it if 
I would uh, walk with her, uh, me and another neighbor. Um, I said yes. Uh, I thought I was not intending to start walking again because of what had happened. I was quite afraid, um, but I thought it would be the, the neighborly thing to do to help where I could. Okay. All right. So you all continued to do that for a, a, a for, uh, for a little less than two weeks until I, I basically couldn't do it anymore. I was, I was having a lot of mixed feelings. As far as Jennifer, your mixed feelings. Yes, that's exactly what it was. That's exactly what it was. Um, there was a about a week after the the Jamie was killed. Um, we were walking myself and her and her daughter and and, and, and some friends, mm -hmm. and um, I had not met the friends before. They were in town from I guess another state, maybe California. I think that's what they said. Uh, in any event, uh, on our return back to the house, um, I was not feeling really well about the experience, and I had made mention that I had seen the individual. I guess that, that she had missed that part um, in, in the all the commotion, and I mentioned that I had seen the individual on when I ran, ran out the house, yeah. and and I continued to walk um, ahead of them, not knowing that. They had, the four people that I was with had stopped, and uh, I realized that they had stopped. And I said, and I turned around, and they were all looking at me. And I said, and they said, you, she said, you saw the person. And I said, yes. And she, and she said, was he black or Hispanic? I said, well, I don't know. Um, I mean, what would you say I was if I were in a mask? That's what that was my response. I mean, it's hard to tell with my complexion. And I wouldn't dare do that to someone, racial profile, somebody like that. So um, I just I don't know. Um, and I was quite surprised that she was not um, remorseful or showed any form of sadness that I did not know uh, that I had seen the person but couldn't give any more details. Witness. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wilson, uh, you indicated that you were working from home uh, at this period of time. Yes, sir. And where were you working at the time? At my uh, dining room table. Okay. And which company were you working for? I worked for. I, I don't know if I should say. I didn't tell my. I told. I promised my job I would not mention. Oh. What kind of work was it that you were involved? I'm a bank examiner. Okay. So, and was, had you just started to work at home because of COVID, or had you been doing that for a while? A while, yeah. It had been since May, excuse me, since March of 2020. So in March of 2020, uh, your job was forcing you to work from home because of COVID, and it, to, as a matter of fact, the whole world was shut down around that time, wasn't it? Yes, sir. I mean, it was hard for people to see each other, people were isolated from each other, as you were, right? I was, well, I don't know if I was isolated. I mean, I walked in my neighborhood every day. It was hard to go out to a restaurant and meet people. Yes. It was hard to go to the movies and, and see a movie with somebody, right? The, the social aspects of life have been pretty much shut down, other than who lived immediately near you, correct? Correct. And so you hear these shots, you run out, uh, and you make eye contact with the individual who uh, had the gun, right? Correct. Uh, how long of the eye contact? Was it brief? A couple seconds. But you could tell he saw you, and he could tell you saw him. Correct. And he never raised a gun toward you? No. He never threatened you? No. He never said anything to you? No. He just left? I left. You left. And you believe shortly thereafter he left, too? Indeed. And then, so you approach uh, Jennifer, and you said she was hysterical. Um, was she trembling, acting like she was, you know, she just went through a shocking event, that she didn't know who caused it? Yes, she was acting like she had gone through a hysterical event. Were there tears in her eyes? No. So she was hysterical, trembling? Yes. Uh, and did you go up to her and try to calm her down? At that all, all of the above, yes. Prayed with her and everything. Um, and you were present and uh, when uh, you were present when they were asking her about who we, to give a description, it was surprising to you that she couldn't do that at that point? Yes. Because you could give a description. 
Yes. You could tell them what the person was wearing, uh, the hoodie, the jeans, and the mask, right? Correct. So that kind of stuck with you in your mind. It that did. She, that she could, because, and would it, did it, did, and now we know, though, that she knew exactly who it was, right? Yes, sir. And how does that make you feel? Uh, make me feel, I mean, disappointed that I, I, waste, I pretty much wasted my time trying to help someone that was using me, but yeah. not she mad was, at her. She was using your good nature as a neighbor? I think more or less she just used everybody. I mean. Okay. Uh, nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Mason. May this witness be finally excused. No objection, Your Honor. Very good, sir. You may stand down. Please uh, watch out for those cables. Ms. Mitchell, I see the next. Uh, Can we approach? Sure, come on up. Let me see the lawyers real quick. of the jury. We are going to take uh, our first morning break, so please um, mind a few of my instructions. If you could, uh, make sure that you don't discuss anything that you've heard even in court today. Please don't do any independent research. Um, please don't get on your phone and start looking up things, places, people, anything like that. Um, we're going to take about a 10 minute break, so I'll need you back in the jury room at 1020. Um, and await further instructions at that time. Thank you all very much. Courts in recess, all rise for the jury.
Thank you, Sheriff. Y'all may be seated. Members of the jury, you will recall that we are in the state's case in chief. Ms. Mitchell, call your next witness, please. Thank you, Your Honor. State Court Sergeant Shirley. You would please, sir, come to the front of the courtroom. And before you have a seat, could you turn to face me and raise your right hand? You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Please have a seat. We responded to questions first from Ms. Mitchell, perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Alexander Shirley, A-L-E-X-A-N-D-E-R, Shirley, S-H-I-R-L-E-Y. Sergeant Shirley, for whom do you work? The Dallas Police Department. And you have the rank of sergeant, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. How long have you been with Dallas Police Department? About 10 years. 10 years? And what have been your various roles at Dallas Police Department? Mostly patrol. Okay. Are you in patrol currently? Yes. You're a sergeant over patrol? Yes. Let's just jump right into it. On or about October 9th of 2020, were you working patrol? Yes, ma'am. And were you on duty that particular day? Yes, ma'am. Were you dispatched to a call on Waverly Street? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Involving what you came to later know as residents of 926 Waverly? Yes, ma'am. Right. And that's in Dallas County, Texas, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you respond alone or do you have people with you? Did you have someone in the car with you? Do you recall? I don't recall if I had someone in the car with me, but multiple elements were dispatched. Okay. And what was the nature of the dispatch? What was the nature of the call that you were dispatched to? A shooting. A shooting call. Okay. One shot, multiple shots? Did they give any? I don't recall exactly the details that were given to us. Okay. But you do recall it was a shooting call? Yes. All right. And when you get there, what do you do first? The first thing I did was park my squad car blocking the street, exit the squad car, and walk towards a deceased body. I'm sorry, what did you say? A deceased body. Okay. And so where do you see this body? In the street. Close to the sidewalk? Not in the middle, but closer to the side of the street, closer to the sidewalk. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you approach the body? I walked that direction, and then I came in contact with a female. All right. Do you recall who that female was? I don't recall her name. How was she acting? Very emotional. And what do you mean by emotional? Just hyperventilating, just emotional. All right. Hysterical? Hysterical would be a great word to describe it. Describe some of what she was doing, her demeanor. She was flailing her arms. She was crying. She was, I can't say screaming, but just very outwardly emotional and distraught. Okay. Was she somewhat close to the body? Yes, she was in relatively close proximity. Okay. And what were you all trying to do? I was attempting to get her up towards the side of her house so she wouldn't have to see that body in the ground. Okay. Was the body covered at the time? It was not. Okay. So it was just laying there? Yes, ma'am. Did you get any information from this particular woman who was acting hysterical? I did not. All right. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Sergeant Shirley, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibits 8, 9. Apologies. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Have you seen these photos? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Do you recognize what's in these photos? Yes, ma'am. All right. Is this a photo? Are these just a few photos of the scene on October 9, 2020 at around 7.30 a.m. when you were dispatched? Yes, ma'am. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence States Exhibits 6 through 10. Okay. You're admitted to all purposes. You may publish. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Sergeant Shirley, I'll put these up on the screen, okay? All right. This is the street of Waverly Place Street, correct? Yes, ma'am. That's the scene that morning? Yes, ma'am. All right. And what do we see here? That is a body. 
Okay. At this point, it had been covered up, correct? Yes, ma'am. But when you got there, it was uncovered? Yes, ma'am. All right. And this is a closer shot. We see that there is a blue house and the body is in front of it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, can you point out on the screen where Jennifer was standing when you... She was approximately right here. Um, oh, it doesn't show It's it. not drawn. Hang on one second. Oh. I can uh, enable the touch screen if you'd like. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, yeah, to, right, uh, right, right there. Okay, and what were you attempting to get her to do? I was attempting to get her up the sidewalk, um, kind of towards the side of her house, so she'd have to look at the, um, the body. Okay, okay. Um, and were you... This is just another picture. You can just tap that screen to turn it off. Yes, thank you. This is just another photo of that. Were you aware of where Jennifer lived? No, ma'am. Okay. And this is just another photo of the body as you saw it? Yes, ma'am. When it was eventually covered up, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. <clears throat> um, after you are attempting to get her away from the body, what do you do next? I start uh, going down to residences. Um, I'm speaking to witnesses and looking for houses with cameras. Okay, so some people came out, some people did. Yes, ma'am. All right. And were you trying to know if there were surveillance cameras? Yes, ma'am. On the houses? Yes, ma'am. And what were you doing with that information? I was walking down, notating my whip up book, which addresses had cameras. Okay. Um, and then I would hand, her that, hand that over to the detectives. All right. Did, did um, the homicide detectives come on scene fairly quickly? I, I can't remember the time frame, but they did. yes, they did come on scene. Okay. At some point, do you, do you come to find out that a witness may have taken a photo of the suspect vehicle? Yes, ma'am. All right. And do you go up to that neighbor? Yes. All right. Do you actually view the video or the phone? Or, I'm sorry. Do you view some video or a photo off this neighbor's phone? Yes, he had surveillance camera and I did view uh, parts of the video. Okay, but also on his phone? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then you you were trying to see what the suspect vehicle was to see if you could get what? Uh, suspect car information, like I put it on the radio. Um, ran, our standard procedure is get a suspect car, make model descriptions, identifying marks, and put it on the radio so other officers can try to locate the vehicle. All right, and the, are we also trying to get any license plate number if possible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm going to show you what's marked the states 11 and 12. Do you recognize these photos? Yes, ma'am. 11 and 12, okay. And these are blown up versions of what you saw on the phone, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. But are these two photos that what you saw on the phone that particular day? Yes, ma'am. All right. May I, uh, Your Honor, at this time I'd like to offer to evidence states exhibits 11 and 12. Sorry. 11 and 12 are admitted for all purposes. You may publish. The state's exhibit 11. What are you... What are you made aware of in state's exhibit 11? I'm made of aware that it, it appears to be a Nissan Titan, black in color, with a T, which I believe was a Texas Ranger emblem on the back uh, window. Okay, and from this photo, were you able to get a license plate? I was not. All right, even blown up as we have them here. And this one, blown that up, you can see the emblem a little bit better on the back of the truck. That's correct, yes, right. ma'am. But you were pretty fairly confident at that time you were looking for a nice black Nissan Titan truck. Yes, ma'am. All right. At the same time, in this picture, too, you were unable to, to get a clear license plate. That is correct. And it goes on for a while that people think that that is a Texas Ranger sticker on the back because it's sort of shaped like the Texas Ranger emblem, correct? I believe after I put that information on the radio, that's what we were going off of because uh, that's the only good video we had at the scene, to my knowledge. Okay. Um, do you relay this information to the detectives? Yes, ma'am. That you have, this neighbor has this on their phone? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what do you do after that? At that point, I'm in a stand 
standby pattern as patrol. We were just having scene security and waiting for crime scene and detectives to process the scene. Okay. Um, do you, if you recall, do you transfer anybody to headquarters? I did not. Okay. Was this the end of your shift? I was, I think I was supposed to be off already when this call came out. So it was the very end of the shift. Okay. Um, do you do anything, do you go anywhere else related to this case um, away from nine, from Waverly Street? No, ma'am. So everything you did, you did that particular morning on that street, keeping the crime scene? Yes, ma'am. And talking to some witnesses, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Nothing further, Your Honor. I'll pass the witness. Cross examination, Sergeant. Uh, that that sticker that you saw on the on the truck, you believe that was a Texas Rangers sticker, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, and then eventually you came to know that it was really a Tennessee sticker, or did you find that out? I was told that, yes, sir. And so that's a pretty big sticker on that truck, right? I I think I described it as eight inches uh, big on the video. So uh, the person who would presumably be driving that car would know that that sticker would stand out, right? I'm sorry, can you say that again? The person who was driving that vehicle would presumably know that that sticker could be seen easily. I don't know what the person driving the car would think. But it wasn't hard for you to make out from the video. I, yeah, I believed it to be a Texas Ranger sticker, yes, sir. Now, you, uh, you approached uh, Jennifer Faye, and you described her to the jury as very emotional. Yes, sir. She was flailing. Yes, sir. She was crying. Yes, sir. Did you see any tears? I don't recall if I saw some. Maybe? I, I don't recall. And uh, was she uh, was she convulsing? Was she shaking in any way? I can't recall if she was convulsing or shaking. Okay. Uh, she could have been. You just don't recall. Yes. Uh, did you come to find out that that was all an act? Um, through media, yes. I think I, I I'm aware that that could have been an act, but I'm not. I don't. I don't know what she was doing. Did you Did you talk to any other law enforcement after your initial contact? Uh, in this case, were you interviewed by detectives or, no. or so you had no knowledge no. of whether that was an act or not? Uh, you just heard stuff through different sources. Yes, sir. Uh, were you shown any uh, any other ring videos in preparation for your testimony here today? No. Only only the pictures that you presented here to the, to the That's judge. That is correct. I passed it. Further. Can this witness be finally excused? No objection. No objection. Very good. Sir, you may stand down. Watch out for the cables. Ms. Mitchell, call your next witness, please. Okay, Your Honor, the state calls Detective Gonzalez. Sir, if you would please come to the front of the courtroom. And before you have a seat on the witness stand, could you turn and face me and raise your right hand? You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. You're responding to questions first from Ms. Mitchell and perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Can you please state and spell your name for the court reporter? Uh, my name is Michael Ray Gonzalez. My last name is spelled G O N Z A L E Z. And uh, uh, your rank of detective? I'm a detective. Yes, ma'am. And for whom do you work? I'm a Dallas police officer. I have been for about 25 years. But for the last 21 years, I've been assigned to the crime scene investigation unit. All right. Can you describe briefly to the jury what that means? A crime scene investigator is uh, they consider secondary responders. You get your primary responders, your first responders. Those are the officers that uh, drive the squad cars with the lights on them. And uh, they respond to your 911 calls. Uh, when they get there, they determine an offense had occurred, and uh, it needs to be documented. Some evidence may need to be collected, and that's when they will call me, the crime scene investigator, the secondary responder. I respond and uh, collect any evidence that needs to be collected. Okay. And on um, October 9th of 2020, you were working in um, crime response. Crime scene, was, yes, ma'am. I was in the crime scene response. section, yes, ma'am. On October 9th of 2020. Yes. And you were sent out to the scene at uh, around 926 Waverly yes. um, Street in order to document and collect evidence. Is that correct? correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. 
Gonzalez, do you recall what it looked like when you got to the scene? When I got to the scene, I know the officers, uh, they had secured the, the street. There was a, they determined there was evidence on the street, so they, they block off uh, both sides of traffic, so nothing gets uh, run over or anything. So, so that's, that's normal protocol? That's, that's normal, and like I said, that's just uh, to keep, the, keep any potential evidence. And, uh, and uh, there was a body on the ground covered in a t with a tarp. So. Okay, so when you got there, the body was already covered? Yes, ma'am. I got there a little late. I was, yes, ma'am. Um, what do you do when you first get there? When I first get there, I, uh, I speak to the officers at the scene and uh, determine what they got. In this case, they told me there was a, a homicide and uh, that there was uh, firearms evidence on the street. And what do you mean by firearms evidence on the street? They said there was um, fire cartridge casings. Okay. Okay. Um, and what did they want you to do? What did they want me to do? Uh, I, I've done a bunch of scenes. I start off with uh, speaking to them. Then I'll take uh, photographs. I'll take overall photographs of the way the scene is, uh, as it is. And uh, once I get those photographs, I'll take a, I take overalls, I take mid-range, I take close-ups. And uh, I see the evidence. I'll place evidence markers. And I'll, I'll take the same photographs again, uh, overall, mid-range, close-ups with the, with the placards. And then uh, we'll collect the evidence. And, uh, Detectives may walk around the scene and uh, see any other evidence, any other pieces of potential evidence that they want collected. In this case, we found uh, sunglasses or uh, candy wrappers, beer bottles. So. And since you don't know if it's relevant, right here with it the all scene, needs, it all needs to be collected. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can I approach the witness, you all? States 13 through 69. Can you flip through these and recognize them? This one, these are all photographs that I took that on the 9th of October. All right, and this is an accurate depiction of what you photographed that particular day? Yes, ma'am. No additions or deletions? No. Right. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer the evidence space 13 through 69. This is just you putting a placard down. Correct. Um, that you're taking these, that it's your crime scene. It's, it's got the date, it's got the case number assigned to this offense. Okay. And it's just in this, that it's me taking the photographs and the type of offense that it is. All right. 
perfect. Let's start with Stacey Exhibit number 14. Um, this is the scene that looked like when you arrived, correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. And uh, again, when you arrived, the body was underneath that tarp. Correct. Just a closer up. Yes, Were you familiar with where the victim lived? Were you told during the investigation? Uh, if I did, I don't recall. I know the body was in front of, I guess, 1002 Waverly. Okay. But no, I do not know his exact residence. Okay. All right. And this is just a photo with all of your markers out, which is part of your process when you're collecting the evidence, correct? Yes, ma'am. with marker number one. Can you tell the jury what you are? It's hard to see, I know. Yeah, Can you tell? I'm refer to my notes also, but number one was uh, eyeglass lens. An eyeglass lens. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And let me, this is state exhibit number 20. Let me go back to. I'm sorry. Did you say number one, right? Yes, number one was an eyeglass lens. Yes. All right. Let's go back to State's Exhibit 18. The number one marker is pretty far away from the body. Would you agree? Correct. Okay, but that number one marker is where you found the eyeglass lens. Yes, ma'am. Okay, were you aware if the victim wore eyeglasses? I was not aware. Okay. But they were definitely, it was definitely out of place. All right, and number two, we see that, can you tell the jury what you are marking in State's Exhibit number two? Number two was the eyeglasses uh, yeah. that are missing a lens. Okay, and this is State's Exhibit 20 that we're talking about. Yes, ma'am. 21. So the, 21. Yes, ma'am. These are eyeglasses that are missing a lens. Correct. Let's go back to State's Exhibit 19. And can you point out to the jury where State's Exhibit number two, the eyeglass missing the lens, was found? On the, from my you point of view. You can point the, to the screen. The left hand, side, left hand side of the screen. Just go ahead and touch it. Right. Okay. All right. Again, pretty far away from the body. Correct. All right, and State's Exhibit number three is, I'm sorry, State's Exhibit number 22, marker number three. That's going to be a fire cartridge casing, uh, 45 caliber. Okay, and if we compare it to State's Exhibit number 19. Right, it's on the, on the right-hand side opposite of number two. In keeping State's Exhibit number 19 up, what do we see in State's Exhibit That's going to be a close photo of uh, the head stamp of the, the, of the fire cartridge case. Okay. State's Exhibit number 24, what do we see here? Also another fire cartridge case. All right, and in comparison to State's Exhibit number 19, we can see where that is found around the body, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is it the same type of fire cartridge casings as in states? Yes, yes ma'am. As marker number three, states exhibit number 23. Correct, yes. And we see that that's true in states exhibit number 25, correct? Yes, ma'am. Five, six, and seven, what are we, what are you marking here? More of the same, uh, more uh, 45 caliber fire cartridge cases. All right. And going back to State's Exhibit number 19, we can see that where five, six, and seven are in relation to the body. Yes, ma'am. And then you go ahead and mark each one as the same caliber, correct? Yes. And State's Exhibit number 28. Correct. And you do, you go individually and do it the same with State's Exhibit number 30, marker number six. Yes, ma'am. And you do the same with seven, State's Exhibit number 32. Yes. All right. State's Exhibit 8 and 9, what are we looking at here? I'm just, sorry, I keep doing that. State's Exhibit number 33. Right, those are uh, IMS markers number 8 and 9, which are, we pick the area of uh, two more fire cartridge casings, also 45 caliber. All right. And you go ahead and show that in State's Exhibit number 35. State's Exhibit number 37, correct? Yes, ma'am. 
Can you tell me what we're looking at? States exhibit number 38. It's going to be across the street, uh, I guess, on the, on the western side of uh, Waverly. That was, uh, that was markers 10 and 11. And those are beer bottles, uh, empty beer bottles, Modelo and Seagram's, and also a, uh, a note that was found on the, along the curb line. I think the note just had a phone number on it. Okay. All right. And again, you don't know what's relevant at this point. Correct. So. Which is trying to collect as much evidence as we can. Or potential evidence. Okay. And this was States Exhibit 38, in case I did not say that. Yes, this is just a closer view of States Exhibit, or I'm sorry, in States Exhibit 39, a closer view of markers 10 and 11, correct? Yes. States Exhibit 41 actually shows the note that you were talking about with some phone number on it. Yes. All right. Now let's move on to States Exhibit 42. What are we looking at here? Uh, number 42 is going to be a, it's a fired bullet. It was actually uh, found uh, down, the, down the street uh, in front of uh, 1014 South Waverly. Okay. This is a closer up picture in States Exhibit 43? Correct. States Exhibit 13. Where was the, wait, can you describe what, you're, what we're looking at? Yeah, there, there were pieces of duct tape uh, that were along the, the driveway of, I think, 1002 South Waverly. It was, I'm sorry, along the driveway? In the driveway, yes, ma'am. They told In the me, driveway. Yes, they told me that uh, the story that I got from the officers at the scene is that uh, they were on uh, the lady that was at the scene that got assaulted. And uh, I guess they took him off or it fell off, but that was evidence that was on her at one time. Okay, and that's States Exhibit number 45. Let me jump to States Exhibit number 47. And it's not a close-up, but can you point out to the jury 13, where 13 is? Where 13 is. With the duct tape? Oh, it's over here along the, the right arm fence, so the, the metal fence. Okay, so in, in the driveway of 1002 Waverly Place. Yes, ma'am. And then also in this picture, we are looking at uh, markers 14 and 15 in States Exhibit 47. I see 14. Uh, right in the, right, 14 is right in the middle of the driveway. I believe that was a, a candy wrapper. Okay. Uh, I think mean, M&M's, peanuts, and number 15, which is an empty water bottle. All right, and the States Exhibit... 48, we get another angle of where this duct tape was in marker 13, correct? Correct. Yes, ma'am. All right. Can you just point it out quickly to the jury? The duct tape is right here on the, on the drive. Now, in States Exhibit 50, we've moved to marker 16. Do you know what you're documenting there? Uh, it's hard to see in the picture, but 16 were actual cigarette butts. 16A and 16 and 16A there were two cigarette butts that I collected. Would be in states 51? Correct. Yes, so there's a one there's here. Can you point out the two cigarette butts? Right, there's one here and one here. Okay. Once again, we're just hoping for DNA, some kind of evidence, DNA evidence. Uh, and again, uh, states exhibit 52. You've now moved to marker 17. What are you documenting? Uh, number 17, I believe that's a can of uh, orange juice. Was this also across the street? Yes, ma'am. States Exhibit 54, what are we looking at here? That's going to be a, shed, a storage shed uh, with the doors open. That's in the, behind 1002 South Waverly. Okay. Were you aware that the house was uh, vacant? The house was vacant? No, I wasn't aware. Okay. All right. But this shed was behind that blue house that we're looking at where the body was found in front of. Yes, ma'am. And in States Exhibit 55, we have the blue house, the back of it. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, Mayor, briefly approach the witness. Sure. <clears throat> Detective I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 71. Did you create this um, as part of your duties as a crime crime scene response? Yes, ma'am. It's a, a computer generated sketch that I created. Okay. And uh, that's of 1,000, well, that's of Wa Waverly Street? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and you said the body was found in front of 1,002 Waverly? Yes, ma'am. All right. The house right next door is 926 Waverly, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. 
At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer you evidence that's Exhibit 71. And just so we're clear to the jury, what's attached to this are measurements that, are, that are, of the location of the evidence. Okay. We have no objection. Admitted. You may publish. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Just to give the jury some context here, again, I'm going to continue with the evidence right now. In States Exhibit 56, it's the back of the house the body was found in front of, correct? Yes, ma'am. States Exhibit 18. Can you tell the jury what we're looking at? It was a pair of eyeglasses, a pair of sunglasses that were... Excuse me. States Exhibit 58. It is States Exhibit 58, marker 18. Gotcha. Yeah, a pair of sunglasses that were just hanging on the fence post, the fence that separates 926 and 1002 South Waverly. Like I said, it was just out of place, and we just took them. Okay. Was the fence, was that side of the fence on the side of the 1002? That's on the side of 1002, yes. Okay. All right. So, again, you don't know what's going to become relevant, so you collect. Correct. And States Exhibit 59, what are we looking at here? That was a roll of duct tape that we noticed that was on the southeast corner of 1002 Waverly, just on the roof. We figured since there was duct tape at the, we collected from in front of the house, and there was a roll of duct tape on the roof, we collected it. It could be connected. Yes, ma'am. All right. Did you do anything with that particular roll of duct tape? We did process it for fingerprints, and there was none collected. There were no fingerprints lifted. All right. States Exhibit 60, what are we looking at here? The detective requested I swab the door handle of that 1000, the back door of 1002 South Waverly for any potential DNA evidence. Okay. Do you know if any was found? I do not know. I just collect it and package it and make sure it's available. Okay. All right. I'm going to show you now what's marked as States Exhibit number 61. Okay. And this is the body uncovered? Yes, ma'am. All right. And what are you documenting in States Exhibit 61, marker 21? That was also was a 45 caliber. It also was a 45 caliber? Yes, ma'am. And States Exhibit, this is a closer view, States Exhibit 62? Yes, ma'am. That's the 45 caliber fire cartridge case. Okay. And this is where you show that it's the same caliber as States Exhibit 63? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you also go ahead and photograph some of the body? I do. I try to document some of these injuries, but with the assistance of the medical examiner. We're not allowed to touch the body, so I take all the photographs from different angles. And I believe after the medical examiner was finished with the examination, we moved the body, and I found a bullet that was underneath, actually underneath a bullet fragment that was underneath the body also. Okay. And States Exhibit 64, this is you documenting the scene and the body? Yes, ma'am. Okay. States Exhibit 65? Yes, ma'am. States Exhibit 66? Yes, injury photos. Yes, ma'am. And States Exhibit 67, what are we looking at here? It was just the overall of the body, how the shirt's lifted up. There was an obvious bullet hole on his stomach. Okay. And who bagged the hands? The medical examiner. Medical examiner. All right. And States Exhibit number 68, what are we looking at? That's that bullet fragment I was referring to earlier. When they rolled the body, it was attached to a shirt, and we just collected it when they rolled the body. All right. And then States Exhibit 69? Just another photo of it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. In States Exhibit 15, we see the body in front of the 
vacant blue house, correct? Yes, ma'am. And that's the house you marked at as 1002 Waverly. Yes, ma'am. Correct? All right. And state's exhibit number 71, you note where the body is in front of 1002 Waverly. Correct. And to my left is 926 Waverly. Yes, ma'am. Correct? Yes. That's the house next door then? Yes. So in state's exhibit number 15, this great house would be 926 Waverly. Yes. All right, Detective Gonzalez, so you collect everything that we just went through at the scene and you took your photos. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then what do you do with the property um, when you when you take it away from the scene? I, I take it back to my office. Uh, the fire cartridge cases, we work on immediately. We uh, I package them and uh, they're placed in plastic bags. They're sealed with blue tape. Uh, the bag is labeled with the case number assigned to this offense and also the tag number uh, assigned to this offense to the evidence and each bag is labeled the same way I initial them this, uh, I seal them and then I initial them and each one has the tag number case number that's just in case they get separated from each other we, we know that this piece of evidence belongs to this tag number and belongs to this case number okay um, and did you bring any evidence with you today? I did okay and what did you bring with you today I brought the, the fire cartridge casings that I collected okay Mm. Do you know what is inside of what I'm going to call State's Exhibit 70? Yes, and those are the those are the fire cartridge cases that I collected and the two fire bullet fragments, bullets and bullet fragments. And that's what you see inside. Correct. Today? Yes, ma'am. And do they have your markings on them? They do. Like I said, they got the well. Detect. I had a detective assisting me in this case. This was yes. his name was uh, Detective Eddie Oviedo, and uh, I was doing one thing and he was doing the other. He helped package this evidence. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Me. But could you uh, excuse me? Could you spell the name of the other detective? Detective assisting me. Uh, sorry, his last name is Oviedo. O v i e d o. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. All right. But otherwise, the case number, the, the y'all service number is on this package and the date that it was packaged. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And is that the same for all of the cartridge cases? Yes, ma'am. In here? Yes. All right. If he's in here, Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to offer him the evidence. State's Exhibit Number 70. No objection, Your Honor. State 70 is admitted for all purposes. May publish. All right. And so what we show here. You wrapped each one individually. Correct. Okay. So what we show here are the fire cartridge casings, and you've got eight of them. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And that eight is what you get when you put on your P your worksheet, correct? Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you do anything else with these fire cartridge casings? They were, uh, <coughs> before we uh, packaged them, they were processed for latent prints using black powder. Uh, no latent prints were lifted. It's actually very rare that we get prints. Okay. But uh, an attempt was made. So we package them, we seal them, we initial them, and then we submit them to NIBIN uh, to get uh, compared to any other evidence in the okay. system. Is that common for at least a shell casing or fire cartridge case to be entered into NIBIN? Uh, it's the norm. It's they're all, they're they all are on uh, all handguns on all cases. Any firearm, any fire cartridge cases are collected and entered into Nibin. Okay, and can you explain to the jury why this is important and what Nibin is? Well, Nibin it's a it's a database. Like I said, I'm I'm not an expert, and I'm gonna, probably going to butcher it. I believe it's National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. Some, That's pretty good. And some something like that. And uh, database, they enter the, the head stamp of the fire cartridge casing, which is each one's unique. The firing pin of a, of a gun leaves the impression on the, on the head stamp of the fire cartridge case. Uh, they get in, in, entered into a database, and that database compares fire cartridge casings from, that have been entered from, from everywhere and uh, see if any, any, anything matches. Okay. See if it's connected to anywhere else. To any, any other offenses in Dallas and, and 
Plano and in, in any state actually. You didn't talk to any witnesses in this case? I did not. No, sir. Uh, you showed up after the fact? Yes, sir. Uh, was Miss Faith there at the scene when you showed up? Uh, yes. Did, did you see people talking to her? I, I don't recall. I'm sorry. Was she uh, sitting down on the sidewalk? Was she I, I couldn't tell you. I'm sorry. Uh, but you didn't have any interaction with no, her? No, sir. And uh, you said that you uh, took the case in this and you uh, had them uh, you entered them into the NIPEN database. No, I didn't. I collected them and I submitted them to be entered, but I personally did not do the entering. Okay. And who does that? Uh, the firearms experts and stuff. Okay. So you gave it to them, and they in turn enter it into the database. Correct. <coughs> did you know? What, did you find out what the results of the database no, inquiry was? No. Occasionally, we'll get emails uh, saying, "Hey, you got a match from to a robbery offense, or you got a match to an assault offense," but. I really don't recall. And the firearms experts are the ones that decide how good of a match it is or not. Oh, right? definitely. Yes, sir. Right. Sometimes just because there's a match doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's the same cartridge that was used or gun that was used in something else. Right? I, like I said, I don't know what their what their protocol is or how accurate it is. but. And uh, those experts actually you know, look at the data and they make a subjective uh, determination as to whether it matches Correct. It's the, I, I guess that's what they. It could be a good they, match. It could be a partial match. It could be something that okay, it could be the same or it could not be the same. Right? Like I said, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, and I'm not very familiar with it, so I, I, I think I'm qualified to testify to that. Right. So the sunglasses that you took a picture of, did you collect those also? I did. Right. Did you put them in a bag and submit it to a lab? For I testing? did. Yes, sir. Uh, were they swabbed for DNA? Uh, I packaged them so that in case they needed to be swabbed, they they could be. Oh. But they were uh, they were processed for. Fingerprints and then were lifted. And you don't know whether they were submitted for DNA or not? No, I do not. I passed the witness. Ms. Mitchell? Nothing further, Your Honor. May this witness be finally excused. No objection, Your Honor. No objection. Very good. Sir, you may stand down. Please make sure you don't walk off with any exhibits. I'm not sure you have any up there, but I think we're good. that would be bad. And Ms. Mitchell, call your next witness, please. Um, yes, Your Honor. Uh, State calls Detective uh, Chris Wall. Swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. We respond to questions from Ms. Mitchell first, perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Chris Walton, W A L T O N. And how do you spell Chris? C H R I S. And uh, for whom do you work? Uh, Dallas Police Department. And what is your title? I'm a homicide detective. And how long have you been a homicide detective? Uh, seven years. How long have you been with Dallas Police Department? Nineteen years. Um. All right. uh, detective Walton, can you explain to the jury? Um, just generally, how the homicide detective, how you guys work in teams or the process? Yes, yeah, so we work in teams. Uh, the main objective of the homicide detective or, or other detective is to make sure that we keep the lead detective's mind focused on, on what's at hand. All right. So were you, 
So people get called out, a group gets called out or has a week that they're on call. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. And that is because there's there are a lot of murders in Dallas County, unfortunately. And this allows you to have a team of people that can help you. Yes, that's correct. During that time, uh, we were having a rotational based uh, system where, say, if I get a case, uh, my name goes to the bottom and then it rotates back up to the top. OK. On October 9th of 2020, mm -hmm. were you called in as a homicide detective um, to a death that occurred on, to a murder investigation that occurred on Waverly? Uh, yes, ma'am, I was. All right, and Waverly Drive? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and where is that, in, in Dallas? Uh, so uh, on the, the uh, in Oak Cliff, basically, yes. Okay, in the Oak Cliff area? Yes. Okay, and are you designated as that time as the lead detective? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, you were contacted by whom to go out to the scene? I was contacted by Detective Cheney. Uh, he received notification around about 7.45 that morning. Uh, we were actually working another scene uh, when uh, we received this call. Okay. Um, do you go out by yourself? Do you go out with him? No, we went out with other detectives who were, uh, who were assisting us uh, during that day, who were on call with, with us. All right. And what happens when you first get there? Um, or what do you see? What do you notice? Uh, when I first arrived, I, I observed uh, uh, several uniformed police officers, uh, squad cars. They were securing the scene with yellow crime scene tape. Um, also observed Mrs. Faith being comforted by uh, officers. And then I observed Mr. Faith lying on the ground covered up uh, by uh, Dallas Fire. Okay. Um, do you recall what Jennifer Faith was wearing? Uh, I believe she was wearing a red shirt. Um, black uh, pants or, or uh, sweatpants, something like that. And then how was she acting? Uh, she was very emotional, um, distraught, um, crying. Uh, when I ob observed her, I felt, uh, felt some type of way because she had just witnessed her husband getting killed. Okay. Um, you said you were trying to comfort her. What do you mean by that? What well, officers were trying to comfort her. Also myself, I, was, I introduced her introduced myself to her as the lead detective and that uh, I was going to do I'd be meeting with her uh, and I wanted to actually talk to her a little bit better um, not just at the scene but at the office as well. Okay. Was she receptive to you? Oh uh, yes she was. All right. um, do you ask her any questions at that time? Uh, the thing that I, I, uh, I asked her you know what happened um, there was also um, you know I, I noticed that it was a piece of duct tape that was uh, at the scene uh, and she had told me that she, you know, he tried the, the person who did this, tied her up with a piece of duct tape, tried to take her property. Okay, and where did you notice this duct tape? Uh, was, I believe it was right there in the driveway uh, where this incident, uh, close okay. area where this incident happened. Um, and did anything stand out to you regarding this piece of duct tape? Um, one of the things that, that stood out to me was the size of the duct, the duct tape. Uh, it wasn't a big, a big piece of duct tape. It was a, a small piece of duct tape. So my initial, my first reaction was, how can this small piece of duct tape uh, tie her down? That was my initial reaction. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. I'm going to show you what's previously admitted as State's Exhibit 45. Do you recognize that as the, the pieces of duct tape that were on the driveway? Yes. Okay. Okay, um, after you, what, what do you do next? You're talking to her, you're looking at the scene. Are you looking at her to see if she has any injuries? Uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're doing, but the main thing that I, I want to do is I'm trying to uh, talk to witnesses. There were uh, different uh, bystanders out there. I want to make sure that I got their information. We tried to talk to them to see if they saw or you know, heard anything. We knocked on several doors, but the biggest thing we were trying to do is if there was surveillance video, we knocked on several houses. Some people had video, some didn't. But the biggest thing that we wanted to do was make sure that we get uh, any kind of uh, evidence that can help us in this investigation. Okay. Um, we know we know there was ring video from Jennifer and James' face house. It shows them leaving. That's correct. Correct? That's correct. Um, but the ring video does not show the shooting. No, that's, it doesn't. Okay, because they had gone farther down the street. Yes. Okay. Did you notice anything about the house at 926 Waverly? Um, were there, was there any other video? Uh, there was a, uh, I mean, we went back to the location a few days later. 
uh, there was a, uh, uh, Mrs. Faith had given me access and allowed me to go through to see because there was a camera on the front of the residence, but it wasn't working. So you know, I thought that was odd. This camera that uh, could have caught the offense, it wasn't working. Okay. So before we get into the, uh, the, the, the side, uh, go back down, I just wanted to, to point that out to the jury. So mm -hmm. there was a front camera at her house, but it wasn't working. That's correct. Did she tell you about how long it hadn't been working? Uh, I, don't, I don't recall uh, her giving me a, a, a direct answer on that. Okay. I believe she said she didn't know. Okay. And I'm sorry, I think I took us down the road. I didn't need to go yet. Um, who was there with Jennifer when you were talking to her? Uh, her daughter, uh, her daughter Amber Faith. Uh, she was there. Okay, and how was she? Uh, she was very emotional as well, trying to comfort her mother. Okay. Was anybody else with them? Uh, like I said, uh, uniformed officers were there also trying to uh, comfort her. Okay, all right. Did you guys try to get her away from the body? Uh, the, the biggest thing we wanted to do was uh, and get the, as much information as we could uh, to, from the beginning and get her transported to headquarters where we can talk to her a little bit better. Okay, so before you're going around talking to witnesses and seeing about surveillance, you're, do you have you have her and Amber taken down to headquarters? Yes, ma'am, I do. Okay, and that's where they're going to wait for you so you can speak to them? That's correct. Okay, um, do you come to find out a possible sus suspect vehicle description? Uh, yes, as we were um, canvassing the area, knocking on doors, uh, Detective uh, Kramer, uh, he uh, notified me that we had an individual who possibly had a, uh, took a, a picture of the vehicle as it was driving away. Uh, we went and we interviewed uh, with his, uh, I guess, one of his family members, and we were able to see the actual um, picture of the, the, the truck with the uh, T emblem on it. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. And Detective Walton, these have been blown up. In uh, what's been previously admitted to states 11 and 12, were these the photos on October 9, 2020, that were viewed by several different detectives and responding officers regarding the possible suspect vehicle? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what was distinctive about that vehicle besides right. that you guys could make out the make and model? Right, that was the uh, the T emblem on it. We, we thought initially that was a Texas Ranger sticker. Okay, but you came to find it, come to find out that that is not right. That's correct. What does it turn out to be? Uh, we're Tennessee Volunteers. Okay, University of Tennessee. Yes. <clears throat> okay, and you said you are canvassing the, the neighborhood trying to get, um, are you just staying within that, those houses right there on, on Waverly Place at the time? Uh, during that first initial, yes ma'am, uh, we, were, we were trying to uh, get as much information that we could. Uh, some people had, uh, you know, ring cameras. Some had uh, cameras that didn't work. So we were trying to uh, get all additional information that we could, so that way we can, you know, find, try to find out who, who committed this crime. Okay. So you have possible suspect vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And you're canvassing the neighborhood, and other detectives are as well. Yes. And that's you correct. speak to several neighbors, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, but as far as we know, no one. No one saw it firsthand. No. Okay. When the medical examiner arrives, or the medical examiner investigator arrives, mm -hmm. um, is Jamie Faith uncovered at that time? James Faith uncovered at that time? Yes, he was. Okay. And what do you see? Um, I observed him. There was a, quite a bit, a bit of uh, blood uh, surrounding him. Um, several defects where we believe that, was, that were in his uh, head and also defects in his chest and also one defect in his groin. Okay. And did that appear to you to be gunshot wounds? Yes. Alright. Um, do you know how about how many times he was shot? I later found out that uh, he was shot approximately seven times. He was three in the head, uh, three in the chest, and uh, one in the groin. After you came seeing and you're talking to the officers and the other detectives um, and you see the body, um, do you head, what do you do next? Uh, head back to uh, headquarters because I wanted to uh, get one on one uh, with Mrs. Faith. Were you also trying to get other units I involved in this area of the Oak Cliff area? Uh, the, the very next day, we, we were able to get the uh, homicide response team. We had a, a homicide response team with individuals. They were knocking on doors, pretty much saturating the area to you know find out additional information uh, regarding the crime uh, that was committed. 
That was the next day. That was the very next day. All right. So let's go where you go to headquarters. Yes. When you get to headquarters, um, where are Jennifer and Amber? Uh, when I get there, they're sitting in our conference room. Uh, initially, we had them in one of the uh, recording rooms, but we moved them out because we were taking a little bit longer at the scene. and didn't want them cramped up in the uh, actual room. Um, we uh, brought them back. I brought uh, Mrs. Faith back in the room. Uh, Amber tried to come with her, but I, I told Mrs. Faith I wanted to talk to her one on one. Um, as I began to interview her, she began having a medical uh, episode, or she, uh, I believe she started complaining. I, believe, I don't know if she couldn't breathe or, or what have you, but uh, we ended up calling for an ambulance uh, in which they came up to our, our, our headquarters. Okay. And did the ambulance end up taking her to where? Uh, they took her to Baylor Hospital. Baylor downtown? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do you go, do you follow with them? Yes, I, I met them up there uh, with her. Okay. Amber goes with her to the hospital. Yes, that's correct. Do you get a chance to talk to her in the hospital? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Eventually, does she come back to headquarters or do you? Yeah, so after she was treated, uh, she uh, came uh, back to headquarters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what do you ask for at that time? Uh, well, at headquarters, I uh, was trying to find out a little bit more about what happened. Uh, she told me that they were walking out of the door. But before then, we were actually in the uh, hospital room uh, when I asked her uh, for consent for a cell phone. And when I when I was able to, uh, when I initially asked her and told her that you know I wanted to have a fair investigation across the board to make sure that if her name was able to come up, that we can cross that, that we can check that off the box and uh, and say that we we did it, investigate her as well. Uh, so when I uh, asked for consent for her phone, uh, she had given it to me, but she hesitated at first, then she gave it to me, and that's when we, we uh, went back to headquarters. Okay. Um, were you asking her questions about who could possibly have done this, if she had any idea? Yes. Were you going down that line of investigation? Yes, I was. Okay. Um, and what was she telling you? Uh, she told me that the individual had his face, she had a, had a blue mask, um, said he was medium build. Um, Instead of saying his eyes were brown, she said his eyes uh, seemed to be black. Uh, but that was the uh, pretty much the description that she had given uh, during that time. Okay. That was about the extent of the description that she gave. Yes. Medium build, blue surgical mask, <coughs> black eyes. Yes. Okay. But did, she, did you also ask her, was, was there anyone that she knew of that could possibly have done this to Jamie? Uh, during that time, I, we, I know we got into that a little bit when we got back to headquarters. Oh, gotcha. Uh, okay. May I approach your honor? You may. Okay. Detective, I'm going to show you what's in Barclay State's Exhibit 72. Do you recognize, and can you look through all of it? Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going to show you what's in Barclay State's Exhibit number 72, 73, and 74. Did you do this this paperwork? Yes, ma'am. With Jennifer Faye? Yes, I did. Right. Your Honor, I'd like to offer the evidence state 72 through 74. No objection, Your Honor. 72 through 74 admitted for all purposes. You may publish. All right. And may I first one is your Honor? You may. <coughs> Just so you can tell the jury what is each exhibit? Uh, the first uh, exhibit number 72 is a uh, consent for her cell phone. So she gave me consent. Uh, exhibit number 73 is uh, where we went back to her residence and she was able to uh, uh, give me uh, the victim's computers and things of, of that nature, um, keyboards and uh, other um, um, company laptops. Also, uh, Exhibit number 74 is where she uh, brought me her clothing. Okay. And why did you why did you want this information? Either her phone or the victim's computers, things like that. What were you trying to do? I just wanted to uh, do a thorough investigation to, to, to find out who, who committed this crime. Because at the time, we had nothing but just a, um, a black truck with a uh, T emblem on the back windshield. Did you come to find out that he worked at American Airlines? 
Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Did at this time did Jennifer Faith let you know that anything was going on with American Airlines that may have prompted someone to kill him? Uh, I learned a lot about Jamie uh, that that day. Um, when I I learned that he was an IT director at American Airlines. Um, but I also uh, learned that uh, during the time of COVID, uh, there was a layoff. Um, approximately 18 to 20 individuals were laid off. Uh, but that's the only thing that, that I heard on at that point in time. I learned that Jamie was a, a Green Bay Packer fan. He he was a, a individual who loved playing video games on Thursday nights, uh, and he was just a family man. Loved family, loved outings, loved, loved going to social gatherings with his family. Uh, but the one going through this investigation, trying to find out who would want to hurt him. Uh, that was the thing that we started talking about, okay? If there was anybody, who would you uh, say uh, that wanted to hurt Jamie? Uh, he laid off 18, 20 people. And also one of, uh, I believe, Amber's uh, biological father came into play. And his name had came up in this investigation as well. Okay, um, just parse this out just a little bit. Um, as far as Amber and the bio dad, she, he has not been part of her life almost her entire life. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and then as far as American Airlines, did you actually go to American Airlines and talk to the people there? Yes, yes, ma'am. I, I did. I, I went to uh, meet with the director uh, at American Airlines, and uh, when I met with them, they pretty much gave me a little bit of history about Jamie. Okay. Was he well liked at his job? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, do you pretty much at that point decide that there's just nothing to go on as far as any employees doing this to him that were irritated at getting laid off? Well, at the time, I, I, I still didn't know. Okay. I still didn't know, and uh, there was a. There was, I did. We, we believe. I believe that uh, I did a. I did a subpoena, and they were able to get me those uh, those names uh, during that time. Okay. What about um, at at this time? Are you also now we've moved past October 9th, and mm -hmm. we're starting to move into 10, 11, and 12 of uh -huh. October of 2020. Correct. Yes. Okay. Are you reaching out to Jennifer Faith? Daily or every couple of days? What's going on with the investigation? Well, I was, checking, I was going by there because you know, the way I work my investigations, uh, the first few days I, I stay out in the field because I'm trying to gather, uh, you know, information that, uh, you know, without, you know, the lights, camera action out there. Okay. Uh, so um, I was going by there. I had uh, police officers checking on her. Um, you know, the extra patrol was was done out there. I was going on out there, uh, constantly t uh, uh, talking to her, praying with her. Uh, and just trying to make sure she was okay. Okay. Um, is it around this time too? Do you, um, do you meet with Jennifer and Jamie Faith's parents at her at her home? Uh, yes, I did. A few days later, um, they had flew into town, uh, and Jennifer was sitting on the couch. I was uh, right there, and her parents were also on the other couch with her sister as well. Um, and those were the individuals that gave me additional information about you know him. Uh, loving the Green Bay Packers and just the type of person that he was, uh, not having any enemies. Okay. He was originally from Wisconsin, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So they gave you no information or any indication that anyone had anything out for Jamie Faith, correct? No. Okay. Um, do you also do anything with the media? Uh, yes. Um, during that time, I put out a, a bulletin, public bulletin. <laughs> Uh, the pu public bulletin went out uh, so that we can try to get uh, some answers. Uh, then we did a TV interview with uh, Fox 4 News Trackdown, uh, where the information was actually put out there, and uh, the video collection that we did was also uh, put out there to the media. Okay, so uh, let's back up and talk about, first of all, you did a bulletin. Mm -hmm. Did you put anything in the bulletin about the truck or anything that was specific? Yes, I did. I, I um, put the, the photo that we had received of the truck and I asked the public for any assistance they would uh, give me uh, regarding if anybody knew who that truck belonged to or anything, um, and specifically focusing on that T uh, sticker on the back of the windshield. And you guys were going pretty deep into this, right? I think you and I spoke. Did you contact Austin, for instance? Uh, yes, I did. I, I did uh, uh, call down there to see if there were, uh, and, and this, is, this is what I learned, too, about the uh, Nissan Titan truck. I learned that you know from I believe I believe 2004 to 2007 the same model. Then also from 2008 to 2015 it's the same model. So you know I learned a little bit about the Nissan Titan truck. So when when I uh, asked them to if they had <coughs> vehicles um, that you know possibly match, you know we, we were able to try to find uh, different vehicles in the area. 
but uh, we, we were uh, unsuccessful in locating any vehicles with a T emblem or uh, matching the description of the truck. Okay. Um, going parallel at this time mm -hmm. is the phone from Jennifer Faith is being extracted yes. by a team of people that work at DPD. Would that be correct? Yes, I'm fusing you. Okay. And she gave you the information in order to get into the phone and get it ex the, the, the cell phone extracted, correct? That's correct. Okay. But that's taking a little time. You have other detectives looking at it to see if they can find anything in it, correct? Yes, I uh, gave him the phone to take gross. Uh, okay. Uh, while I was out in the field, I asked him if he could look through it uh, and find anything in it while, uh, you know, while I'm out in the field trying to uh, collect video. Um, do you get the cell phone, do you recall? Because I know a lot was going on at the time. Do you recall if you got the cell phone extraction back um, before or after you go and get the track down video surveillance? Uh, the extraction was done that same day when I, uh, I took uh, uh, Mrs. Faith's phone from her because I had to, get, had to give it back to her. So that uh, extraction was done that day uh, that I met with her. Okay. May I so, witness, Your Honor? You may. Detective, I'm going to show you what I'm going to State's Exhibit 75. Do you recognize this? Uh, yes. I have shown this to you. Yes. And have you looked on it? Yes, I okay. have. Okay. And is this a USB or flash drive of the cell phone extraction from Jennifer Face Bob? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And you looked at this yesterday, is that correct? Yes, I did. All right. Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence the flash drive, State's Exhibit 75, which contains the contents of the cell extraction for record purposes only. No, Judge. It's admitted for record purposes only at this point. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Make sure that that's in a separate place for the court reporter so she can keep track. Thank you. Um, okay, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But let's talk about the, the what you call the track down video. Yes. And, and please tell the jury how you, how you and some others, mostly you, I think, or all you, um, were able to pull this together. Uh, we were able to, uh, like I said, like I mentioned before, we knocked on several doors. Um, some people had video, some didn't. But we, uh, as one video, we got one video from one house. We, you know, the next video from another house. We were able to try to put the pieces, the pieces of the puzzle together, and we we're able to track uh, the vehicle approximately uh, uh, close to three miles down the road uh, from uh, where the office had. Uh, so you occurred. were going to homes, businesses, apartments, etc. Yes, it was. And looking for video. Video. Looking for cameras. Looking for video. And were most people uh, allowing you to, to view the video? Yes. Uh, uh, the individuals that we actually spoke with, they were pretty cooperative. Um, some, like I, said, like I mentioned before, some cameras worked, uh, some didn't. Uh, but those cameras that were uh, operable, we were able to uh, get those videos uh, from those individuals. Okay, and I think you described it as kind of putting a puzzle together, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And can you explain to the jury what you mean by that? Um, so, uh, basically, if we get one video from one house uh, and we, we have another from another house, the time frames, so say this, off this offense occurred approximately about 7.33, 7.34 in that range. So, the first video, we get the, the time frame 7.33, 7.34, the next house, a few blocks, a few, a few houses down the road, they may have the vehicle pulling into their their camera approximately about 735, you know, or something like that. That's what I mean by putting the pieces of the puzzle together, and that's what we did. Okay. May I press witness, Your Honor? You may. Can you give me just a second, Your Honor? I apologize. Sure. Why don't y'all stand up and stretch your legs real quick, members of the jury. Ms. Simmons, how you doing? Fine, yes. Okay. We'll go about another 20 minutes or so before we take our lunch break. You may. Detective Walton, I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 76 and 77. Do you recognize the person in these photos? 
Yes, I do. And when were these photos taken? Uh, October 9th. October 9th, okay. Yes. And this is when Jennifer Faith was brought to headquarters along with her daughter, Amber Faith, correct? That's correct. All right. Your Honor, I'd like to offer the evidence it states exhibits 76 and 77 for all purposes. No objection. They're admitted. You may publish. All right. States Exhibit 76, can you tell the jury what we're looking at? Uh, this is Mrs. Uh, Faith uh, after the office, after she had uh, come back from the hospital. Um, okay. I wanted to make sure that we took photos of her, just trying to photograph any kind of injuries that she had. Okay. Um, and it, this is common to take a photo of your witnesses and then to check them for any injuries, is yes, that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then States Exhibit number 77. Yes, ma'am. Same thing, just a photo close up of her face. That's, that's correct. Did you, do you recall when you, I know she went to Baylor for an unrelated, um, but when you were looking at her, did you see any overt injuries on her? Uh, not any overt uh, injuries on her. Okay, what did you see, if you can recall? Uh, I believe there were um, light uh, marks on her, um, and you know, I didn't see anything that just stood out. Uh, as far as like any um, injuries. Okay, so some and scrapes and bumps? Yes. Okay. All right, Amber, so what is your honor? You may. Now I'm gonna show you, I'm going out of order, and I apologize, I'm gonna show you States Exhibit number 82. Okay. All right. You and I have looked at this, yes, correct? Yes. What do you call what it is? Uh, that's the track down video from when we did the uh, TV interview. Okay, this is the video that you put together uh, yes, from all the surveillance. Yes, one of the uh, media relations uh, individuals put that video actually together, but this one, I, I got it from, from it. Okay, Yeah. and this is what you, the surveillance that you had pulled, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, at this time I'd like to offer the evidence states exhibit for 82. Okay. 82 is admitted. You may publish. Thank you. All right, Your Honor. Here we go. Several different streets, correct? Uh, yes, it's correct. And what what do you see there? Uh, that is the uh, suspect vehicle, uh, the black truck, Nissan Titan, okay. with the uh, T emblem. Do you have any idea where this is? Yeah, what street is this coming down? Yes, it's uh, headed um, eastbound on uh, West Clarendon. Uh, it's approaching the uh, stoplight at, at Edgefield. Okay, and Clarendon is fairly close to Waverly, correct? Yeah, it connects to uh, Waverly. Matter of fact, he turned uh, from uh, on, uh, onto Clarendon from Waverly. Okay. All right, and this is this this is the same, just a different viewpoint. But yes. this is Clarendon still. Yes, and still the same. As, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. He is approaching the light that you were speaking of? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, and you can see here, again, I know it's kind of hard to see, but there's the T sticker in the back window of the black truck, correct? That's correct. Top of the screen, we see 
where the circle is, the black truck going by, correct? That's correct. And can you tell the jury what's the time stamp on this one? Uh, time stamp is 737. And the murder, uh, the call in, do you recall? I believe it was, it was about what time? I believe 735. Yeah. 735. I believe so, yes, ma'am. Okay. And this time stamp is showing him driving at 737 a.m. That's correct. And what street are we on? Do you have any idea? Still Clarity. This, I just, this is still Clarity? Yes, right? yes, ma'am. This is a, right now it's around Clarity and, and Adams Street. Are we still on Clarity? Still on Clarity. Uh, now he's approaching uh, Zane. I'm sorry, he's approaching what? Zane Boulevard. Is that the cross street right there? Uh, yes, ma'am. Turns uh, southbound on Zane. Right here, he's approaching Zane in Illinois. Zane in Illinois in the Oak Cliff area. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell the jury what the timestamp is on this one? Uh, timestamp on this is 748. Do you know what he does at Zane, <coughs> Illinois? Does he go straight? Uh, no, he turns uh, east, hit it, east on West Illinois. Detective? Yes, he's getting ready to do uh, turn northbound on, on I-35 from uh, Illinois. So Illinois, Illinois connects to I-35. Uh, yes, right. It's right there at the. Uh, he's getting ready to make a left, heading northbound. Yeah. And the entrance ramp to I-35 is right there. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. On the previous picture. Okay. Thank you, Your comes to you with some information that he's found on the phone. Is that correct? Yes, he, he okay. actually called me. Um, gross? Gross? Detective Gross. Could you spell that for her, please? Yes. Could you spell Detective Gross's name for the record? Yes. Uh, G-R-O-S-S. -S. Thank you. Yes. Detective Gross is in homicide with you. Yes, that's correct. Right? Yes. Um, and you had asked him to go ahead and, and look at the cell extraction that you had done. That's correct. While you're doing all this other stuff. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And does he finally come to you with some information about what he's found on the phone? Uh, yes, he does. Okay. Um, does he find something on Jennifer Faith's phone that he thinks you would, you might find interesting? Yes, he did. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? May. Yeah. I'm going to show you what's marked a state's exhibit 79. Mm -hmm. The cell phone extraction has been previously admitted into evidence. These are... Will you read over this and see if you recognize it? Extractions from what Detective Gross thought you might find interesting. Yes. Yes, ma'am. And you had gone through these texts as well. In fact, you and I had talked about them, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer the evidence states Exhibit 79. It is just the excerpts. Oh, I'm sorry. You have an objection? Oh, no objection, Your Honor. I'm sorry. <laughs> 79 admitted for all purposes. I blame Mr. Duke for that. That's better. <laughs> Alright, 
use your screen, Detective Walton. Okay. All right. And what we're looking at here is from an extraction report, Celebrite reports, correct? Yes. Okay. And Celebrite is the software that is used. Um, well, Celebrite is the software that creates a report that breaks up the different things in a phone, like chats and emails, contacts, things of that nature, correct? That's correct. Okay. So what we're looking at here is a Celebrite report of the phone extraction from Jennifer Faith, a portion of it. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Now, these texts go on and on and on. So some have been omitted for time's sake, correct? Yes. Okay. Can you go ahead and read, Detective Walton, <coughs> the very first text bubble in States Exhibit 79? Yeah. So this text message is uh, to a friend named Tina Spring. I said, so I have no idea when I'm going to be able to talk to you over the phone, but I am pretty much having a full-blown emotional affair. All right, and can you list the date? Uh, it's April 20th of 2020. Of 2020 and the time? Uh, time is uh, 2.51 p.m. All right, and can you keep going? Second one states, and Jamie knows about it, and that's uh, dated 4-20-2020 at approximately 2.52 Pia. Uh, the third one, this guy dated in high school and college. We broke up because I was finishing school and after he got out of basic training, he was deployed to South Korea. That was uh, dated 4-20-2020, 253. Okay, and I guess we should have started with this, Detective Walton, and I apologize. These texts are from Jennifer Faith, correct? Yes. And who were they to? Uh, her friend, uh, Tina Spring. Okay, and who was Tina Spring? A uh, good friend, a close friend of hers. Okay, and where does Tina Spring live? Uh, Arizona. All right. And did she know Tina Spring? Did you come to find out that she knew Tina Spring or <coughs> she lived in Arizona? Yes, they used to work together. They used to work together? Yeah, Jennifer, uh, Mrs. Faith, was actually Tina's uh, supervisor. Okay. And at some point during the investigation, after you get these texts, do you go out to Arizona and actually speak to Tina Spring? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Okay. And does Tina Spring confirm that, yes, she did get these texts from Jennifer Faith? Yes. Okay, so what we're reading, the green bubbles, is everything is Jennifer Faith so far, correct? Yes. So the guy she dated back in high school and college. That's correct. Right. Okay, can you read the next one? The next one states, uh, he ended up going to Special Forces and served 26 years. Uh, that's uh, April the 20th, 2020 at 2.53 as well, p.m. All right, and the next one? I uh, just retired and found me. Uh, 420 2020 at 2.53 p.m. The next one. Okay. Uh, the next one said we were going to get married at the time. And that's also on 420. All right. So said, read the next four. Okay. So then I met Amber's uh, bio dad. Uh, that's 420 2020. Right after he left. Uh, it's been crazy, and I know I am so stupid for doing this. And I know you're at work, and I'm probably blowing your mind right now. Laugh out loud. Okay, and then we have a response from Tina, is that correct? Yes. Okay, can you read that for the jury? Uh, Tina responds, no, it's, it's totally okay. And that's 420, uh, 2020 at approximately 3.17 p.m. Said Jamie knows. Uh, how does he feel? And Jennifer's response? Scared and sad is what he said. Tina, we haven't had sex in four years. And then Tina's response. Why? Okay. Can you continue reading? Yes. This uh, is from Jennifer. Yes. So I told him I feel like we love each other, but we are not in love with each other. They say, I don't know. I constantly try to initiate. <coughs> Tina responds, I give you credit for being up front. Okay, and continue with Tina. Okay. Where does the other guy live? Jennifer's response. 
Tennessee. He originally from, he's originally from Tucson. His mom and siblings are still there. And response from Gina. He was stationed out of Tennessee and bought a house there with 20 acres. So he's there now. And Tina responds, oh wow. How often do you talk? This is still on 420, correct? Yes, correct. And her response? All day, every day. That's 420, 2020, 3.38 p.m. Uh, text mostly, calls at least once a day. Okay. He's in the middle, left, Darren. Presumably they're talking about a photo. That's correct. All right. Uh, Tina responds, OMG, you look so cute. He's cute too. Okay, so in this, what Rose finds is that she's having an emotional affair. Correct. And that his name is Darren, and that he lives in Tennessee. That's correct. Okay, what do you guys do with this information? Uh, we started doing more, more research, checking our databases, and uh, also too, I believe that we found uh, some information. Well, before you get there, what do you do in the phone? Do you find anyone named Darren in her contact list? Right. Okay, that's, and what is his name? Darren Lopez. All right, mm -hmm. and what is the information given in that contact of Darren his, Lopez? His telephone number, and I believe his, um, his, one of his emails. And his ad emails? Ad yes, and also his address. Okay, and where does his address state he resided? Uh, I believe uh, in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Uh, okay. I believe it was uh, Sweetwater, Sweet Home uh, is the street. Okay, so the same information generally that you're getting from this text from Jennifer to Tina, you're finding matches this contact for a man named Darren Lopez. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. All right. And what do you do with this information? Uh, we begin checking databases, and uh, then we, um, once we learned his address, uh, we uh, contacted one of the local agencies to drive by there. Uh, once they uh, arrived on the street. Slow down just a little bit so they understand what you're doing. So he's in Tennessee, as yes. far as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're asking what local agency to drop, do a drop-by? Uh, I believe the uh, local agency there, I, I can't re remember the exact name of the agency, but we contacted them. Um, the and local police agency or local yes. sheriff's office? Yes, yes, ma'am. And uh, they did a drive-by where they could not uh, see the house because it was uh, far from the road. Uh, it's on 20 acres. Okay, so it's true he did have 20 acres or such? Yes. Okay, and they couldn't see anything from the road? No. Um, tell me, before we even get there, also what did you find from your checking all the LEA databases, the law enforcement agency databases, what do you find that also connects Darren Lopez to your case here in Dallas? Uh, could you, do you find that he, There's a particular car that's registered to him. Oh, yes, uh, the uh, Nissan Titan truck. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you come across that after you get the information about Darren Lopez and his contact information? Yeah, we learned that he had a, a Nissan uh, truck, Titan truck. Okay. And what was registered to him and where it was registered to him also matched the address in Tennessee, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So after you can't get anyone, and this is around mid-October, would that be correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. After you do not have any success in seeing where his truck is, what do you do next? Uh, or if his truck is there or if he's there? Detective Barnes, I believe he contacted uh, some of his contacts on the federal side that was down there on the ATF, and uh, they were able to do a flyover of uh, his residence. Okay, all right. Um, and we'll be talking to De Detective Barnes later. Mm -hmm. um, and here's where, do you, can you explain to the jury, here at this point, you and Barnes start working together yes. pretty closely. Can you tell the jury why? Uh, Detective Barnes, um, Dealing with the state side, uh, he's also he's a homicide detective as well, but he also is ATL. So the access that he has uh, on the federal side uh, was was great for this investigation uh, because we we found out that the uh, potential suspect lived out of state. Okay, and so he's contacting the feds, and and, and which agency is he is he contacting? Uh, ATF. At the ATF. Okay. And we will talk to him later, but during, your, during the course of the investigation, 
you come to find out that Barnes is able to get them to do a flyover, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and what do you get from this flyover? Uh, we, uh, we receive photos of the actual property uh, and the truck with the T emblem. Okay, so that's confirmation that this particular truck is at this house that matches Darren Lopez's name mm -hmm. and Darren Lopez's address. That's correct. Okay. Why don't you mark your spot? We're going to take our lunch break right now. I'm going to go to the jury. It's 5 till noon. I'm going to give you some instructions. They're not different than what I've told you before. Please don't do any independent research on this case. Please don't discuss the case even among yourselves. And please be back in the jury room at 1245, ready to come back in to continue this trial. Thank you very much. All rise for the jurors. Sheriff, you'll only be seated. Courts in recess.
Wait, you need me to sign something? Thank you, Sheriff. Y'all may be seated. Sir, I'll remind you as you take your seat, you're still under the oath that I gave to you previously. Whenever you get situated, uh, and Miss Mitchell, whenever you're ready, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> uh, Detective Walton, you're the same detective that was testifying prior to lunch, correct? Yes, this is correct. All right, and you and I, had, I think we left off um, where you were talking about the, the ATF that had done a flyover of the home in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Yes. That's okay. Correct. And that there was a truck that was matching uh, with the same sticker matching the truck in Texas on the date of October 9th of 2020, correct? That's correct. All right. And the same address that was in the phone of Jennifer Fates <coughs> phone here in Dallas, Texas, correct? That's correct. All right. With this information, I know there's a lot going on. Um, you have various search warrants going out. You're talking to people, correct? That's correct. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. You can have permission to approach the remainder of the trial, okay? Both okay. sides can. Go ahead. I'm going to show you what's in Mark the State's exhibit. Eighty-three in State's Exhibit eighty-four. I want you can take a look at these. There's an affidavit for a search warrant. Okay, um and that search warrant is for uh, cell phone records for Darren Lopez. Okay, and that was for the Blue Verizon, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and the dates of the search warrant for the Verizon records, can you? Uh, yes. I believe it was 10 1 to 10 30, but if you could double check. Yes, 10 1 2020, 12 a.m. Uh, through 10 30, 2020, 11 59 p.m. Okay, and can you go ahead and list the phone number for Darren Lopez that's listed on that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, 615-630-3046. All right. Thank you very much. And can you just take a look at States Exhibit 84? Do you recognize that? Um, it's the business records from Verizon. Okay. Yes. Yes, I do. Okay. And when you get Verizon, um, when you do a search warrant for Verizon call records, what do you get back? Of the business records. The business yeah. records? Yes. Mm -hmm. The call detail records? Is yes. that what that is? Uh -huh. Okay. Call, commonly called a CDR? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer the evidence states Exhibit 83 and 84 for record purposes. We have no objection. 83 and 84 admitted for record purposes only. search warrant for these Verizon records for somebody, it should, all you have at this time is a cell phone number, correct? That's correct. That number that you've already read in. Yes, that's correct. And the records that you get back, and again, we'll have an analyst to come and talk about this, but the records that you get back from Verizon are called detail records normally, but just based off the phone number, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what was the purpose in doing the search warrant from the time of 10-1 to 10-30 based off the number that you had received from Jennifer Lope Bates' phone? Uh, we were trying to place him at the scene in Dallas. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can get location data. <coughs> yes, you can. On the phone, sometimes you can't. That's correct. Okay. Were you also trying to see a le any communication between the two during this time? Yes, I was. Okay. And were you also trying to see a level of communication between the two of these during this time? Yes. Uh -huh. And you eventually do get these records back, and the analyst was Jeff Jessica Mast who did it. Is that correct? That's correct. And again, she's going to testify, but these records, just based off your memory, they show communication between Jennifer and Darren during the month of October. Yes, I do. Okay. Do you recall? Was do you recall anything interesting about that time period, particularly around the time of the murder? Uh, I'm sorry, the death of James Faye. Um, I remember there being a, a lot of communication uh, during that time, that time frame. Mm -hmm. And then right around October 8th and October 9th, is there anything that changes? Uh, yes, I think the hours, uh, approximately 28, 29 hours, of, uh, 
the communication changing. Okay. Make sure you speak up, Detective Walker. Gotcha. Okay. So there comes a time where there's almost no communication between Jennifer Faith and Darren Lopez. That's correct. Okay. And these are the dates that are at the time of Jamie Faith's death, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right. At the same time that you were doing the search warrants for the call detail records from Verizon, you were also speaking with J Jennifer Faith, correct? Yes. Okay. And at one point, I believe on October 12th, you and Eric Barnes, Detective Eric Barnes, go back to Jennifer Faith's house. Yes, we do. Can you tell the jury the reason to go back on that particular day? Uh, we were trying to uh, see if there was any additional information that we could uh, receive uh, for the investigation. Uh, and then also, to to check her uh, her camera. She said she had reading cameras. We also we were able to get one set. And uh, we're trying to find out why the front cameras one were, were not working. So that's why we went back. Okay. And when you go to her house with Detective Barnes, does she give you access to her ring camera? Uh, yes, she does. Okay. And what do you and Barnes do? Are you sitting at her computer looking through everything? Yes. Um, sitting at her computer. She's right there uh, with me. And also Detective Barnes. Uh, I come. I came across. Uh, there was one. There was a side camera. I came across uh, uh, an individual walking uh, next to the vacant house, and I asked her. It was approximately 2:38 in the morning, and I asked her who that was, and uh, she told me she didn't know. Uh, she later uh, informed me that that was. She talked to some neighbors, and uh, the neighbor said that there was a, an individual who gets into it with his wife, and he gets drunk, and then he he does stuff like that. Back up just a little bit on that one. Let me show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 81. And you and I have looked at this regarding the side motion ring video. Okay. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you have reviewed this. Yes, I have. All right. Is it what was sent to you by Jennifer Faith on or about October 12th from her ring camera? Yes, it was. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence State's Exhibit 81 from the ring camera side motion from the Faith House. No objection. It's admitted. Make published. Thank you. Okay, Detective Walton, let's just back up. Before we get into the excuse she made, she has not given you any information about a suspect at this point, but she can definitively tell you. Is that correct? Uh, just the blue mask with the uh, you know, medium built guy, black eyes, okay, what she said. that's good. So all she's given you so far, and, and she's kind of stuck to that story. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, correct. All right. And so when you and Barnes are looking at this ring video, um, she's there with you is that correct that's correct okay so she sees you see what you're seeing yes okay now the action is just just so everyone's aware the action is very early in the video, right? So you have to kind of pay attention right from the beginning, correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And what do we see? It's an individual uh, wearing a blue mask, black shirt, and a, and a ball cap. Okay. Uh, walking around the uh, vacant house next to uh, Mr. Face House. All right, and let's just go back one more time because it does. I'm going to pause it. And you have come to find out after this, Detective Walton, that the Blue House is a vacant house next door. Yes. Where Jamie Faith ends up dying in front of that next that morning. Yes. And the house next door, this great house, is 926 Waverly. Yes. Where Jamie Faith and Jennifer Faith reside, correct? That's correct. All right. And can you also notice when I turn this back on the timestamp at the bottom? Uh, yes, 2.38 a.m. On 10-9 of 2020? That's correct. Okay. Now, the rest of this video does not, I, I, I believe we've watched it, it does not show any human form coming back around again. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's correct. Oh, no, I'm sorry, here it is.
And at the time, you ask her, since this is an important date, correct, 10-9 at 2.30 a.m., you asked Jennifer Faith who that person is. Uh, yes, I did. And her answer is, uh, she said, at the time, at the day. At the date, she said that she didn't know who that was. Okay. And then the next day, what does Jennifer Faith do? Uh, she called me and said that I, I know who that is. My neighbors uh, had told me that that's one of the our other neighbors who gets into it with his wife when he gets drunk, and then he does stuff like that. He walks around like that. Okay. Do you continue to have contact with Jennifer Faith during this time? Yes, I do. And let's make it clear. Darren Lopez ended up being arrested on January 11th of 2021, correct? Yes, he did. Okay. So during this investigation, this spans that went from October 9th all the way to January 11th until his arrest, correct? Yes. All right. So during this time in October and November and December, you and Barnes and some of the ATF people over in Tennessee are doing surveillance, would that be correct? Uh, yes. Do you know what type of surveillance the ATF was doing in Tennessee? Uh, there was a video camera uh, that was placed, uh, built out of a tree, um, and they placed a video camera where they built it inside of the tree to catch the actual vehicle leaving the residence, and we were able to catch the, the vehicle with the same T emblem uh, leaving the residence from that location. Okay, and again, Detective Barnes was the one who was working with the ATF on that, and so he'll be able to testify and elaborate to that later. Yes, he will. Um, various search warrants are going out, especially these CDR records, and then eventually do you get Google records? Yes, we do. And what was the point of the Google records? Uh, to try to place him in, uh, in Dallas. Okay. You and Barnes do two Google records on Darren Lopez's Google account, Gmail account, correct? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. One December 18th and one December 23rd, is that correct? Uh, those are both by, I believe, Detective Barnes on that one. Okay. I'm going to show you what's in Marcus State's number 85 and 86. And these are, this is a search warrant going to whom? At Google. Okay, and the date of the search warrant? Uh, December 18th. December 18th, yeah. okay. okay. And this was for Darren Lopez's records, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, and then State's Exhibit number 86 would be the letter that you received from Google, is that correct? Yeah, Detective Barnes received this letter, yes. Okay, and then what is stapled are the returns that you get back from Google. Yes. Right, okay. State's number 87. Is a search warrant to whom? Uh, Google. Okay, and for Darren Lopez's records again? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, and that search warrant is dated? Uh, December t uh, 23rd. Uh, also, Detective Barnes. Okay. And then again, State's Exhibit number 88, the letter that is returned from Google referencing yes. the December 23rd records and the returns on the CD. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence State's Exhibit 85, 86, 87, and 88 for record purposes only. We have seen these, Your Honor, and there's no objection. They're admitted for record purposes only. Does uh, Detective Barnes get these Google returns before you do? Uh, yes, he did. Okay. And does he contact you? Uh, yes, he, he told me to check my email. Okay. Does he contact you fairly early in the morning? Uh, yes, he does. Okay. Because what had he done when he saw these returns? Uh, he contacted me okay. and... Uh, verify the information. Okay, and the information just generally showed what? Uh, Mr. Lopez uh, in Dallas. That he was actually in the area? Yes, during that time. The, at the time of Jamie Faith's death? Yes, that's correct. Okay. At this time, do you and Barnes and DPD decide to do an arrest warrant for Darren Lopez? Uh, yes, I uh, <coughs> obtained a, uh, an arrest warrant for, for Darren uh, and 
on the ATF side, the federal side, state lines we were working on uh, for the search warrant uh, for his residence. So the arrest and the search warrant together at the same time. Okay, all right. And it is January 11th is when um, a group goes out. Who, who is the group from DPD that goes out to Tennessee to uh, work with the ATF to potentially effectuate an arrest? Uh, so the group, we had uh, members of our squad. Uh, we had uh, Detective Gross, uh, Detective Barnes, and also uh, Sergeant Sagala. Uh, went down uh, to Tennessee the, fir the first day, first few days. Okay. You didn't. You stayed here. Uh, yeah, the first day, yes, yes, yes. ma'am. Okay. And they were, and again, Detective Barnes will testify, but were they able to arrest Darren Lopez on January 11th? Yes, they were. Okay. And what were you doing back here in Dallas? Um, goal was to bring in Mrs. Faith in for another interview. So the goal was to bring them at the same time, so that way the communication line wouldn't be there. So once we had her in the office with me, uh, her cell phone was out of the room, and Mr. Uh, Lopez was getting uh, taken into custody, and then that's when I went into another interview with her. Okay, all right. Um, but you brought her in to, to stop any communication between the two of them around the time that um, they're trying to effectuate an arrest on him in Tennessee, is that correct? That's correct. I, I didn't want her to let him know. Okay. And he, in fact, was arrested on January 11th of, of 2021. Yes, that's correct. All right, and then the next day you fly out there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what do you do when you get out to Tennessee? Uh, we uh, got with uh, Detective Barnes and the other detectives that were out there, and also spoke to, uh, with uh, one of the uh, daughters of uh, Mr. Lopez. thing regarding those texts um, that you and I looked at before and, and showed the jury regarding Tina Spring. This is State's Exhibit 78. Um, and then we have shown you this is the entire text stream that Selbright put groups together between Tina Spring and Jennifer Faith. And you were able to review this. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, correct. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence State's 78, which is the group between Tina Spring and Jennifer Faith for record purposes. No objection to record purposes, Your Honor. 78's admitted, uh, admitted for record purposes only. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I will pass the witness. Cross examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Detective. Good morning. How are you doing? We've actually met a few times, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Got to yes. know each other kind of well. Yes, sir. Uh, so you were the lead investigator on this case. Yes, sir, I was. And as the lead investigator, it's your job to coordinate with everybody else doing something on the case. For example, for you to coordinate with the, uh, Detective Barnes, you coordinate with uh, Detective Gonzalez, who collected the evidence. Yes, sir. Uh, you coordinate with, uh, with experts uh, that help you with phone dumps, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you, you're the one, are you the one that decides also what evidence gets to be tested or not tested? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so you're, you're the lead person on this case. Yes, I am. And that's why you have that big folder here in front of you here today, right? Yes, that's correct. I mean, everything uh, that was done on this case should be in that folder, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So as part of your, so you have the complete knowledge of what went on on this case and what they mm -hmm. involved. Yes, sir. Right. So uh, when you, you were able to determine through your investigation, uh, that Darren Lopez and Jennifer Faith had begun talking and having an emotional affair, correct? Yes. Uh, you were able to determine that uh, they never actually met in person until the day of the uh, of, of Jamie's uh, death. Is that correct? That's correct. That's the first time you ever laid eyes on her since they were dating back in high school, correct? That's correct. And you were able to learn things about Mr. Lopez, right? Yes, it was. You were able to learn that uh, as the emails talk, as the text messages between Tina and Jennifer indicate, that uh, he had been in Iraq uh, and Korea and different deployments as part of the special forces. That's correct. Uh, you were able to learn that uh, Mr. Lopez uh, was a decorated war hero, correct? Yes, it was, yes. You were able to learn that uh, he, was, uh, he received a Purple Heart as part of his uh, uh, deployment 
and that Purple Heart related to the fact that he had been blown up uh, or close to an explosion that caused him to get that Purple Heart. Isn't that true? That's correct. Uh, you were able to learn that he uh, had been uh, serving badly as a medic with the Special Forces the whole time he was there and put himself in danger many times, correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. For the service of this country, correct? Yes. And you were able to learn that he had suffered a, uh, and been treated for traumatic brain, brain injury in the military, correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, you were able to learn that also he had, uh, he was uh, determined to be, determined to have PTSD as part of his, uh, as part of his, uh, uh, as a result of his injuries and his service. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and you were able to learn this through documentation, correct? Yes. You were able to learn this through talking with different uh, witnesses? Um, other uh, um, officers as well. Uh, and officers as well. Yeah. Uh, and you were able to look at uh, military records that in uh, indicated that that was true? Yes. Uh, it wasn't something that was made up? No, sir. Uh, so you learned all these things, and then you learned through your investigation that uh, Jennifer and, and uh, Darren had reconnected and were having this affair, right? Yes. Sir. And you were able to look at emails. You were able to look at text messages mm -hmm. that indicated uh, to Darren that she uh, was telling him that she was being abused by her husband. Isn't that true? That's correct. You were able to learn through your investigation and look at emails and text messages and talking to witnesses uh, that uh, that Jennifer created a fake email account that purported to be Jamie Faith. It is correct. You were able to also learn that uh, Darren Lopez started to receive text messages from Jennifer's phone that were from Jamie, is that correct? Or purported to be from Jamie? Uh, emails, yes. And were you able to find out if they, she, he received text messages from her phone indicating that it was Jamie? Uh, I believe so, yes sir. Okay. As a matter of fact, you were able to learn that a code was used uh, between them so Darren would know if he was really talking to Darren or if he was really talking to Jennifer. Yes, sir. It was like, I think a 575, does that sound familiar? Uh, I thought it was 381 or something like that, I believe. If it was 571, yeah. it was some type of code, right? Yes, sir. That meant something between them, so she could, she could, he could know whether it was Jamie texting her or if it was uh, her texting. Because it was just text messages he wanted to make sure. It was all coming from her phone, right? Uh, I, believe, I believe so. I just have to look, look at it uh, okay. just to, to verify that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, it doesn't sound true to you. Uh, no, it doesn't. <clears throat> so as the lead investigator, you talked to uh, Jennifer. Uh, you even, uh, you were trying to console her. Uh, and was that done at the police department or out there at the scene? Both. Both? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, when uh, you were back at the uh, police department, you even prayed with her, right? Uh, at her residence. At her residence, I think. Yes. When Detective Barnes prayed with her to try to comfort her, for at the time you believed that she didn't know what was going on. I, I did. Uh, Detective Barnes wasn't, wasn't there at that time. And at that point, you, you believed that she didn't know anything, right? Uh, at that time, yes, sir. Because otherwise you wouldn't have been praying with her. Well, uh, If you I thought she was involved somehow. I pray for everybody. Thank you for doing that. I, need, I might need some prayer soon. Uh, but um, through looking at emails that were uh, obtained through the search warrants that you testified here today, you were able to <coughs> determine that. Jennifer had uh, created these fake, fake email accounts in order to convince Darren that she was being abused sexually and physically by her husband. That was my initial thought, yes sir. Okay. Uh, eventually through, these, uh, through this, your investigation you were able to figure out that uh, the emails coming from Rob Schmidt were really coming from Jamie, I mean from Jennifer Faith, correct? That's correct. It was a fake email account. Yes sir. Uh, Rob Schmidt had nothing to do with any of this. Right? No, sir. Because you were able to talk to him and, and determine that he had no idea that somebody was using his name. That's correct. Uh,
and you were able to collect emails uh, through the search warrants that were from uh, Darren Lopez's account. Yes. Were you able to uh, find emails that were from Jennifer Faith's true account? Yes. How many emails do you think you found? Um, I can't um, can't say. I, I, I can't give a number right now. Were you ever <coughs> able to? Um, <coughs> When she signed the consent form, uh, allowing you to look through her phone, the, fir the first consent time that you asked to look through her phone and sign a consent form, uh, the emails, the text messages that you found on her phone were only the ones from Tina? Uh, yes, yes sir. You were not able to find any emails or, I mean, I'm sorry, text messages uh, between Darren and uh, Jennifer, correct? Correct. So it would be reasonable to believe that she had deleted all those email, all those text messages before signing that consent form. Yes, that's correct. But she made a big mistake, right? She forgot to delete the messages between Tina and her where she talks about Mr. Lopez. Is that true? That's correct. All right. um, You were able to determine that uh, that Jennifer instructed Darren to uh, remove the T on the back of that truck. Yes, that's correct. And that was uh, through emails or interviews or some some way through your investigation. You were, you were able to determine that she was telling him, "Hey, you might want to remove that that T uh, from your car." That's correct. At her direction. That's correct. talked about how the t uh, Darren was arrested on January 11th, but the investigation didn't stop there, right? No, sir, it didn't. The investigation kept going because you were not only investigating Darren at that point, you were also investigating Jennifer instead of her actions, correct? That's correct. Uh, as part of that investigation, um, mm -hmm. you received information. Uh, through uh, conversations with witnesses and also Darren Lopez, correct? Uh, what kind of information? I mean, you received information, uh, you, you were sat in on an interview. We can't talk about right now about what was, being, what was said during that interview, we can't get into that at all, but we can uh, talk about the fact that you sat down with Detective Barnes and Rick Calvert, the Assistant U.S. Attorney, Felicia Guy, another dis, uh, Assistant District I'm Attorney. I'm gonna object to going into this at this point, Your Honor. It is out there generally that there was a conversation, but I believe that we're diving into details that don't need to come out. All right, Your Honor, we're not talking about what was said. All right, so long as we don't talk about the details yes. or what was said, go ahead. Uh, we can't talk about what was said, but you, you were able to make observations during that meeting, correct? That's correct. Uh, did you feel, uh, were you, was it your perception that Mr. Lopez was being honest. Objection, Your Honor. I think this is going into the statements of the back door. Yes, We're not talking about anything that's being said, Your Honor. I appreciate that, and that's sustained. Well, as, as the investigation went on, and you sat in on this, uh, this interview with Mr. Lopez, uh, you were still trying to interview other people who were involved in, in this case, including Jennifer, right? That's correct. Uh, did you ever uh, did you ever reach out or receive information that Jennifer Faith had tried this in the past with a, some another boyfriend? Uh, I, don't, I don't recall. I do. I did. You did. I, 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 I don't recall. I did. Okay. Is it possible that Detective Barnes received information that she had tried this with another boyfriend in the past? Uh, I had to talk to him about that. So we can ask him when he testifies about that. Yes, sir. But eventually, uh, you were able to. Uh, you received information, um, either directly or indirectly, as part of your investigation, that Jennifer Faith admitted to what she did. That's correct. <coughs> and she admitted that she made these fake email accounts. Isn't that correct? 
That's correct. That she admitted that she had misled Darren Lopez into believing that she was being. Objection, Your Honor. That is objection. That is not relevant at this time to this and an objection that it is something that we can go into at this point. Your Honor, we're not we're offering we're offering this in front of the jury so they can understand that he is part of his investigation. We're not offering the proof. We're not offering any hearsay at this point. We're just offering that he learned that she finally admitted to what she did. That's exactly what you're saying, Your Honor. And that's part of the investigation. I'll let you go that far, but I think anything further than that, I'm not going to let you get into. So the objection is sustained. So just to reiterate, as part of your investigation, you finally figured out that she admitted to making fake email accounts and misleading Darren, correct? I say making the fake email accounts, but I believe that they were in this thing together. I'm sorry? I believe that they were in this together. Okay, you believe that. Yes, sir. But you received that. She didn't admit to that, did she? She admitted to creating the fake emails and that part, yes. Did she admit that she misled him as to her abuse? Objection, Your Honor. You're saying? I think based on his answer, Your Honor. I'll allow the answer to that question. Go ahead. Could you repeat your question? Did she admit that she lied about the abuse to Darren? Yes, she did. Okay. You indicated that she gave you consent to look in her phone the first time. Yes, she did. Did you all ask her if you could look at her phone again? Yes, we did. And did she come to the police department in order for you to do that? Yes, she did. And did she come with her original phone or did she come with a brand new phone? She came with a brand new phone. So she didn't bring the original phone that you really wanted to look at, right? That's correct. She didn't bring that phone. Just a couple of questions on redirect, Your Honor. After Darren Lopez's arrest, the investigation went on, as Mr. Sanchez said, correct? That's correct. Okay. And these emails were all found well after his arrest, is that correct? That's correct. Months after, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, in fact, it was Rebecca Lopez, his estranged wife, that ended up finding the records and sending them to Eric Barnes, is that correct? Some of these emails. That's correct. Okay. And as far as going back to the consent form, Jennifer Faith did delete texts and emails between the two of them. Yes, she did. Is that correct? All right. And as part of the investigation that you did with Darren Lopez and the records that you got, it became clear that he was also deleting texts and emails from his phone, correct? That's correct. Okay. And, again, we'll hear from an analyst later and other people later, but it came to your attention that he, too, had emailed several texts and emails, correct? That's correct. Because their communication is extremely high, is that correct? Yes. All right. But then later, what we find in the phone does not reflect what the Verizon records reflect. Correct. Correct? Okay. So both were deleting texts and emails and messages off their phone. That's correct. And just one more thing of housekeeping, Your Honor. May I approach the bench? Sure. All right. I'm going to show you this is I'm going to show you what's in Marcus State's Exhibit 164. It is not open at this point. It will be open later. But you and I did look at this piece of evidence together at the property room, correct? That's correct. And that is where the property from the Dallas Police Department is kept, at the Baylor Street property room, correct? Yes, that's correct. And you and I looked at this together, and you sealed it back up and put your initials on it. Is that correct? That's correct. And you're the one that brought it here today. 
Yes, and what does this box contain? Uh, it contains a 45 caliber Smith & Wesson uh, handgun that was used in the, this murder investigation. Okay. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'm going to offer into evidence State's Exhibit 164 for record purposes of this. No objection, Your Honor. 164 is a This is only. And Mr. Walton, if Darren Lopez were in the courtroom today, could you identify him? Uh, yes, I could. Could you please identify him by um, an article of clothing that he is wearing? He's wearing a uh, he's wearing a blue shirt, uh, collared shirt, uh, with a uh, short haircut. All right. Um, if I am in seat number one and my co-counsel is in seat number two, which seat would he be in? Uh, seat number five. All right. Thank you. May the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant in open court. Maybe shall so All right, no, no further questions. I have a few more questions. Go ahead. Uh, Detective, uh, based on your estimation, you believe there was about 120,000 text messages between uh, Darren Lopez uh, and Jennifer Faith. That's not like a fair number? Uh, between calls and text messages, 122. 122,000. Okay. I believe so. And yes. you recall that there came a point, though, <laughs> where uh, Darren Lopez wasn't receiving text messages anymore. He was wondering why. Uh, you talking about the day that uh, he uh, committed this crime? No. no. Okay. I was talking about uh, at some point during your investigation, were you able to uh, find out that they had to start communicating through WhatsApp? Uh, I can't recall that, but uh, I can look it in. Can you look in your, in your, in your folder? Well, it won't be up in here, no, no, sir. Do you have that information somewhere? Uh, I could check. Uh, I could check. Let me help you out a little bit. Mm -hmm. May I approach you with that? gave you permission, Jeff. Okay. Uh, let me show you what's been marked as defendant's exhibit number one. Okay. And take a look through this. And see if it's something that you recognize. Does that look familiar? I believe I've seen this this one. These were provided by the state to us, so you as the lead investigator yes. had no reason to have those. Let me see. I, I believe um I have, to, I have to go back and look. Okay. Yeah, How long would it take you to go back and look and see if you ever uh, looked at this? I can make a phone call or two. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we have to call you back up on the stand, you can do that. Yes, sir, I can. But just from looking at this right now, does it look does it look like uh, it's conversations done through a WhatsApp? Yes, sir. Would it be unfair to me to say that uh, just on the quick look that you have right now that uh, had they had to start communicating because of he wasn't receiving text messages at that point. Uh, can you repeat that? Uh, just from the quick look that you've had of these records that were provided by the state, mm -hmm. did it look to you like uh, Darren was having trouble receiving text messages? It just looked like uh, some individuals having communication uh, through that. I can't say whether he wasn't receiving them or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometime today, will you be able to go back and look for the WhatsApp messages that were part of your investigation? Yes, sir. I can, I can check in. Too. Um, also, um, as part of your investigation, you received, uh, you received a letter that was written by Jennifer Faye to Darren Lopez in the jail, right? Yes, it's correct. Okay. May I approach the witness room? This was part of your investigation and also the federal investigation, correct? That's correct. I'll show you what's, uh, been marked as state defendant's exhibit number two. Does that look familiar? Yes, it does. Does that purport to be a letter that you received and made part of your file uh, that was sent to Darren Lopez in the jail from somebody uh, uh, that purports to be Jennifer Faith? It was a letter to him okay. in the jail. Yes, sir. Okay. And you, uh, you received information that would indicate to you that that was from her? Yes, sir. Okay. At this time, uh, I would move to admit defendant exhibit number two
Depends to use admitted to make public. Make public and overhead. We can still call them overhead drone. Mm -hmm. Excel. this letter yourself in your file and this is a letter dated uh, October 19, 2021 and it says hello just uh, see if I can read this just a quick note to say I never had I never lied to you and I never sent you emails from any account but mine as me you once said you would never believe anything about me unless you heard it from me I hope that's still true there is a ton more I wish I could say but I can't right now Soon, hopefully. If you want to respond, you can write back to the address on the envelope. Your cousin Tony never sent the letter you were mm -hmm. you wrote, only said he got one. So don't go through him anymore. 381 dot 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 still now and forever. This letter here that you had part made part of your file is a letter from Jennifer Fave, where she's still trying to convince Darren that she never lied to him about the emails, correct? Uh, that's what the uh, letter says. And uh, the letter also purports that she shouldn't believe what you shouldn't believe when anybody else is telling you. That's correct. Is that correct? As part of your investigation, uh, you were trying to convince Darren that he had been duped. Isn't that true? I'm sorry? That he had been played or that he had been lied to. No, I wasn't trying to, uh, I believe, to I wasn't trying to convince him uh, anybody, that he was. Was anybody as part of the investigation, either you or Barnes, or anybody else trying to do that? Uh, I can't say what they, they were trying to do, but I know it's I didn't. Possible, right? and I'm not going to say it's possible because we believe that they were in on it together. Uh, you, you keep saying that. Yes, sir. What I'm telling you is this letter says she's still denying that she ever sent anything from fake emails when we know that it's true that she created these fake emails. Yes, sir. She so did. if she sent this to Darren, she's still lying to him, isn't she? Uh, that's what the letter says. Oh. Yes, sir. I passed it. I think we're there, Your Honor. Sir, it's possible you might be recalled as a witness. Okay. So please um, make sure we know how to get a hold of you. Don't discuss the case with anybody else. Call your next witness, please. All right. The state will call Jessica Mast. <clears throat> Before you have a seat, turn and face me and raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, sir. Please have a seat. You're responding to questions first from Ms. Mitchell and perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you please state and spell your name for the record? Jessica Mast, J E S S I C A M A S T. And Jessica, um, who, for whom do you work? Currently, I work for the North Texas Anti-Gang Center. That, I'm sorry, the what? The North Texas Anti-Gang Center. Okay, and what do you do for that? I'm an intel analyst. And what does that mean in uh, that particular area? It means that uh, we work with law enforcement to exploit evidence in whatever form that it is received okay. to support investigations. And what kind of evidence are you sent to analyze? Phone dumps, um, CDRs. Uh, call detail records, uh, social media records, uh, search warrant returns. Okay, all right. And what are you? Are you are you giving some de some some sort of detail information so that you know what you're looking for? We're giving context, yes, ma'am. Giving context, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Because now these days there's so much data out there. Right? Absolutely. You have to be given some context in order to filter through it. Yes, ma'am. 
when you're given, let's for instance, CDR records, um, what do you do when you receive them? Uh, with regards to call detail records, we will look for patterns in the high frequency calls, meaning uh, what numbers you're calling, how often, and if there is a pattern in that data. Okay. And were you, were you sent by Eric Barnes um, some returns from Verizon regarding a Darren Lopez? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And after, um, and do you recall when you were sent those? A specific date? No, ma'am. It would be uh, November 2020. November of 2020? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when you got those records, and the search warrant and the record returns have been admitted into evidence in, uh, under record purposes already, mm -hmm. when, you, when you get those records, the returns from Verizon, what do you do with them? I ingest them into a software platform called PLX, and we use that platform to find those patterns. Okay. And this, in this particular instance, what were they asking you to do? What was Eric Barnes asking you to do? To look for high frequency calls for Mr. Lopez and identify if any of them had any evidentiary purposes. Okay. Did he also ask you to compare or look for any phone calls between specifically Darren Lopez and Jennifer Faye? Yes. Okay. And you were given Jennifer Faye's phone number in yes, order to do that. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Make I'm going to show you what's been marked as 89 and 90. This is state's exhibit number 89. Do you recognize that document? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and what, the, what is that document generally? This document is an email that was sent from me to Eric Barnes uh, notating the patterns that I found within this case. Okay, within the, the, the Verizon records that were sent to you in order to Analyze. Okay. And this states exhibit number 90. Um, can you generally describe what this is? This is detailed reports uh, that I generated for you with regards to specific dates, both pre and post uh, the event. Okay. At this time, Your Honor, I would like to offer to evidence this exhibit number 89 and 90. For all purposes. They're admitted for all purposes. You may publish. All right. I'm going to publish on the Elm Walls page just now. All right. So you are given the phone numbers that you want to see if there's patterns on, okay? Mm -hmm. And in this one, you were given dates, I think, between 10, from 9.30 to 10.30. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Of 2020? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you say there are 14,000... 363 events between Darren Lopez, number 615-630-3046, and Jennifer Faith, 602-531-4240, from 9.30 to 10.30. When you say events, what are you talking about? Events are going to be either phone calls and or text messages. Okay. And can you delineate between a phone call and a text message? As it relates to the data, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay. Can. And what, but what is the general delineation? Uh, the duration okay. within those records. Keep going. A text message is going to show what usually? A text message is going to show no duration of time executed on that call. Okay. Uh, a phone would obviously be anything from one second and beyond. Okay. So you'll see zero, zero, zero usually for a text message. Correct. Okay. And in this one, you have 107 events um, on 10-9. 107 events, and you're using military time, so 118. Yes, ma'am. Um, and the way you're wording this, from 118, means there was nothing prior to that. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 105 events were texts, and two events were calls. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and the calls are at what time, military? 9.43 at night and 11.23 at and night. You, and you give the duration, and this is all on 10.9 of 2020? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And looking at this, 
they do a lot of text messaging coming in. Is that is that true? Yes, sir. Okay. You also say of the 41 phone calls between Lopez and Faith, only 19 were able to be mapped. What do you mean by that? Meaning that there was geolocation data, whether it was uh, tower data or a lat long, there were data there that could be mapped to a specific location. Okay, but at that time, you could not place Darren Lopez in Texas? No, ma'am. Based on the information that you have from those CDR records, is that yes, correct? Okay. Um, okay, and then additionally, you give some more information at the end with things from his phone, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> then, the report after you and I talk, you do a report and you summarize it on the first page, but these is an example of what this looks like, correct? Correct. All right, so you're just using, you're only looking at Darren Lopez and Jennifer Faith's f phone events. Correct. Okay, and you can tell outgoing and incoming, <clears throat> the time, the date, and the duration. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and if it's a zero, zero, it's gonna denote a text message, correct? Yes, sir. So for instance, on this date, are we using the provider date? No, we're using the date time. The provider date would be UTC, universal time. Okay, but we're using this date as the date that the messages were sent. Correct. And received. Yes, sir. Okay, and then we can see, for instance, on 1013, you have these two phone calls, and then you just have a string of text messages. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, incoming, outgoing, incoming, outgoing, incoming, outgoing, all day long. And then we're talking seven, nine, and it, it, it just goes in chronological order, correct? Correct. All right, and that's how every one of these pages is going to be with the dates, so each day denoting the events between the two of them, calls or emails, or I'm sorry, calls or text. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <clears throat> on this one where you emailed me and you went ahead and did a breakdown um, of specific dates so not every date in October you didn't do just specific dates correct yes ma'am so 10 7 you had 699 events right yes ma'am um, and then it's important on 10 8 can you read what that says says that there were 75 events and there was no communication after 9.07 a.m. And 10.9, you record? 107 events with no communication before 1.18 p.m. Okay, and then on 10.10, we have 2.70, 10.11, 3.81, 10.12, 2.85, 10.13, 2.55. Again, events means calls or texts. 10.16, you have Says what? I'm sorry? Can you read 1016? Uh, 808. And, and that it is? One week post Mr. Faith's death. Um, I'm going out of order, but I would like to offer the evidence states exhibit number 224. And do you recognize this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is this what you and I have discussed and you sent to me? Yes, ma'am. And just generally, can you explain what it is? It's a further breakdown of what you see here. Uh, it delineates the difference between the calls and the texts. All right. At this time, I would like to offer into evidence these exhibits. Please exhibit 224, which again um, has been uploaded, and it is just a breakdown of the events from text to calls. Okay. Submitted. You may publish. Okay, Jessica, is it okay if I call you Jessica? Absolutely. Okay. All right, Jessica, so just going side by side if we can. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So we see on 10-7 of 2020, there were 699 texts. So every communication on 10-7 was text. Correct. On 10-8, we see 75, no communication after 9 7 a.m., 75 texts. Correct. Ten nine, we see 107, no communication, same thing, before 118. 105 texts and two calls. 
Correct. And then the breakdown, 266 texts, keep going, 377 texts, four calls, and they continue. And then on 1016, you have 807 texts and one call. One week post Jamie's staff, correct? Correct. All right. Now this becomes important when we're talking about looking at, well, let me back up a little bit. Again, these are records that you were getting from the provider, from Verizon, right? So presumably records that you cannot manipulate. Right. A human cannot manipulate them. They are records from the provider. However, when someone does a cell extraction, if the numbers are dramatically different from what the provider has sent, particularly months earlier, one could presume that what was on that phone was manipulated with. Is that correct? Correct. Did that make sense? Yes. Okay. So basically, texts and calls can be deleted. Yes. But what you're getting from the provider is going to be information that can't be easily, cannot be manipulated. Correct. Did you do anything further as analysis on this case? No, ma'am. And let's just be clear, you are only working with the records during this particular time, 9.30 to 10.30, is that correct? Correct. Yes. So you didn't have the entire length of the phone or the march through October, big time frame that we're talking about. You had one month that you were working with. Correct. Okay. All right, I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Mast. Ma'am, you were... Uh, <clears throat> You were called to make this report, correct? And you're looking at data that's provided by Verizon, right? Correct. Uh, you were not able to look and see what was said in those conversations. No. You didn't have any way to find out what was being said by who. No, sir. Uh, you can only see like who initiated the phone call, right? Yes. Uh, but you're gonna look at the duration of the phone call? The duration, whether it's incoming or outgoing. Correct. And the number. Uh, but there's no way for you to know what was actually said. No, in those phone conversations. No, sir. Now, uh, are you familiar with how providers limit the amount of text messages that one can receive based on their plans? Are you familiar with that? No, sir. Not at all? No. In other words, is there any way that someone can max out their text messages? Not to my knowledge. No. You're not saying it's impossible, you just said you don't know. Uh, correct. That's all I have. Nothing further, Your Honor. They should be finally excused. No objection. No objection. Mm -hmm. stand You're excused from any further service. Call your next witness, please. Your Honor, at this time we call Anthony Sims. Anthony Sims, come on up, please. And before you have a seat on the witness stand, could you please turn and face me and raise your right hand. It's where the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Please have a seat. We're responding to questions first from Ms. Mitchell in front of you and perhaps also Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed. Actually, Agent Sims, you're going to respond to questions for me, right? There you go. That's Caitlin Payburn. She's. <laughs> Thank you going to be asking you questions. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Agent Sims. Good afternoon. Um, could you please introduce yourself to the jury and spell your name for the court reporter? Uh, Special Agent Anthony Sims, Jr. Name is spelled A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, S-I-M-S, Jr. is J-R. And how are you currently employed? Uh, currently employed with Homeland Security Investigations here in Irving, Texas. And how long have you been with Homeland Security? About 13 years. And what did you do before that? Uh, before that, I was in the Secret Service and was a pilot in the U.S. Army. And so you have had, um, it sounds like, I would imagine, substantial training in various areas related to law enforcement and forensics? That's correct. Okay. Um, could you tell the jury a little bit about your training and education that qualifies you to testify about cell phone extractions, which is what we're going to talk about today? So I've been trained with basic computer evidence recovery, uh, mobile, mobile device evidence recovery, 
advanced computer evidence recovery and I have a master's in forensics from Sam Houston State University. And in your current role, you're the um, supervisor for the computer forensics lab, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and so uh, what kind of duties and obligations do you have in that role? Uh, so I manage all of North Texas and the state of Oklahoma. So all the forensic requests that come in from federal partners, state and local partners, uh, assign forensics cases to, to my analyst and try to put out the products to support the investigations for the area. And you are more, it sounds like, in a supervisory role now, is that right? That's correct. Okay, but are you also sometimes called upon to perform the forensic analysis yourself, such as the cell phone extraction? Yes, I am. And is that what happened in this case here? Yes, it is. And how would you go about performing this task of extracting the information off of a cell phone? So once we get a cell phone into the lab, uh, we'd like to review the search warrant for that authorizes us to, to extract the information. So we use uh, a program called Cellbrite, and we have to hook the cell phone up to the Cellbrite program. It extracts a bit-for-bit -bit copy from the device, so that we can forensically image it, image it, it, forensically examine it using our self, our software, and our tools to, pursuant to whatever warrant is given to us by our, our partners. Okay, and so we've the jury heard just a tiny mention of Cellbrite earlier, but that's the software you use to perform the analysis. That's correct. Um, and just to be clear, you didn't write the software, correct? That's correct. How are you qualified or certified to use the software Cellbrite? Uh, so during our computer evidence training, we have individuals from Cellbrite that come in and explain how the, how the software works, how the program works. They explain how to perform different extractions to obtain forensic evidence and then we're given a certification upon completion of that training. And um, you're certified to use Cellbrite, correct? That's correct. Um, what kind of information can you get when you perform a cell phone extraction? Uh, so different types of information. You can get what's called a physical, if you do a physical extraction, that gets everything on the cell phone, on the memory of the cell phone, uh, stuff that's, that's written to the hard drive of the cell phone. You can also get like a bare bone extraction, which is typically called something called something called a logical extraction, which gets basic user created information, uh, certain things from the applications, text messages, phone calls, things of that nature. Okay, so um, you could get videos, correct? Photos, correct? Messages, correct? Pretty much anything that's on a cell phone, right? Yes. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about what happens to deleted files on a cell phone. Is Cellbrite sometimes able to recover deleted files during a cell phone extraction? Yes. Um, what can be some of the issues with the deleted files or what might they look like? So uh, with a, when a file is deleted from a cell phone, when Cellbrite uh, is able to extract that information, it may show up as like a red X <coughs> inside the tool. And that's an indication that this file or, or program was deleted by a user or by the operating system itself. And are there sometimes um, deleted files that cannot be recovered? Yes. And sometimes when we do get some deleted files, is it possible that they may be incomplete, for instance, like a text message with only a portion of the message or only a portion of the conversation? That's correct. And if you were to take a cell phone extraction and compare the number of, let's say, calls between two parties on any particular day and find, let's say, no calls or no text messages, and then you were to compare those to records from the service provider, such as Verizon, um, and they didn't match up, could that possibly be explained by things being delivered <coughs> directly from the cell phone? Yes. Now, <clears throat> after, a, after you perform a cell phone extraction, how do you verify the results? So we have something called a uh, hash value. So a hash is kind of like a, like a social security number or a fingerprint. So whenever you forensically image something, uh, it, it's like a mathematical a algorithm that makes sure that file or image cannot be reproduced or copied or, or faked. And that lets us know that we have an original and true copy of the evidence. And, um so that's how you verify that nothing's been altered with or changed since you received the phone. Correct.
In January of 2021, did you receive a search warrant from Detective Barnes with DTD slash ATF asking you to perform a cell phone extraction on a phone belonging to the defendant, Darren Lopez? Yes, I did. In, um, actually, let me grab another document while I'm up here. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 91. Does this appear to be the search warrant that you received um, asking you to perform the cell phone extraction on that phone? Yes, it is. Okay, and we see it's for a Samsung Galaxy phone, correct? Correct. And the IMSI, or as you told me, MC number is 3114052. Is that correct? That's correct. Your Honor, at this time, the state would offer State's Exhibit 91 for record purposes only. And um, Agent Sims, did you then perform the cell phone extraction as requested in that search warrant? I did. And when you performed that cell phone extraction, would you have followed the standard procedures and protocols that you just described to the jury? Yes, I would have. And would you have taken the verification steps with the hash value like you explained? Yes. Okay. Um, and if anything unusual had happened or any errors had come up, would you have noted that in your findings? I would. Okay. Did that happen in this case? No, it did not. Okay. After you performed the phone dump, would you have generated a report with your findings? Yes. And I'm showing you what has been marked as State's Exhibit Number 92. Is that a report that you generated following the cell phone extraction you performed in this case? Yes. And I'm also going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number 93. This is a flash drive, and you had the opportunity to review it with another prosecutor this morning. Is that right? That's correct. And did you confirm that this does, in fact, contain the complete cell phone extraction that you performed on the defendant's phone dump that we've been talking about here? Yes, it does. Your Honor, the State would offer State's Exhibit 92 for all purposes and State's Exhibit 93 for record purposes only. Objection. They're admitted. Uh, 93 for record purposes only, right? And the other one is for all purposes. That's 92? Yes, Judge. Yep. Thank you. You may publish. 92. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> now, before we get into the contents of State's Exhibit 92, I want to ask you um, a little bit about your role in this investigation. Um, were you given sort of the general context of the investigation so you would know what to look for on the phone dump? Yes, I was. Okay. And um, are you, do you have personal knowledge of the complete workings of the investigation? No, I do not. For instance, you and I were recently talking and I had mentioned some emails that came up, but you actually didn't have anything to do with those email records. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you weren't even aware of them until I mentioned them to you. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So your role is more focused on just this cell phone extraction. Correct. And I'm going to show you um, what's been marked as state's exhibit. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, yeah, it's okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit 94. Is this a screenshot of the cell bright window when you perform that cell phone extraction on the defendant's cell phone? Yes, it is. And it shows here the same um, identifying information as well as your name as the, an the examiner? Correct. I'll offer State's Exhibit 94 for all purposes. No objection. 
Thank you, Judge. Okay, Agent Sims, what? Just so the jury understands and is aware, let's look first at State's Exhibit 94. Um, and this is that screenshot we were talking about. So does this, is this what Cellbrite looks like when you open it up um, to view a cell phone extraction? Oh, yes, it is. Okay. And so we can see over here to the left, we have identifying information. Um, we have information about the date that the extraction was performed in January. And then sort of towards the bottom left, we see some identifying information related to the phone. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, and so here we get Verizon and this phone number as well, correct? Correct. And then over to the right, we can see where there are certain um, content and data listed, um, and that's gonna include contacts, calendar, call log, things of that nature. Correct. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show State's Exhibit 92, and this is the front page of the report you generated following um, the cell phone extraction, is that correct? That's correct. And um, during your analysis, did you find information that you believed um, to be relevant or potentially helpful or interesting to the detectives on the case? Yes, I did. Um, and as we flip through, well, would you have notified them that you had found some of that information? Yes, I would have. Okay, and if we flip to page three of State's Exhibit 92, we see here you've identified some text messages that could be interesting, is that right? That's correct. Okay, and we see here there is an outgoing message found on the defendant's phone on November 30th, 2020. I love you, hope you get this. And then we see another outgoing text message on 1130, 2020. Okay, reset my phone, deleted old texts. I would erase and they would pop back up. Looks like they are erased now, not sure what was going on. And what made you, what grabbed your attention about that message? Uh, just the fact that the, the the two people in the conversation were discussing deleting text messages. I felt like it was relevant to the case. And now you had been given information before this um, about specific dates that might be relevant, such as the date of the shooting, um, dates of arrest, things like that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then um, did you also find some sexually explicit messages between those two same parties. Yes, I do. Okay. And so we here see on page four, a thread of fairly explicit messages between the two parties. Is that correct? That's correct. And they would be of a sexually graphic nature. Is that fair to say? Yes. And those messages would have been on November 30th, 2020, uh, around 7.15 p.m. over the next few minutes? That's correct. And were you aware that the nature of the relationship between the parties involved in this case was something that would be important? Yes. And based on the dates that you were given, you were made aware that those text messages that we just read would have been after the shooting had occurred? Yes. And then I want to talk to you just a little bit about some messages that we see on page six. Can you read that message for me at the bottom? Uh, the sentence starts, so I woke up in a little bit of a panic. Something is eating away at me, telling me you need to take the sticker out of the back window of the truck. Okay, and we see that that was an incoming message to the defendant's phone on December 4th, 2020. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And had you been made aware that there was a sticker on the back of a truck that was relevant to this case? Yes, I was. And then on page 8... 
just a little less than two days later, on 12-6-2020, we see an outgoing text that says, sticker done, correct? Correct. Okay. Suggesting that the defendant had quickly complied with that request. Fair to say? Yes. And then there are a number of other texts that you included in your report that you had identified as potentially relevant or interesting to the detectives. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, Agent Sims, could you please explain for the jury what UTC is just generally? Uh, so generally UTC is what we call universal coordinated time, where you guys through movies may have heard of Zulu time. So that's a, a international agreed upon uh, time um, that keeps people from getting confused with time zones. So here we are UTC minus five or UTC minus six, which is the central standard time zone. Okay, so when you perform a cell phone extraction, does it generally everything comes up as UTC time? Correct. And then you can actually go in and set the project to convert it to the correct time zone. That's correct. Okay. So. For instance, when we're looking at records on this case, we may see a lot of a timestamp and then it'll say UTC minus five or UTC minus six, depending on daylight savings. Correct. Um, did I at some point ask you to review a short set of messages that seemed to not be in UTC time? Yes, you did. And did we determine that those messages came from LinkedIn? Yes, we did. I'm showing you what's been marked as states exhibit number five, 95, excuse me. Um, and this is a, a Cellbrite report generated um, showing the LinkedIn messages. Is that correct? That's correct. I'll offer states exhibit 95 for all purposes. No objection, Your Honor. It's admitted, you may publish. Thank you. And Agent Simpson, the jury can see what we're talking about. If we look at States Exhibit 95, we see up at the top the Cellbrite heading, and then Darren Lopez is the owner, and Jennifer Faith is the other participant in this conversation, right? Yes. Okay. And just so we're all on the same page about where it all came from, if we zoom into this really tiny text, we can see here where it says LinkedIn.Android. Is, is that giving you some kind of... Um, file delineation in the cell phone extraction? Yes, it is. And here, we can see this message. The first one, I'll read it. Hello, wow, great to see you. Would like to connect back with you through email if I can. Mine is drlp75 at hotmail.com. Can you send me yours? I hope you are doing great and happy. Talk with you soon, Darren. And then at the bottom, we see this timestamp on that that says March 17th, 2020. 3.49.23 a.m. And is that timestamp unusual compared to the other messages on the phone? Uh, yes. And how so? Uh, it's not delineated as a UTC time. Okay. Um, and I had asked you if there was a potential explanation for that. Do you have any potential explanations for why that might have happened with these messages? Yeah, sometimes on your cell phones or uh, whether it's Android or Apple, the application itself manages its own time. So in this case, I believe that LinkedIn is managing its time. It, it may be that, that time on the uh, paper may be the time on the LinkedIn server or within the actual application itself. Okay, so the timestamps on this may be off, um, it's fair to say? Correct. Okay, so this may be, these messages may be something where we have to rely more on context to determine when they happen. Correct. Okay, um, and just because we have them up, I'll go ahead and well, the next message on States Exhibit 95 is, Hi Darren, wow, was I surprised to hear from you. I hope you understand if I am a bit skittish in responding, but my email is jenniferurlob at gmail.com. How do I know this is really you? But I also hope you are doing great and are happy, Jen. And then how does he respond? Uh, the response states, would it help if I called you Angel, and as you wish, Darren. And she says, yep, that did it, ha, ha, ha. Send me an email and let me know how you are. Excited to talk to you. And those 
messages do appear to go back and forth within less than an hour. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, the next thing I want to ask you about is I contacted you recently about an image that was located on the cell phone extraction. Is that right? That's correct. And I sent you a screenshot of the image from Cellbrite with the file info. Is that right? That's correct. And is that what we see here in 96? Yes. And this image in States Exhibit number 96, did you then go and pull up the actual cell phone extraction to verify all of this information? Yes, I did. Okay. And you were able to locate this file in the cell phone extraction? Yes. Your Honor, at this time we offer States Exhibit 96 for all purposes. No objection, Your Honor. It's admitted. You may publish. Thank you, Judge. And Agent Simpson states it's of it 96. We see here up at the top, and it's fairly small, it appears to be an image of a hand choking a throat, correct? Correct. Okay. And it is actually a small image on the phone, right? That's correct. And why is it small on the phone? Uh, so that's what we consider called a thumbnail image. So whenever you download something to your Outlook or you go, go open a website on your phone, the phone will actually save that image in what's called a cache file. Um, and so I can pull, so pull it up in, future, in, in the future if you decide to look at it again. Um. And so this image presumably then would have been saved on the phone because it was opened in an email of some sort. Possibly, yes. That's correct. And so it's possible it could be an email from another person, right? That's correct. Is it also possible that if the defendant had emailed this image to himself, that it would have appeared in his cache? Correct. correct. Thank you, Agent Sims. We'll pass the witness. Cross-examination, Mr. Duke. Thank you, Judge. Good uh, afternoon, Agent Sims. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Um, Agent Sims, I want to talk to you for just a minute about um, the deleted messages that Ms. Paver spoke to you about. The cell phone, or the text messages that went back and forth looked that Ms. Faith was directing Mr. Lopez to delete everything off of his phone. Is that right? Uh, I'm, are you asking me if, if she's directed him to yes. delete the text messages? I can't stay. I can't okay, let's, stay there. Let's look at them again. If I can see states uh, ninety one, excuse me, 90, 92, The extraction report. And forgive me if it takes me a second to get over to what we were talking about there. This paper might be able to find it faster. Than I should. Yes, correct. Okay. And informing Ms. Faith, uh, okay, I, okay, reset my phone, deleted old text, I would erase it and they would pop back up. Is that right? That's correct. Would you mind, you might need to zoom a Oh, little my bit. apologies. I wasn't looking up there. We'll come back up there. And we're looking at this from November 30th of 2020. So this is after the date of uh, Jamie Faith's murder. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And Mr. Lopez is texting to Jennifer Faith that he has... He says, okay, reset my phone and, and deleted old texts. Okay. But he did not, did he? Uh, we recovered uh, the texts that were, that were shown uh, from the screenshot is what we recovered. So, okay. If he had reset his phone, would this information have been available? If he had reset the phone and then used it again, then yes. 
Okay, the information after the reset would have been used. You, you would have found the information after the reset. Subright could have recovered it. And but not the stuff before the reset. Uh, if, we got, if we did a physical extraction with the phone, it's possible to recover old, old text messages. Possible, but not probable that you would have had this level of content. Uh, so what's shown on the, on the screenshot is what we recovered. Okay. Let's, what, what I'm trying to get to, Detective, is that Darren Lopez didn't, didn't actually reset his phone and delete all of this information. You were able to get it. Is that right? That's correct. They recovered a cell phone from Jennifer Faith as well. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. Were you ever asked to uh, perform a cell phone extraction on Jennifer Faith's phone? Not that I recall. Were you made aware that they recovered a cell phone from her on the same day that Darren Lopez was arrested? Yes. But you were never given that, so presumably they knew that she had done enough to get rid of all of that information. Uh, I don't understand the question. If you can answer the question, then you can answer it. Don't your own I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. Let me see. Framed. Uh, you never got Jennifer Faith's cell phone? No, I did not. Okay. So presumably they knew that she had done something where you weren't going to get the same extraction like you did for Mr. Lopez's cell phone. Objection. I don't know how you could possibly answer that question. Do you have any personal knowledge of that? I do not. Okay. okay. Then the objection is Thank you. All right. Darren Lopez did not delete the information in question. Is that right? So, so the information on the extraction was not deleted. Cellbrite was able to recover that information. And you would have been able to, your Cellbrite extraction would have been able to show if he made efforts to delete that information or reset the phone in some way, right? Yes. And you have no evidence of that, that he did that at all? Uh, not that I could see on, on the extraction. Just as a uh, housekeeping, this was returned as a federal warrant, is that correct? That's correct. And that federal warrant, um, if you look on the front page here, um, can you tell the jury what uh, case number that is for? Uh, case number, and I'll read it phonetically, Delta Alpha 37, Oscar Sierra 2-1, Delta Alpha 0001. And that case number, was, the current case title was? A forensic Examination of Darren Lopez's Samsung Galaxy Note. Okay. And that was, the, that was the report title. The current case title was what? A capital Murder Investigation of Darren Lopez. Okay. And so this was uh, originally returned um, looking into the, the capital case against Jennifer, Lo Je or, excuse me, Jennifer Faith and Darren Lopez. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Darren Lopez ultimately was not federally charged, correct? So as a supervisor, this is an internal case file. I, I decide what the case file is going to be named. Okay, so that's uh, so just a name that, that you made up at this point? Yes. I'll get this back to you so I don't need it. Thank you. Um, The last exhibit that the state talked to you about, number 96. So just so that the jury is clear from, from this cache, can you, you can tell when this image was put into Darren Lopez's cache, is that right? Uh, yes, yeah, so if you, if you zoom in on the, on the path section, it gives you kind of like a uh, a, a path, if you will. Uh, so it's located in in the data sec data section under com Microsoft Office Outlook slash cache, and then, you know the file was downloaded because it's in the files dash download section, and it gives a file name, which is five one six two eight dot jpeg. Okay, and that image was created when. According to this file, uh, according to this file <clears throat> so the modified dates, which is whenever the file was saved to the phone, is 5 13 2020. Okay, so Darren Lopez received and saved it to the file May 13th of 2020. That's what it denotes. Okay. 
the layers on the file. So if somebody had texted that image to him on May 13th of 2020, then that would end up in his cache if he downloaded it and saved it, correct? Uh, so what I'm looking at is, is showing in the Outlook file, in the Outlook folder, Outlook cache folder. So I don't know about any text messages. Okay. So in this, in this instance, it looks like it was emailed to him. So in this, in, in this instance, where I located this file was in the Outlook cache folder. So the Outlook would be an email, correct? Correct. So the image was emailed to him um, on May 13th of 2020. So th this is saying that it was accessed. So I don't know if it was emailed or not, but this is where it was saved. So it was saved to his phone May 13th, 2020. Correct. Agent Sims, when phones get full of information, is a, a frequent response or, or suggestion from tech support to remove some of that data? Uh, can you see the question again, please? When phones uh, have a copious amount of data on them, they can start slowing down and gumming up, is that right? That's correct. So people frequently, either on their own, will remove some of that data, or even they're, they're frequently told by tech support or otherwise to remove some of that data, is that right? Correct. Fast. Just briefly, Your Honor. Um, Agent Sims, now I didn't direct your attention specifically to deleted messages in the cell phone dump before you came today. Is that fair to say? Yes. Um, if there are deleted messages in the cell phone extraction that were recovered, as you mentioned, they would show up with the little red X on them, right? Yes. Yeah, so on the screenshot, it had a red numbers. So that's how it would show up in cell break. The red X or like a red number. Okay, there would be something pretty clearly depicting that these are recovered, deleted messages. Correct. Thank you. We'll pass the witness. Nothing further, Judge. He'd be finally excused or subject to recall? No objection. No objection. Very good, sir. You may stand down. You're excused from any further service. Members of the jury, it looks like a good natural stopping point for uh, a break. So if you would, please be back in the jury room at 2.35. Ready to come back in. Please don't discuss the case among yourselves and don't do any independent research. All rise for the jurors.
Chair, can we be seated? Who's the next witness? The next witness is Agent Mark Sedwick. Can you please come to the front of the courtroom? And before you have a seat on the witness stand, can you please turn to the page of the Where the testimony you're about to give will be the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Please have a seat. And whose witness will this be for the state? My, my witness, Your Honor. You responded to questions first from Ms. Mitchell. And either Mr. Duke or Mr. Sanchez to your left. You may proceed whenever you're ready. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and state your name for the record? Mark Sedwick. Last name is spelled S-E-D-W-I-C-K. I'm a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation out of the Dallas office. How long have you been with the FBI? Just under 25 years. And what do you do for the FBI at this time? I'm a member of the CAST team or the Cellular Analysis Survey team. Can you explain to the jury what that is? The CAST team is a group of specially trained agents and task force officers who have been certified as experts in the analysis of historical call detail records. And what kind of training have you had regarding the historical call detail record analysis? I've had training initially over 400 hours from other FBI agents outside companies on how radio frequency works, which is how the cell phone and the tower communicate over radio frequency. But most importantly, I've been trained by the engineers from the major service providers in the U.S., AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, on how the networks operate and how the phones interact with the network. Okay, so you're very familiar with how these networks operate, and then they're constantly updating all the time. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So does that mean you're having to get training all the time? We have a yearly recertification where all the CAST agents throughout the country will come together, and during that we will bring in an engineer and the subpoena compliance or the law enforcement liaison groups from all the major service providers, and then we'll have other speakers come in to talk with us to get recertified. How long have you been on this CAST team for the FBI? Full-time since 2014. Okay. And is this what you do almost exclusively or no? I do this exclusively investigatively, and I'm also a member of the Dallas SWAT team for the FBI and the division. Okay. All right. You were asked to do an analysis being part of the cellular analysis survey team regarding a case against Darren Lopez. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what were you asked to do? I was provided records for the cell phone associated with Mr. Lopez and also a Google Gmail account associated with Mr. Lopez, and I was asked to plot the location data associated with both of those accounts to show where the device was during a specific time frame. Okay. And, again, we can't say where the person was, right? We can only say where the device was. Yes, ma'am. Whenever I talk about it, I'll refer to the phone number. I'm only talking about the device. I can't say who was in possession of the device at any time. Okay. There's usually some corroborating evidence that shows that the human was actually with the device. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, usually. Okay. And do you remember who asked you to create this report using the records, the Google records and the CDR records? Originally, it was an assistant U.S. United States attorney, and I am blanking on who it was at this time. Okay. All right. And then what information are you given for you to create this report that you do? In this case, I'm provided with, from the prosecution or the investigators, I'll be provided specific date and times and locations that are of importance, like a crime scene, any other locations and a time frame. But then I'll receive the records that were received through legal process from, in this case, Verizon Wireless and Google that gives me my call detail records or CDRs and then my Google data in this case. All right. And did you make a report? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am? I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 97. Let me take a look at that and make sure it's the same report that you have. Yes, ma'am, it is. All right. And you created this report? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And this is just a copy of this report? Yes, ma'am. And you keep your records at the FBI? Yes, ma'am. Okay. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer to evidence State's Exhibit 97, the CAST 
report for all purposes. Agent said, we'll just kind of start at the beginning so they can see. This is the report that you send out, correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that you're the uh, special agent that's doing it, and then the uh, telephone number the provider is Verizon, and the telephone number for Darren Lopez. The number I was told associated with Mr. Lopez, and then the date that the report was finalized. Okay. Now, on this, on page two, what are you... What is the point of page two? Uh, this is the written report, and basically I was asked to look uh, at this for this time frame of October 8th and 9th because uh, of a homicide that occurred. Uh, the methodology is I take the call detail records, which is your phone bill. It has the date and time a call was made, the two numbers involved, but it also has the tower and sector of that the device used for that call and based on that, I can determine the approximate location the device had to be by knowing where that tower is in the world and then the other towers around it. I can determine the approximate location that device had to, to be. I also, in this case, had Google location data, which is if you have an Android device or a Gmail account associated with your device, uh, your phone's constantly giving up its location to Google, and that can be based on Wi-Fi or GPS. It can also be based on cell tower, but we don't use the cell tower because it can be historical. It cannot be, the timestamp can be off on that. So we will use the GPS or Wi-Fi data collected by Google that the phone sends back to Google, and that is given a report that gives you a latitude and longitude, the time that, it, that occurred, and then a level of uncertainty in meters. So basically, it's a, I can put a pinpoint and then a circle, and the device was somewhere within that circle. Okay, and so, and, and I'm certainly not very good at this, but even if the phone is on, let's say, in airplane mode, um, is it your testimony that Google can still extract data? Yes, if you put your phone in Google, or excuse me, in airplane mode, as long as the phone is on. As long, you can put it in airplane mode, you can turn your Wi-Fi off, your device is actually still looking for those Wi-Fi signals and everything. So what will happen is it will store all that location data, and as soon as you connect your device back to the network or to a Wi-Fi and turn it back on, basically, not turn it back on, but re-establish either Wi-Fi or cellular connectivity, it will dump all that data it has back to Google. And that is what one of the things I used for location in this case was those records provided by Google. And when we're talking about a seat that the call detail records from the provider like Verizon, yes, those are details, I'm sorry, those are records that cannot be manipulated by the person who owns the phone. Is that correct? No, ma'am. Uh, the Google records, the end user can delete that data. They can't modify it, but they can go in and actually delete their Google history from Google. But the CDR, the, the owner of the device has no control over those records. Those are the business records of, in this case, Verizon. And then conclusions, what, what did you... Uh, that's basically my conclusions will be in the following slides, what my analysis showed. All right, let's start with uh, page number three. Can you explain to the jury just quickly what we're looking at here and what you're trying to show? Yes, this is basically the standard cell tower in the United States. Or each cell tower, I think everyone's seen them on the side of the highway, but they're broken up into three sectors or pieces of pie that cover approximately 120 degrees. They're 360 degrees in a circle, so they cover that full circle. Uh, in the records, I'll be given the azimuth orientation of that tower, and what that is is what direction the center of that tower is pointed. So the coverage area will be 60 degrees to either side of that azimuth. And in this case, if I'm given an azimuth of 60 degrees, 
the tower will cover, that set will approximately cover from zero to 120 degrees, or on a clock face, 12 o'clock to four o'clock, because every 30 degrees is equal to an hour on a clock face. All right, and then on page four. Uh, this is just how I'll show the CDR, the cell tower usage. What you see is you see the point, you know, the bottom of the apex, that's the cell tower. In this case, this tower is pointed north. You have the two sector arms going out that 60 degrees to either side, and then you have that shaded area, and that is just to show how the energy is going out, kind of in an upside down funnel shape. That is not indicative of the entire coverage area of that tower. That's just to show how kind of the energy is going out. I can't say exactly where the coverage of a tower ends, but just based on my training, and the other towers in the area, I can determine the approximate the approximate coverage area of that cell tower. All right, and here we have, I guess, what we were talking about earlier, some of the information that you're given to by either agents or uh, uh, law enforcement, other law enforcement agencies that they kind of want to give some context to. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. So I was provided the records for Verizon for telephone number 615, 630-3046 associated with Darren Lopez and also the Google data associated with that phone number through the email address associated with that phone number. I was also given the phone number for Jennifer Faith ending in 4240 uh, and then I was also provided four addresses of interest. Uh, the victim's residence 926 South Waverly Drive in Dallas uh, Mr. Lopez's residence, 1285 Sweet Home Road in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, and then two truck stops, a pilot travel center, 2320 Highway 46 South in Dickinson, Dixon, Tech, Tennessee, and then Flying J Truck Stop, 3400 Service Loop Road, West Memphis, uh, Arkansas. All right, and do we start the analysis here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I was at, basically asked to look where the device was on October 9th, in the morning of October 9th, and then where it was, or if, if did it travel into the area. So I basically started my uh, analysis on October 8th, 2020, 107 p.m. to 116 p.m., and what you have here is there are several Google locations between 1 and 1.16 p.m. of 20 to 77 meters, but they're all basically centered on his residence. So his, that device is somewhere very close to his residence. And then there was one, uh, there were no phone calls, but in that seven minute time frame between 1 and 1.07 p.m., the two devices associated with Mr. Lopez and Miss uh, Faith, uh, they exchanged 27 text messages in that seven minutes. And Verizon, T-Mobile and AT&T will provide you the cell tower and sector off a of text. Verizon does not provide that. So that I, sh I can see in the records that the text occurred, but I have no location data for those texts. All right, and then what are we showing here? You kind of zoomed out now, and now yes. we have a larger view of... Yes, so what we have now is the device has started to move. This is from 126 to 151 p.m., <laughs> and each of the red flags is a, Jeep, is a Google hit, and I, don't, I didn't label all of them, but at 126, it's you know south of his residence, and then at 151 p.m., it is now near, near the pilot travel center south of his residence. So it's just showing the, the phone has started to leave the area of the residence and is traveling south. Okay, so we can see you have Cumberland Furnace and you have uh, Darren Lopez's residence and then you have the movement going south. What you said, south? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then what, what are you showing here? Uh, this is from 1.53 to 2.19 p.m. The device is, you know, the Google data is showing the device in the area of the pilot truck stop. And then I was also told that at 1.57 p.m. Uh, there was a receipt from the pilot travel center from Mr. Lopez, I'm assuming getting gas. Okay, again, that, because you can't say where, if it's human, 
human was is moving. You can only say the device is moving, correct? Yes, ma'am. So putting the device at the pilot center around the same time that you show a receipt from the pilot center would be corroboration. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right, and can you continue? Explain yes, ma'am. So now we are from October again on the 8th from 2.21 p.m. to 4.37 p.m. and just showing the devices moving east and you can see that there are gaps in the Google data. I can only plot what Google provided uh, but there are some gaps but it shows the device traveling east towards Memphis between 2.36 and 4.37 p.m. So I'm just showing the excuse me west that the device is still traveling west at this point. Okay, and the time is just continuing to go move, yes, move, move forward. Yes, ma'am. All right, and here we've got another specific stop. Yes, ma'am. From 5.14 to 5.17 p.m., I have Google data that puts it in the area of the Flying J truck stop, and there was another receipt 5.10 p.m., so four minutes before there was a receipt before there was any Google data, but shows the device in the area of that Flying J truck stop. And again, we continue to move, and where are we going now? Uh, we're still traveling west. Uh, this is between Memphis and towards Little Rock, between 5.39 p.m. to 6.55 p.m., and the device continues to travel west. All right, page 12. Uh, we've now moved to October 9th. Uh, there is a gap with no Google data. Uh, this is the next data. This is 147 to 150 a.m., and it shows the device uh, off the Google data south of Dallas at this point at you know 147 to 150 a.m. Okay, so we're now we're traveling on 35. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. In the in the right? vicinity of yeah. travel of 35. And yes, ma'am. Kind of south of Red Oak, then Heights to Soto. Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay, can you? Go over this for the jury. This is page 13 of the report. Yes, ma'am. Now the device, we've jumped in time to 2.09 a.m. to 2.12 a.m. And we have several hits near 35 uh, north of West 12th Street, uh, just north basically of the Dallas Zoo. And so the device is continuing to move into Dallas at this time. All right, and we see that the victim's residence is in the home. here. Yes, ma'am. Um, with a B and an R. Yes, ma'am. And then can you, can you continue? Page so 14. from 2.13 a.m. to 2.18 a.m., the phone leaves kind of the area south of the Dallas Zoo, travels along uh, Clarendon. Clarendon Drive, and it moves by 2.18 is just south of the victim's residence. And what are we looking at on page 15? Uh, these are, I've got several Google hits in the 219 minute time frame, so this is just one minute, but it basically shows the device doing a drive by of the house, and at, at 219.48 a.m., it's just north of the residence, but it's at this time, it's in the neighborhood of the victim's residence. Okay. On page 16, now we're looking at, we're now into October 9th, 3.40 p.m. to 5.09 p.m. Yes, so what happened was there was no Google data between 2.19 a.m. and 3.40 p.m. Uh, I can't say why there was no Google data, but there was no data. But at this point, it shows the device starting at 3.40 is near Jackson and then is traveling west and at 5.09 is at the pilot uh, travel center that it had stopped at earlier on the way to Dallas. Okay, and as far as no Google data, is it possible there'd be no Google data because the phone was completely shut down? That would be the most logical, or the use end user could have deleted that data, uh, but one possibility is the device was turned off, and at this time I also have a outgoing call at 4.52, excuse me, 4.32, I'm sorry, 4.32 p.m., uh, and that shows that it's kind of pointing to the area where we have Google data three minutes prior. So that's consistent with the Google data and the cell data putting it in the same general area. Okay, 
Okay, and this is 4.32 p.m.? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and this is, it's an outgoing call? Yes, ma'am. Outgoing call to 615-630-3046. Uh, no, that is, that's the target number, the 3046. I didn't put who that call was to because it was, a no, it was a number that wasn't provided to me as being important to the case. So I didn't specify who that call was to. And then 17, what are we looking at here, page 17? This is uh, 510 p.m. to 528 p.m. Uh, there's Google data that puts the device near the pilot truck stop. And then there's also a 5.11 p.m. There's an outgoing, excuse me, an outgoing text at 5.18 p.m. from the phone associate Mr. Lopez to the phone associate Ms. Faith. And there's also an incoming call from another number at 5.11 p.m. Uh, with the phone utilizing a towered sector that has a coverage area that includes the pilot truck stop. Uh, the phone just between 5.36 and 6.02 p.m. starts traveling north from that pilot truck stop towards the residence. Okay. You can see the residence here. Yes, ma'am, in the, ye the yellow tab. Okay, and you also note that there are texts going on to uh, phones associated between Darren Lopez and Jennifer Faith. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am, between 5.41 and 5.43, there's a text from the phone associated with Ms. Faith to Mr. Lopez. 543, that phone texts back to Ms. Faith's phone. 543, the phone associated with Ms. Faith texts the phone associated with Mr. Lopez. And then 543, the phone associated with Mr. Lopez texts the phone associated with Ms. Faith back. And then on 19, you have uh, the phone back at a very, very near the residence of Darren Lopez. Yes, the Google data from 605 until 9.59 p.m. At 6.05, it's start, it basically makes a left-hand turn and starts traveling towards the residence and then is in the area of the residence from 6.14 to 9.59 p.m. Uh, and then there was a call at, eight, at excuse me, 9.43 p.m. from Miss Faith to Mr. Lopez that lasts 1,528 seconds. And during that time, that device is using a tower that has a coverage area that includes his residence. Okay. Did you say 5,000 or 1,000? 1, 1,528. 1, okay. And then 16 texts, did you? Yes, ma'am. And I, I was about to say, and then there also in that time frame, there were 16 text messages between the two devices between 621 and 916 p.m. Okay. All right. Can you explain your total analysis? Uh, I just took uh, the records associated with Mr. Lopez, and between June 24th and January 11th of 2021, just looked at the call volume and text volume between the two devices. And so what I showed is, in that time frame, there were 2,344 total calls. 261 of them were with the phone associated with Ms. Lopez, so 11, a little over 11% of his call volume was with Ms. Lopez. Uh, there were 268,844 total SMS or just text messages with 1,116, 116,171 with the phone associated with Ms. Lopez, 40, just over 43% of the text messages. There were 10,808 MMS, which is a multimedia session, which is you know either a very long text or you attached a picture or a short video or something like that. Uh, and there were, that was 39, just over 39%. And then I also looked when there was a gap of greater than 10 hours where the two phones did not communicate at all. And the only time that occurred was from October 8th at 1.07 p.m. till October 9th uh, at 5.18 p.m. was the only time where there was more than 10 hours between when these two devices communicated with each other. Okay, I think this is important just to reiterate. So you're saying between June 24th of 2020 and January 11th of 2021, yes, in that time frame, the only time that they had no contact for greater than 10 hours is the time of October 8th from 107 to October 9th at 518. Yes, ma'am, that's roughly 28 hours. Okay, so they were in contact a lot. Yes, ma'am. 
Right, and then you created this report. The final report came out 9-22 of 2021. Is that mm. correct? Although you did your analysis, I think, sometime in January of 2021. Yes, ma'am. What the process is, I'll do an initial analysis, and then when uh, requested by the case agents or it's coming, coming up for some kind of court proceeding, uh, we have a peer review process. So another cast agent will take my work and redo it in a different mapping software. So if there's any errors, it's caught. And basically, it's generally a typo check for the most part before I finalize my product. And was that done in this case? Yes, ma'am, it was. Okay, at this time, you're on all past the witness. Thank you, Mr. Sedgwick. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, Agent Sedgwick, and I just wanted to clarify, each time that you were using the cell data information, you actually posted the tower on those, those maps. Yes, sir. So the majority of what you had was Google data from a device being on. Yes, sir. In this case, the majority of this was Google data. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, and I know that you had some, some nice pretty circles on your maps, that kind of thing. That's not what the cell phone coverage actually looks like, is it? No, sir. The circles is the Google. They give me a lat long and a level of uncertainty. So they give me a circle. Uh, so that's what I plotted. I use the sector arms with that shaded area to show the coverage of your cell tower. But no, it's not. It's not going to be that perfect. That perfect mm -hmm. circle, because you, you've got different radio frequencies and different coverage areas depending on. I mean, even weather and time and that kind of thing can change. Is that fair? Weather and time has a very limited effect, but topography, mm -hmm. the network, you know, the other towers in the area affect what that coverage area looks like. But that's been determined to be the best showing of what the general coverage area of that device was, or that, excuse me, that cell tower was in sector at the time of that call. Because cell phone traffic can also affect like which towers are picking up calls. Calls can get shunted at times, is that fair? No, sir. Uh, once you're in a call, yes. Okay. But when the phone call, when the phone, either you, you know, press send or you receive a call, the phone itself is in charge at that time. It, the phone is always looking for the strongest signal with the least amount of interference, generally the closest tower. So when you press send on your phone, your phone that connects to the tower, it sees the best at that time. That is what was reflected in the call detail records. Same process for an incoming call. The network doesn't keep track of where every single phone is at every time. It knows the general area. So if I get an incoming call, it'll send a page out to all the towers in the area. I'll respond on the tower and sector the device sees the best at that time. That's what's reflected in the call detail records. But once you're in a call, the network, you might not move, but the network might shift you to another tower that still has coverage because there's an overlap in the network so there's not dropped calls. You might not move and the, the network might shift you, but the tower listed in the call detail records as the first tower is the tower and sector the device itself chose. So kind of the same thing we said, though, the closest tower isn't always the one that can be up to the device, up to traffic. Uh, traffic doesn't have an effect. Uh, the, net, the phone has no idea how long, what traffic is on that tower. But like if I'm sitting here and there's a tower half a mile this way and three quarters of a mile that way, but there's a hill in the way, I might choose the farther tower because it's a stronger signal. When you but say you, the, the phone or the, the device. device. Yes, sir. So, I'm saying so we, we can have some, some deviation there um, based on a lot of those factors. Yes, sir. But it's always going to be in this tower and sector that was the strongest signal. I'm going to skip over to page 11 of your report. 11? Yes, sir. So we have been following the device now um, from uh, Mr. Lopez's residence um, along, which interstate is that? Uh, 40. 40. Okay. That's interstate 40 that, um, and been following him along at this point uh, through, the, through uh, Mr. Lopez's device through his phone number. As you stated, you're tracking devices, not people. Yes, sir. I'm th then this point is the Google data on the device. Okay. And all of this is Google data. We're not seeing, again, that cell phone tower. So uh, the majority of what you have here is, is the Google data. Yes, sir. The vast majority of this case, it was Google data. All right. And so off of page 11 there, you've got within a uh, three meters at 
about 7 p.m. Uh, that that device is in West Memphis, Arkansas. Is that right? Uh, at 5.39 p.m. It's in West Memphis. Okay. And then at 6.53, it's outside of Little Rock. Oh, outside of Little Rock. Okay, thank you. So at 6.53, we're outside of Little Rock. And at that point, that is where you lose that information for a good period of time. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And the next place that we pick up that device is a good bit south of, uh, of Dallas. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. In fact, we have the Faith's residence here. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. And the device is now a good bit south of Dallas. Now, we don't have this map here, but we have now come all the way down through Dallas on, uh, on 40. We would have had to catch probably I-30, come down through Dallas to then end up south of the city, right? Uh, obviously, I can't say what route. I mean, that's the most logical route, okay. but I can't say, obviously. We have no idea what route. Yes, sir. Right? We could have gone down through Louisiana and come back up. We could have gone over through Oklahoma City and dropped all the way down. We could have been, hit New Mexico and made a circle if we had enough time. Yes, sir. We don't know what it is, but we know that the device is dark from Little Rock until now we are not anywhere near the victim's residence. In fact, probably past it from where we're trying to get to. Uh, it's south of the victim's residence, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. But at that point, at uh, we're now at about 2 in the morning, it turns on. There's Google data again. There is Google data again. Okay. So for about seven hours, there is no Google data. And I... I created a little Google data, um, would it surprise you that that's about 450 miles? I'd, I'd have to map that out, sir. I don't remember off the top of my head. All right. Um, can I approach the witness? Sure. <coughs> Through my own Google data to establish my alibi for the day of where I've been. <laughs> um, I just used Google Maps to show the uh, face address to uh, West Memphis. Yes, sir. And how far is that? Uh, that's saying, well, where's the mileage? 449, 450 miles. About 450 miles and about Where was that? I'm sorry, where's that from the starting point? I'm just, I just want to make it because I Yeah, it's not a problem. So, and I've actually, I mapped it backwards. So from Waverly to... Map to, to okay, sir. Okay, sir. I just wanted to, I saw where it was. So I wanted to make yeah, sure I was okay. talking, we were okay, talking the we, same. We agree. We got seven hours of no data. Yes, sir. And we've got 450 miles. Of yes, sir. But then it turns on, or we start getting data. Again. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and then we continue to have data as it takes us back up towards the victim's residence and back up towards the victim's residence. Yes, sir. We are right at the victim's residence. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. And then what is our latest time on your report where we are right next to the victim's residence? 2.19 a.m., sir. So 2.19 a.m., and then we go to Arkansas. Yes, sir. Correct? So from 2.19 until almost 13 and a half hours later, no doubt. Is that right? Yes, sir, approximately. Okay. And we are back in uh, Oakfield, Jackson area. And I'm trying to think of where that is. I'm just trying to find another main point of reference. But at least the 450 miles, if not a little bit more, that we talked about there. Yes, sir. It, it it it's dark for 13 hours and travels a decent distance, obviously a good distance from that time. Okay. All right. Good. I'll pass the witness. Nothing for you, Your Honor. Any final No. No objection. No objection. No excuse. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'm unable to talk. Maybe it's just going to get funnier. Next witness, please. One. State calls agent Stacy. We have seen all the witnesses. Please turn and face me and raise your hand. For the testimony. Will be true. Please have a seat. You're responding to questions from Ms. Mitchell first. Mr. Duke or Mr. Sanchez, you may proceed whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Agent Stacy Vander West Hazen. Yes. I just didn't want to get her on. Um, 
Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and by all means, please spell your first and last name for the court reporter. My name is Stacey Vander Westhaven, S T A C E Y V A N D E R W E S T H U I Z E N. I'm an ATF special agent. All right, and um, how long have you been with the ATF? Approximately nine and a half years now. And where did you start out? My first office was Montgomery, Alabama, and then I moved to Nashville, Tennessee. All right, and you were in Nashville, Tennessee, um, for part of the team that Barnes put together, or all of you guys with ATF and, and Eric Barnes and Chris Walton put together um, for the arrest of Darren Lopez, is that correct? And that's correct. All right, and your involvement in this case was January 11th of 2020? Yes. Okay, well, a few days before that, is that Leading correct? up to the arrest, yes. Okay. Um, you're no longer in Nashville, though, is that right? That's correct. I'm in Wilmington, North Carolina now. Okay. They keep moving you? <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> um, at the time of this, uh, what, what was your role at, at ATF? At the time. Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, correct? Yes. I was a field agent at the time. Still am. All right. And what does that mean? When you tell the jury, what does that mean? What do you do? We investigate violent crimes involving drug trafficking, firearms trafficking, anything of that nature. Um, and were, did you have anything else that you were, you were assigned to? I was a part-time member to the ATF SRT, our special response team. All right, and what makes that different than just being a field agent? Um, at the time, I was a crisis ne negotiator to the team um, on Team 3 out of Dallas, Texas. I was a part-time member, and all we do, we're a tactical team. We respond to high-risk events or just events or incidents, properties that are difficult to get to, that a, a regular field agent might not be able to get to through their office. Okay, um, and at this point, uh, leading up to the arrest, um, it, it, you guys are, are are talking to Eric Barnes and Chris Walton, but mostly Eric Barnes, is that right? Detective Eric Barnes? That's correct. Okay, and at this point, and the jury has heard from other testimony, there was an arrest that was to be made on Darren Lopez. Was that your understanding? Yes. And it was your understanding that a search warrant had been executed, or a search warrant had been <clears throat> asked for and signed off on to be executed on the uh, residence of Darren Lopez after his arrest, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Leading up to this arrest, what were you doing? I was asked to help with surveillance pre the days leading up to the arrest and for the search warrant for SRT to travel into. And what were you doing for the surveillance up to the arrest? We would go out early in the morning, try to see what time the children were leaving. We didn't want to execute the warrant while the children were in the home. Okay. And by children, I think they were teenagers, but still, they're underage. Correct. Okay. And was it your understanding there was three girls? Yes. Okay. Um, you were also given information uh, where the house is located, I guess. Correct. Okay. And also any vehicles. That's right. All right. And what vehicle, do you recall what vehicle you were kind of looking for? The Nissan pickup truck and okay. a silver Scion. All right. And again, you're trying to see when the children, the girls, are going to be out of the house. Yes. All right. So and what do you do to, to try to figure that out? It's a mobile surveillance we would set up outside of the house and different entry points, which way the the kids could leave or he could take the kids to school. Um, we didn't know what school the kids attended. We were figuring that out at the time just to see what time was the best time for us to enter the property. And it was kind of tricky at the time, right, um, Agent, because this was during COVID, and so the schools were all doing different things, right? Yeah, that's correct. And so you guys had to figure out what school was having students in and, and students not. Right? Yes. What days the kids would attend different different kids depending on their last name would attend different days. It was it was different all in 2020, 2021. Okay. Um, do you happen to right before January 11th come across this black Nissan Titan? Yes, we did. We uh, we located at a high school in the back, parked in the student parking lot. And this was literally just you driving around looking for this truck at different schools. Me and another agent. We were driving around. We couldn't locate the the truck, and so we just. Yeah, we, surveillance. Okay, so you find the truck at a high school, indicating what to you? Uh, we believed at the time that maybe one of the daughters was driving the truck herself to school. Okay, because it's in the high school senior parking lot. Correct. Okay, and what do you do next? 
I just related back to our surveillance team, to our advanced SRT team, for them to, when they would travel in, they would do their own surveillance on top of this pre-surveillance we did um, to better understand how to execute the warrant safely. Okay. And so suffice it to say, there's nothing you can do really at this point. You've got the truck and you spot the truck, um, but you can't really do anything except, I guess, relay the information back or, or see if this young girl comes out. Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, so what, what do you end up doing? We just waited for the SRT team to come in to set up the briefing and for the ATF Dallas um, office to travel in to meet with our Nashville uh, Group 1 office. Okay, and when they did come in for the briefing, what was decided or did something happen before the briefing? We briefed uh, the morning before, uh, January 11th, the day Mr. Lopez was arrested. Um, we briefed our offices because Dallas ATF traveled in and they met with our Nashville Group 1 office. Um, our ATF advance team traveled in to do their pre-op surveillance that morning and that day. And while they were doing their surveillance, they came upon Mr. Lopez and effectively affected the arrest. And how did they come upon Mr. Lopez? Can I think they were just mobile surveillance of the area. Okay, and he was in what? The Scion. So he was not inside the house? They didn't go inside the house? No, no. They were watching and he came out of the house, is that, that correct? That's correct. Okay, and then what do they do when they see that he is in the Scion coming out of his home? Um, I believe they just took him into custody, had local law enforcement involved. Okay. And as far as you know, there was no, there was no resistance by Mr. Lopez? As far as I know, yeah. I wasn't at the actual arrest, um, but I, I think it was effective, safe. Okay. And I think you said um, you were, where the briefing was done and where you were was about an hour away from his home. Would that be about right? Approximately, yeah. Okay. Do you get word that the arrest has been made? And search warrant in hand, you all need to get to that house to do the search warrant of the house. That's correct. Okay, and so do you take off immediately? Yes. Okay, you and who else go to the house for the, to search the house? All the agents that briefed that morning uh, for our pre-op surveillance, pre-operational briefing, we all made our way to the property. Okay, and one detective um, was there uh, who the jury hasn't previously heard of, but one of the detectives was there named Jabari Howard, is that correct? That's correct. All right, and he was at the house with you, not inside the house, but he was at the house with you, and he's a DPD detective, Dallas Police Department detective. Those agents arrived, I arrived a little bit earlier to meet with SRT. We still had to clear the house, um, so the rest of SRT, we linked up, we cleared the house, made sure it was safe and secure, nobody was at the, the house, uh, we checked the outbuildings, and then we allowed the rest of the agents, as well as DPD, to come onto the property. Okay. I'm going to ask you to go through these just to make sure you recognize them. Okay. Keep them in there. Okay, I'll flip them over. Yeah. Do you recognize those photos? I do. Okay. And are those pictures of the house, um, Darren Lopez's residence in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee, and the inside of the house? Yes, they are. Okay. And I'm sorry, I wanted you to look at States Exhibit 139 through 162. And at this time, I'm going to ask to offer the evidence for all purposes, States 139 through
very busy. You may publish. Thank you. All right, Agent, we're just going to go through these photos, okay? Yes. <coughs> this is State's Exhibit 139. This is the house that you came upon in Commonwealth Parties, Tennessee. This is the residence of Darren Lopez. That's correct. Did you have a search warrant for him? Yes. Okay. And this is State's Exhibit 140, just another side view of the house, correct? That's correct. All right. This would be 141, the back of the home. Correct. Okay. So it did sit on a large piece of property. Yes. All right. And there were several other what you called outbuildings around, correct? That's correct. A barn and then a shed, I believe. Was there, were there any animals not inside the house, but any animals around the house? There was a couple of horses. There were a couple of horses? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's going to walk to State's Exhibit 142. Would you say that the house was pretty messy? Yes. Okay. So was this like a floor area? Yes. And those are your knees right there bending down? Yes. Okay. Did you guys have to go through a lot in order to find anything of value? We had to dig through quite a lot, yes. Okay. So clothes, just food wrappers, were there animals inside the house? I don't, I think a cat maybe. I don't recall too many animals. Okay. But what we're focused on in this picture in the States 142 is, looks like, like a rucksack, possibly. That's correct. Okay. And then 143, again, this is just an area here. It looks like another rucksack or the same one. Um, but there's just stuff everywhere. Is that correct? Yes. <coughs> okay. And this one states 144. You find some bullets on another kind of bag. Correct. In some part of the house. Is that correct? Yes. And this is just another photo of it? Please. Or another bag? Yes. And 145. <coughs> okay. Now, going back the state's exhibit 142 with this rucksack we can also see that there's like a Belvita box or something here correct correct okay and in state's exhibit 146 it's that same box same rucksack but you pulled out a, a handgun correct. correct yes okay do you remember, I mean, was it just on the floor? Was it under the bed? It was inside the backpack. I believe it was wrapped in that t-shirt. No, 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 the whole rucksack, I'm sorry. It was near the bed area. Okay. Yes. And that's you kneeling down. Those are your knees, is that Yes, correct? that's me. <clears throat> All right. And then the clip that goes with the handgun, correct? Correct. All right, and this is just another view? That's right. Of the handgun? Yes. In the magazine. On the States 147. And then here you take a closer view and what appears to be on the gun blood at the time okay and that's can you uh, tell the jury what kind of gun it is it's a smith and wesson okay and can you read the serial number can you read those letters victor alpha sierra zero five nine eight i believe okay. and that states exhibit 148 you also take a photo of the butt of the gun do you if somebody does do you have any idea why just no. taking every angle? Yeah, they, our photographer or whoever's in charge of the camera will usually just take all angles of the firearm. Okay, and the state's 149. Just another view of this clip in the state's 150. Correct. In that same rucksack. And then we have, you guys found some letters. Yes. And some packages. Okay, and can you tell, if I can zoom in, but can you tell it's to Darren Lopez Happy birthday, I love you. Can you tell who the return address is from? Jennifer Faith. Okay. And then, can you tell who the package is from? Jennifer Faith. In Dallas, Texas, correct? That's correct. All right, All right. then we have 152. Again, the house had lots of stuff in it, right? Lots of clothing and food, um, but you do find what looks like a a gun box. A gun box, yeah. Okay. And possibly the gun box for the Smith and Wesson in States 153. 
Possibly, it, it might be for another separate okay. 154, we're just showing that what you're collecting, More different right ammunition, now. setting yes. out and taking a photo of it. Same thing in 155. Yes. And then in 156, you go ahead and take a picture of the certification title, Darren Lopez, and this is for what? The Nissan Titan. I'm sorry? The Nissan Titan. The Nissan Titan. The pickup truck. Okay. That is, was registered to him that the police found That's in their correct. initial investigation. And correct. 157. Is this a picture of the Scion? The Scion, yes. And then 159. Well, well, 159, we have a priority mail. I think that's from the, the uh, state's exhibit we saw earlier, but from Jennifer Faith to Darren Lopez, correct? That's correct. All right. And then in 160, we see a giant FedEx box. It looks like on the front or back porch of the house. That's correct. All right. In 161, if we get closer, we see... Do you see a return address? From yes. Jennifer Faith, Dallas, Texas. Yes. And then if we go to 162, this is the living room where it's, Christmas is still happening. Um, and we see probably what came out of that FedEx box, right? TV. The giant Samsung TV. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. When you, you collect the gun, and then what do you do with it? I walked it outside to Jabari. And you gave it to Jabari Howard? I handed it over, yes. Who again is with the Dallas Police Department, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Give us just one second, Your Honor. We're trying to get into Fort Knox here. And for record purposes, it states 164. Okay. Do you have any gloves? Do you have a pair of gloves, Caitlin? Yes, it is. Okay. Is it marked as Smith & Wesson? Smith & Wesson. Okay. Same. And you, from this angle, read the serial number? Victor. Victor Alpha 00598. Okay. And the magazine that you collected as well, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. This time, Your Honor, I would like to offer the evidence states 164 for all purposes. Again, we have no objection. Mm -hmm. All right. Hazen, um, after you deliver property to detectives for DPD to take back to Dallas, what, what did you do next? We just kept searching the house okay. All right. for more evidence. All right. Did you take a lot of stuff out of the house? Or? There, was, there was many of us helping uh, go through the house and search the house. I believe we took quite a bit of evidence out. It was very messy, correct? It, yes, it took a while. Okay, so you kind of had to sort through some stuff. Yes. All right, after the search of the house, did you have anything else to do with this particular case? No, we were ATF Nashville. Nashville 1 was, was 
pretty okay. much finished with our side of the case. Okay, but yeah, and you personally had nothing else to do with the case? That's correct. Professionally? Yes, correct. Okay. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Special Agent, uh, this was uh, about three months after uh, the shooting, right? That's correct. So for 90 days, uh, back then sat in that house uh, in, a, in a sack, correct? I, I seem so, yes, sir. All right, so it wasn't under a bed, correct? I don't believe it could have. I could have pulled it under a bed. The house was so dirty with all the clothes. I don't recall if it was somewhat under the bed, but it was near the bed. Oh, it wasn't in a closet somewhere in the back of the no, closet. Sir. It wasn't in a wall, and it wasn't in, under the house. That's it right. was that you were able to find it after you got rid of some of the uh, the stuff that was on top. You were able to find it really easy, right? Somewhat. So if someone was trying to hide a weapon like that, they weren't doing a good job. Is what I'm trying to get. That's correct. All right. And uh, so the gun was there. Did you see any signs that, uh, that anybody tried to destroy any evidence in this case? Not that I could tell. Were you able to retrieve uh, computers from his house? I believe we did take electronics. Okay. I, I, I personally, I don't think I was responsible for electronics. I think I just had that section of the house. Okay. And we're, uh, do you remember, if you do, <coughs> whether any of those electronics were hidden in any way? I don't remember. And so you come across uh, him, uh, and you tell people that you see him, right? When you're when you're going to arrest him. I didn't arrest him. Oh. But when somebody arrested him, are you the first person that saw him? Lay eyes. No, I w I wasn't there when the advance team arrested him. But from what you uh, recall, uh, it was done without incident, right? That's correct. You didn't resist, correct? Correct. You didn't run. That's correct. There was no chase. Right. You basically gave yourself up. That's correct. And was the gun loaded or not loaded? It was loaded. Do you know how many bullets were in it? I don't recall. There were other bullets that, uh, that you brought with you today also? Or only the bullets that you found in the gun? I think it's only the bullets. Okay. In the pictures, was there another clip in there? I think it's just one clip, one magazine. And, and the extra bullets that you found, where were they? They were all. They were spread out throughout the the room. Okay. So somewhere in a bag, in that same bag. There were bullets in gun boxes, uh, just um, loose, loosely laid. They were. It was. It was everywhere. Did you find any other guns? No, I don't believe we did. That's the only gun you found. That's correct. Do you know who was in charge of taking the electronics? I guess the Jabari DPD. I passed the witness. Nothing further, Your Honor. It should be fine. No objection. Okay. Very good. Your excuse will be further, sir. Call your next witness, please. State calls Laura Fleming. Good afternoon. Can you please introduce yourself to the jury and state and spell your name for the record? Yes, my name is Laura Fleming, F-L-E-M-I-N-G. I am a firearms examiner with the Dallas Police Department. All right. And as a, um, how long have you been a firearms examiner with the Dallas Police Department? I've been a firearms examiner 28 years, and I've been with the Dallas Police Department about seven. Um, and can you tell the jury what you do as a firearm in your role at DPD as, as a firearm analyst? A firearms examiner is a forensic scientist that 
focuses on the field known as firearms identification. And firearms identification is one of the many disciplines under the forensic science discipline. But its focus is to determine whether a fired bullet, a fired cartridge case, or any other ammunition component was fired from a specific firearm. All right. And were you, I guess let me back up. Also, as your role um, in DPD and dealing with these fire cartridge casings or ear analysis as an examiner, do you also enter, or someone on your team is responsible for entering in fire cartridge casings into the NIBIN system? Yes, the Dallas Police Department participates in the NIBIN program. Uh, NIBIN is an acronym for the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. And this system is supported by the ATF, and this system allows us to capture images of cartridge cases, both from the crime scene as well as from known firearms, known as test-fired cartridge cases, in an effort to um, associate unrelated cases to each other to aid the investigation. Okay, and in this, in this case, did you have um did DPD crime scene response um, give you guys some fire cartridge casings on an incident that happened October 9th of 2020 under, it looks like case number 1798532020? Yes. Okay, and do you recall how many? There were eight fired cartridge cases. Okay. Um, is that part, is that what you did with NIBIN part of your report or no? Yes, I mean, as far as entry into the Niven database, if a confirmation is performed, it will be part of my report. Now, on a routine basis, as far as uh, routine entry of cartridge cases, um, we do not issue reports unless a confirmation has been requested. Okay, and so we're clear, and I think this is, um, and we went over it a little bit with um, physical evidence section Detective Gonzalez, um, in all cases involving a firearm, if there are fire cartridge cases collected, then they are to be entered into the NIBIN system. They are to be considered for entry into the NIBIN system. And I say that because there is a process. Specifically, like in this case, we had eight fired cartridge cases that were collected from one crime scene. These eight fired cartridge cases are screened they were screened um, by one of our NIBIN analysts to determine class characteristics. If he finds that they were all the same class characteristics, then a representative cartridge case is entered into the database, into the NIBIN database. So basically, that means he's looking at all eight, and then if they screen in, then he, picks, he or she picks one. Correct. To enter in, and then there's a process to enter it into the NIBIN system. Yes. Okay. okay. I'm going to show you, Laura, what's been marked. Is it okay if I call you Laura? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 165 and 166. We have two reports here. Those are the same reports, but let's go ahead and explain that. Okay. Same report with you, okay? Yes, they are copies of my reports. So we have one, and can you give me the one, the, that one? And so it's Exhibit 165, it says Firearm Analysis Report, um, which was completed on what date? Well, the report was issued on May 27th of 2021. Okay, and then we have State's Exhibit 166, and that is titled Corrected Report. It is, and that one was issued February 24th of 2023. Okay, and before I, we go into the reports, I have to enter these into evidence, but just briefly, what did you have to correct on the report? Anything of substance, first of all? Well, the corrective report was issued to clarify the serial number of the firearm, the only firearm that I examined. Okay, so in the original report, you have the I'll let you look at yours. Mm -hmm. On the original report, what do you have the serial number as? In the original report, I listed the serial number for a Smith & Wesson pistol 
as VASD598. And you figure out that you just read it wrong, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And it should be? The correct serial number for the same Smith & Wesson pistol is VAS0598. And you and I have even looked at that gun and verified that that's a zero, not a D. Correct. Correct. And I have photographs, copies of photographs as well with me today. All right. At this time, Your Honor, I'd like to offer into evidence States Exhibit 165 for record purposes, States Exhibit 166 for all purposes. We have no objection, Your Honor. It's admitted. You may publish. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, Ms. Fleming. 165 for record purposes. Yeah, let me pull that. All right, now I know you and I have been over this over and over again, and you are so much better at the firearms than I am. So I'm kind of looking to fish play and let you talk as much as I can. Um, but on this <coughs> report that has been entered into evidence, can you tell us what this first report is an analysis? Can you just kind of walk us through your report, I guess is what I'm asking. Do we want to start with page one of two? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, I mean, initially, um, item number seven, as listed on the report, as one federal brand 45 auto caliber fired cartridge case, was submitted to the Niven unit. Okay. It was screened by one, um, one of, there were eight cartridge cases. Uh, it was screened by one of our Niven analysts, and item seven was entered into the Niven database. Okay. Then eventually, a firearm that's listed on my report as F1, which is a Smith & Wesson 45 auto caliber pistol, was submitted to the Niven unit, the Dallas PD Niven unit, um, for Niven entry. It was test fired and entered into the system, and a lead was found to the item seven cartridge case. Okay, let's back this up just a little bit. Okay. So, you, you put the, uh, the number seven fire cartridge casing into the NIBIN system. One of our NIBIN analysts did, analysts but yes. Did. Our they department. they do this by how? How do they put it into a system? The NIBIN unit is actually divided into two stations, and one is an acquisition station, meaning that it captures pictures or images of a, the head of a cartridge case. This area of the cartridge case covers um, breech face marks and firing pin impression, which are all representative of the gun that it was fired from. Once our Niven analyst determined that all eight of these had similar class characteristics, one was selected as a representative of the group. So that was number item number seven. That was entered into the NIBIN database as images. These images are retained in the database and they are correlated against other incidences, not only in Dallas PD, but in our, in our region. We are um, linked to all NIBIN users in the state of Texas, as well as some departments in Louisiana and as well as Oklahoma. So okay. it does a, a search of those areas. Would that be would that be an example on page eleven of seventeen? Can you show me what page you're referring to? Yeah, I'm not Yes, this particular page um, demonstrates the information um, regarding the firearm that was entered into the Niven database, specifically the Smith & Wesson pistol. Okay, and cartridge case exhibit details. 
Yes, but this is in reference to the test fire, not item seven, the cartridge case from the okay. scene. Is there a photo that we can show the jury in your report regarding the images that you put into the NIDIN system? It would be in my original packet, which is page 15 of 22. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let me just compare to make sure. Yes, it's 15 and 22. Okay. Okay. Now, it's on the screen, okay? Okay. Like I said, this page. Um, represents the information, case information, specifically to item number seven, which was a cartridge case that was collected by DPD crime scene. Okay, and that these are the images that get sent, put into the NIDIN system. Right, these images are acquired and uh, a correlation um, is performed within the database. Um, Dallas PD is contracted with ATF to review all correlation results they have a correlation center that <coughs> reviews all uh, the results. Okay, okay. So then sometime later, you get information from who? Or the NIBIN uh, people in the, your NIBIN get information from who regarding this cartridge case number seven? Well, when, when item number seven was initially entered, um, there were no leads found at that particular point. I right. mean, keep in mind, this was this was entered back on October 12th of 2020. So there were no um, leads found at that particular point. It wasn't until later when a firearm um, developed within the investigation, the Smith & Wesson 45 caliber pistol was then submitted to the NIBIN unit, test fired and entered into the NIBIN database. That particular firearm a lead was found to item number seven cartridge case. Okay, and pause there. I think I made a mistake and put something into evidence that I had asked for record purposes. At this time, the state would ask that the report be admitted. What number is it? 165 for all purposes. No objection. So to make the record clear, you showed a picture from 165. What picture did you show from that exhibit that's now admitted for all purposes? It's page 15 of 22. Okay. Exhibit information, IBIS tracks, HD, 3D match point of the number seven cartridge case. All right. Go ahead. All right, and apologies to the court. Okay, Mrs. Slemmy, you, um, there was a lead, and at that point, what do you do? At that point, when, a, when we, the NIBIN unit, receives a lead notification from ATF, I will review those images as well as my colleague, Charles Clow, will review these images to determine if, whether or not we are in agreement with the um, findings or information that we have gathered from ATF as far as the lead is concerned. If we are in agreement, then we will um, distribute this information of the potential lead to our investigators or detectives assigned to the cases involved. If our detectives uh, wish to... Well, let's break that up. I'm sorry. If you will let the detectives know if... A lead is found. Okay. And in this case, you did? Correct. Okay. And you talked to the lead detective or Swanton, is that correct? I'd have to refer to my email, but I, I mean, I emailed many individuals because um, I know there were other detectives involved in this particular incident. Okay. Uh, Detective Barnes, Detective Howard, as well as Walton. Okay. And the, um, it, the gun that you received, you received from Detective Howard? I believe so, yes. Okay. But I went a little ahead. So you talked to them about going ahead and doing a confirmatory report. Right. I sent him an email notification essentially saying this gun may be connected to this specific cartridge case number seven um, through a NIBIN lead. If confirmation is required, please submit a request for analysis to perform that type of an examination. Okay, that's important to kind of make sure it's very clear. 
the number seven cartridge case on the scene at 926 Waverly Place in Dallas was put into the diamond system via images. Correct. Then there was a lead and the, there was a lead generated. No, not at that point. Number not seven is entered into the Nyman da database when, it, yes. when the incident occurred in 2020. Yes. Then event, a few months down the road, a firearm was found and submitted to the Nyman unit. Yes. The firearm was test fired and entered into Nyman. Okay. Then a lead was found. Gotcha. So the, the firearm that you received from Jabari Howard, that was test fired and put into the system. Yes. And at that time, there was a lead that was found that said there may be a connection between this particular gun found in Tennessee and the scene at 926 Waverly Place. Yes. Okay. And then you asked them to do a confirmatory report. I asked if they needed, analysis. right. I notified them at the lead and if they needed confirmation, um, then they were to submit a request for analysis form, which was done. Okay. And then what is your analysis at that point? At that point, I took the firearm as well as the fired cartridge cases that I fired from that particular gun and did a microscopic comparison to the item number seven cartridge case that was found at the scene. Um, a microscopic comparison is the only way to confirm an Ibin lead. It has to be done with the physical ev evidence through a comparison um, process. This type of examination utilizes a comparison microscope and essentially this microscope is two compound microscopes and they're placed side by side and they're joined by an optical bridge and this allows me to view two items under the same degree of magnification for comparison purposes. And when I'm doing this type of examination I'm focusing on many features within the cartridge cases. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier of class characteristics. Class characteristics are measurable features of an item. They're predetermined prior to the manufacturing of the particular firearm, which is in this case a tool. Um, in reference to firearms identification, some examples of class characteristics are things like caliber. You know, they're not unique features, but they allow you to group these features into smaller ranges. For example, a nine millimeter caliber would be different than a 45 auto caliber. Those are class characteristics. Now moving deeper, you get into individual characteristics. Now these are your, your unique features. Let these me are, you here, yes. Laura. Um, you take these characteristics and you do the microscopic analysis, is that right? Correct. Okay, and then what do you do after you determine that it is similar? Well, in this case, like I said, we knew that there were similarities because the lead had been found. Okay. So I am moving on into a com microscopic comparison. So I'm focusing on in these individual characteristics. Okay. And these are um, imperfections or irregularities that can occur when the tool, the firearm, is being manufactured or through wear and tear and use and abuse of this particular firearm. But most importantly, it is these imperfections and irregularities that can generate or create a unique, keyword, unique microscopic pattern that allows me to identify cartridge cases that have been fired from that specific firearm to that gun. Okay, thank you so much. And we're just gonna, um on this one, you generated a report after doing all of this. Yes, ma'am. And at the end of this report, on this page one of two of State's Exhibit 166, the corrected report, after doing everything that we just told to the jury, what is your finding at the bottom of State's Exhibit 166? Can you read it? Based on the agreement of class characteristics, item number seven, in DPD 20-3830 and a test fired cartridge case from item F1 in DPD 21-0159 were microscopically compared. The fired cartridge case was identified as having been fired by the item F1 Smith & Wesson pistol based on the sufficient agreement of individual characteristics. Okay, so in the end, 
um, the cartridge casings that have been entered into evidence or the one cartridge casing, cartridge casing number seven. And state's exhibit number 70. This cartridge casing, the one found at the scene here in Dallas, microscopically matched to the Smith & Wesson that was delivered to you months later. Yes, that is correct. And I do have my markings on this packaging, identifying the case number, my initials, and case um, item number, as well as the date. And was that the conclusion to your report, except for the correction on the serial number? Yes, ma'am. And um, I would like to add that all of my microscopic examinations, comparisons, and results are also verified by another firearms examiner as part of our quality assurance program. And that was done in this case as well. All right, Laura, I appreciate it. I'll pass the news. Cross examination? Please. Ms. Fleming, so what you did in this case was you tested and looked at one cartridge. Item number seven, yes. You didn't look at the other cartridges? I did not. And when somebody comes back and looks at your work, it's somebody who works in the same agency as you do. I'm sorry? Somebody who, somebody who confirms your results? Right, it's, they're confirming my microscopic comparisons, which in this case would have been the test fires generated from the gun to item number seven. Is that a coworker? Yes. That's all I have. Nothing further, Your Honor. Make sure you find the excuse. Yes, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Very good. Thank you very much. You may stand down. Please make sure you don't have any exhibits with you. I want to make sure you don't take anything that has a state sticker on it. Okay, thank you. Ms. Mitchell? May I approach Your Honor? Sure. Thank you, Your testimony, and it's close enough to the end of the day that we're going to stop for the day. Uh, we're going to continue to work on some things, but we don't need you for that. Uh, so I want to tell you thank you for paying attention today. I'm going to also let you know that you need to continue to follow the instructions that I've given you. And when you go home, people are going to be asking about this case that you go home to, and you're not allowed to talk about it, and there's really no exceptions to that rule. Please don't discuss the case even among yourselves. Please don't drive by any offense locations, or if you happen to find yourself near any of these locations, I want you to go a different way home. I'm not sure where you guys live or what you're going to be up to, but I want you to enjoy the evening. Be ready to come back tomorrow morning, and we will start testimony at 9 o'clock. We can't start testimony until everybody's here, so please be here at 845, and we will begin as soon as we can after that. All rise for the jury. Courts in recess.
I may be seated before we break for the day. Is there anything we need to put on the record? No. All right, very good. And that's all for today.